Okay, may we may we start now. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome you to attend this sub forum hosted by China Administration of Cyber Space. Uh, I am uh, Zhou Hui from uh, China Cyber and Information uh, Law Society, and also from the Institute of Law, China Academy of Social Sciences. We all know that uh, in these days, uh, personal information protection is a very hot topic in the uh, digital economy era. Lots of governments have passed the laws and have carried out their enforcement in this area. Uh, and a lot of companies have do their compli compliance practices as well. Uh, I think this forum will provide a platform to exchange thoughts and ideas. Today we have four speakers, one from the civil society and three from the uh, private sector. Uh, they are three big platform companies. One is Xinlang uh, in China, uh, a social uh, a platform and uh, Meituan Dianxing, a uh, Chinese e-commerce platform for service, and also we a well-known uh, company, Soft, Microsoft. So uh, I will ask the first uh, speaker, Professor Zhang Jiyu. He is from the uh, Future Rule of Law uh, Institute, China's Renmin University, and her topic is about the personal information protection from the perspective of the draft of the personality rights section of Chinese civil code. Okay, it's your turn. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Ji Zhang from Renmin University of China, and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to talk about the personal information protection from the perspective of the draft of the personality rights section of Chinese Civil Code. Yeah. Of course, first of all, there are already many laws regarding to the protection of the personal information in China, including the criminal law, cybersecurity law, and also the general rules of the civil law. And we also have national standards about the information technology, and personal information security specification. And the personal information protection law is in the legislative, legislation schedule too. But uh, the China uh, personal rights section of the Chinese Civil Code, they have a very uh, significant chapter regarding to the right of privacy and the personal information protection. The draft was submitted to the National People's Congress Standing Committee for third reading in August this year, and it was released for public consultation in September this year. Uh, we are looking at the goal of the draft of the personality rights section. First of all, it wants to compile the personality, personality rights in accordance with the needs of the times. We see that in our time, we are facing the fast development of cyberspace. It's integrating internet, mobile networks, IoT, blockchains, cloud computing, uh, big data, AI, and other information technologies. And our social behaviors, which social economy and people's behaviors, and almost everything are more and more going to the cyberspace with the increasingly vast application of algorithms and and also the integration of cyberspace and the real space, we can see that IT uh, te uh, information technologies are have playing a more and more important role in our lives and may have more and more impact on the uh, people's rights. So we see that in the draft of the personality rights section, they're looking carefully to the personality rights in the digital uh, age. For example, we see that with the development of AI, the various use of personal voices, and so this brings to the need to protect personal voice. So there is an article uh, stipulating that we should protect personal voice just as a personal portrait. And the other part is 
this draft want to provide an important measure to comprehensively guarantee the dignity of the individual personality and the decent life of people in the new era. And among all the highlights of this draft, there are two aspects I want to emphasize today here. One is that this draft distinguishes between privacy and personal information. And the other is that this draft maintains the openness of personality rights system, including the openness of privacy and personal information. So why? Why to distinguish the two and why to maintain the openness? Uh, first of all, we see that this uh, draft uh, really distinguishes the privacy and the personal information. The privacy in this law refers to the private space, private activities, private information, and so on, which natural persons would not want the others to know. But personal information refers to various informations that can identify a specific natural person, uh, to include a lot of kind of uh, information, of course. Uh, but we see that uh, the personal information in this draft is not yet described as a right yet. And also, the using of the personal information does not necessarily violate privacy. But on the other hand, the protection of personal information may help to prevent and control the risks of violating the personal privacy and may keep better balance of the potential algorithmic power and public power and personal rights. And we, uh, we can see there are a lot of debates in China and the vice president of my university, which is also a, a very important contributor to the draft, he is suggesting that we should describe the personal information as a right rather than not uh, specifically indicating it's a right. But there are many uh, different opinions too. So, I, in my opinion, one of the key questions here is that uh, is the personal information protection a means to an end, or is it an end in itself? Because we see it's different than privacy, we can see many kind of uses of the personal information in the non-digital era. But in the digital era, the use of personal information may uh, cause many risks. So maybe we should ask the questions that what are the goals to protect personal information, and if the goal is not only to protect the personal information, and we think uh, many people will agree it is to better prevent the violations of personal privacy and other human rights in this digital era, and also to enhance the trust of the public in this new digital era and to enhance the security of the public. So we should ask, is it efficient enough or effective enough? And uh, if not, what are the other possible measures that we can work together and to help to achieve our goal to better protect the personal privacy? privacy and other uh, human rights in the digital era, and of course, how to balance with other values and goals. So we think that since the theories and these questions are not fully answered, there are still a lot of two studies to do in this year, in this aspect. So that is the reason, one of the reasons that in this draft, it is not described as personal information right, but rather the protection of personal information. And the other, the second uh, issue I want to stress is that the openness of the personality rights system in the draft. The article 307, uh, 774 of this draft stipulates that the personal, uh, personality rights include the right of life, body, health, name, identity, portrait, reputation, honor, privacy, and so on. And in the paragraph two of this article, it stipulates that in addition to the personality rights specified in the preceding paragraph, a natural person enjoys other personality interests based on personal freedom. 
freedom and personal dignity. So we can see this is an open uh, definition. And also, there are often, uh, are also, uh, etc. in the articles about the privacy and personal information. So we can see this also the openness of the definition of the uh, privacy and also the personal information. It maintains the openness of the personality rights system. So we can see uh, why. So why to maintain the openness? I think there are several reasons. Uh, first of all, we want to allow for a degree of flexibility of the concept of personality rights is that from the perspective of historical development, the type and the specific content of personality rights have gradually enriched with the development of social economy and also the technologies and have been gradually confirmed by law. So we are facing a world with the vast, the vast development of technologies and the applications. So we can see that in order to reduce the need for new legislations every time the technologies and applications change or evolve, we should add some flexibility about the concept of personality rights and also the protection of personal information. And I think, in my opinion, there is a uh, other goal, that is to set up a goal and to ask the society to actively protect personal, personality right in the digital age. That is to see that that is to send out a signal that the law, the legislators, need the active cooperation with the society, with the industries, with the scientists in this fast developing digital age to figure out how we can better provide people's uh, privacy and provide people's personal information. Uh, that reminds me of a, a very typical, very classic paper. Uh, it was written 20 years ago by the Professor Lawrence Lessig. In his famous uh, paper, he writes that uh, there are at least four modalities of the regulation in real space and in cyberspace. Um, the law, uh, social norms, marketing, and architecture. And for the architecture in the cyberspace, it mainly refers to the code running on the computers and other information processing uh, devices. And so, uh, in, uh, although I think maybe the most uh, famous sentence in his work is that code is law, but I think it's more important that he set up a framework that to say that uh, we should firstly ask what value we are pursuing in the uh, regulations, and also if we figure out the value, and then we should ask how the uh, different modalities of regulation uh, work and how they impact each other, and what might be the optimal, uh, the ideal side of uh, the mix of regulations. So there are some examples of the law and market and also the social uh, norm, they have impact on code. For example, in the recent, I think, uh, two or three years, uh, a concept of federated learning is uh, getting very popular in China, I think uh, also in many other countries too. This uh, federated learning is about a kind of machine learning techniques that change the algorithm across multiple decentralized edge devices or servers, holding local data samples without exchanging their data samples. That is to say, the, uh, this kind of learning will not need to gather all the data together, but they can uh, still train a fine algorithm. And this uh, this uh, is very. Uh, I, I don't think it can solve uh, all the problems that we have facing the in personal information protection, but it certainly shows that the law and market can have some impact on the code. Uh, that is to say, uh, first of all, we should look at the motivating uh, forces about this technology. First of all, we see that uh, the market has some pressure on the algorithm because, uh, for example, some banks will not 
willing to share their data with other banks, but they still have the need to train the algorithm to better to control the risks from all the data with each other. So uh, this is the pressure of the market. And also there are uh, definitely pressure from the law because of for example, GDPR and other personal information protection laws all over the world. They are asking the uh, industry and the technologists to think about how to better achieve their goal without uh, violating people's uh, privacy and personal information. So we can also see that this has uh, many, uh, some, several patent applications in China too, which shows that industry is really paying attention to this kind of uh, uh, this kind of algorithm to build, to try to build better product with on device data and uh, privacy by default, privacy by design. So we see that there can be a, a very important cooperation from the legislators, the society, and all the uh, industry and uh, uh, scientists. We think that in order to promote personal information protection better, we really need to think about how to promote it through the mix of multiple regulatory modalities and also through the cooperation. This is, I believe, a very important aspect of the social governance model based on collaboration, participation, and common interest which China is developing these years. And I am also really interested and really excited to the following speaker's speech because they all come from the industry and we can see how they have the perspective of how to better promote personal information protection. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhang. I think uh, I totally agree with you that the openness of the uh, social uh, uh, the the personality interest uh, system in China is also very uh, good for uh, other countries to have to, uh, to 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 this topic. And uh, only the multiple measures of the different subjects and different measures can do the best to the governance on this topic. Uh, I think also it is a. Uh, theme and also the principles for the IGF. So, okay, let's uh, go to the second speaker, uh, Mrs. Gu Haiyan. Uh, she is the general counsel of the general legal, legal counsel of Xinlang company. Uh, her topic is about the elements and principles of commercial use of personal data. Okay, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Helen from Sina Corporation, and we have two NASDAQ listed company. One is Sina.com, it's a portal website. The other one is Weibo.com, it's a social media platform. And uh, Weibo.com, uh, let me introduce it simply. It is a product uh, similar as with the uh, Twitter plus Facebook, and we have more than 600 million active users. So we are the biggest Chinese social media platform. And it's great honor for me to be invited here to share with our with you our understanding and the knowledge in this topic. Um, my topic is responses and practice of data commercialized in enterprises. Okay. The first part, then we move on the consent. Personal data is becoming not only an important part of the enterprise access, but also an important strategic resources of the countries. Let's move on to the definition of the ISO and IEC. Data is a procession of information in formalized manner suitable for communication, interpretation, and processing. When we see in the definition of the data in comparative law, we will see in India and Brazil, also in the 2018, their personal data protection bill is processing. And in GDPR, there are two kinds of the personal data. One is the information relation to the identifier or identified person 
directly or indirectly, such as the name, ID card, local data, another kind of the personal data, it is uh, relevantly um, because they are subject to a higher level protection, such as the genetic, biometric, health data. We, we can see the focus on the compliance of the GDPR, the obligation of the enterprise to inform. The data manager should have the obligation to inform the person before collecting, using, processing personal information. An op corporate has the obligation to remove. It's based on the right of the deletion and the forgotten. The data manager should delete the personal information according to the requirements of the data subject under such certain circumstances. And the notification obligation in the case of leakage, damage, or loss of the personal information, the data managers should properly report relevant incidents to the competent authority and notify the data subject. The second part is legislative framework and the general principles. Some people compare the personal data to the footprints of individuals, and the tasks of the data develops is to build roads according to those footprints. For the road, we can adhere to the attitude of prudence and our tolerance, and the user, they can choose to leave or not to leave the footprints. So at the same time, the road cannot be built without data developers. So we need to protect the business interests of the data developers as the builders. Okay, legislative framework. There are four levels of legislative framework in China. The first one is laws. The second one is department rules. The third one is judicial interpretation. The fourth one is the national standard. Okay, we will see. The personal information protection law has been listed in the legislative pre program. And the data security management measures also draft from comment. And the provisions on the cyber protection of children's personal information, and also some other app uh, law violation methods for collecting and using drafting. Let's move on. Processes and the person posts. We can see there are three person posts of the premises. The first one also is the most important of the one is safeguard the national security and the national sovereignty. The, third, the second one is the full respect for the privacy of the data subjects. And the third one we will try to use on the basis of, of the existing legal protection framework. Basic principle of commercial use of data, we will talk about uh, three principles. The first one is the user consent and the transparency. Here, an open and transparent disclosure is maintained for the data subjects. Data security principle includes two principles. One is quality principle, the other one is security principle. When there is a mistake in the data, it should be correct as soon as possible, and you should take necessary measures when integrity is being destroyed. Basic principle of commercial use data also com um, includes respect the principle of creating commercial interests and values. The role of data, especially the personal data, and the role of the parties in the data industry chain in personal data, they should be fully respected. Okay, the third part of my speech is corporate practice. Data have four stages of, of influence. That means uh, data collection, data processing and utilization, data transmission, data storage and deletion. In data collection phase, when collecting sensitive personal information, the consent of the subject of the personal information is required. 
and the corporate data compliance experience in data collection phase. You should inform your users whether to fully explain the collection method and the purpose. Clearly listed the correspondence between each functional module and the collected information. Also inform your users the cookie and other similar technology, how to collect. In data processing utilization stage, you should build uh, level protection, technical measures, and uh, anonymization. After the user logs out to the account, the personal information should be deleted in time, and the user cannot be so associated with a specific individual and cannot be restormed. That's called anonymization. In data processing utilization stage, you should clear rules of use and build up the correspondence with the scenes and the purpose of the user portrait. In data flow phase, you should build the security assessment. That means if the child's personal information is transferred to a third party, it should conduct a security assessment by the self or by a third party or agency. And in data storage and deletion phase, you can see domestic storage and the encryption and the delete in time. Encryption means network operators should take measures such as encryption to store children's personal information to ensure their information security. And in data storage phase, storage clear methods, storage deadlines, and storage standards. It should be the shortest time to achieve the purpose and express the time limit. And the retention period required by laws and regulations should be met. Okay, let's make the conclusion. We believe we should grasp the common sense, explore the business logic of data utilization, and consider the legitimate interests of data developers while protecting the rights of data subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gu. She has uh, given us a very info, useful introduction of different rules and also the practices of their uh, compliance of data protection. Okay, next we go to the third speaker. Uh, she is uh, Tanya Byrne. She is the head of Berlin, uh, uh, head of uh, Microsoft Berlin uh, for corporate, external, and legal affairs. Her sp speech will be the uh, global privacy protection in an evolving world and industry approach. Please. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so good morning and thanks for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a great pleasure and uh, please allow me as well to warmly welcome you in Germany, to warmly welcome you in my hometown in Berlin. It's, um, it's great to see so many international um, people here in my hometown. So, and again, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's my first panel where I actually have my name written in Chinese. So um, thank you for doing this. I'll keep this if I may. <laughs> So my, my speech will be around privacy protection in an evolving world. Being European, I would like to first share a little bit of the history of data protection um, in Europe and in Germany in particular. And then I will briefly touch on the GDPR. You also alluded to it already. And finally, I would like to share um, the approach Microsoft takes towards privacy and data protection. So. Um, let me start by sharing some thoughts about privacy in Germany or privacy in Europe. I would say based on our historical experience, especially in Germany, um, the European continent attached great value to the protection of personal information. And again, this is true for Germany in particular. The first world's data protection law came actually out of Germany, out of the state of Hesse, which is one of the 16 federal states or lender, we say in Germany. 
um, in the middle of Germany. And that was back in 97. Yeah? And the federal, so the Data Protection Act for all of Germany, not only for the state of Hesse, um, followed seven years later. And this shows that already at the end of the 1970s, yeah, data protection played an important role in the minds and in the minds of the civilization and as well of the regulators. And until the beginning of the early 1990s, um, data protection laws followed in each 16 lender in Germany. So we have 17 data protection regulations in Germany at that time. And however, the, the, the biggest foundation for data protection in Germany was laid in 1983 by the German Federal Constitutional Court, who ruled um, that there is a right for informational self-determination. And this was the foundation for having data protection as a fundamental right in the German Constitution. A couple of years later, in the, in the 90s, in 1995, the European Directive um, with regards to processing personal data came into force. And we all know that the GDPR has been intensively discussed, not only in Europe, but also in other states, um, came into force in 2016. And it directly applies in all 28 member states in, Germany, in, in Europe not only in Germany. So. so the GDPR is designed to give individuals more control over their data, um, over the fact how the data is collected, used, and protected online. The GDPR applies broadly to all organizations of all sizes and types, including large businesses and small businesses, and also public authorities. The point of the GDPR is to protect the data belonging to EU citizens and residents, but therefore it also applies to all organizations that handle such data, whether they are based in the EU or elsewhere on the world, because it's about data belonging to EU citizens and their residents. The GDPR also introduces penalties, which was the first, yeah, first time, for non-compliance with up to 20 million euro penalties or 4% of the worldwide annual turnover, which might be even greater than these 20 million euros. So what are the key changes to address the GDPR? The GDPR contains many requirements about how organizations collect, store, and use personal data this means not only how they identify and secure the personal data in their systems, but also how they handle new transparency requirements and how they detect and report personal data breaches and how they train privacy personnel and their other employees. So this slide shows an overview of the most important requirements coming out of the GDPR. For the interest of time, I will not go through all of them, but I do believe that this slide provides a good overview and a good understanding of the complexity requirements that we as a company and others need to meet. So what does that mean for Microsoft? Let me share some thoughts about Microsoft's broader mission and the importance of privacy protection resulting from that. At Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. As you can see here, it's Satya Nadella's signature. He introduced it when he came into the role of the Microsoft CEO. In all our, our activities, we aim to maintain the timeless value of privacy and preserve our customers' ability to control their own data. We have developed six Microsoft privacy principles. From that foundation of the approach I just described, and 
these foundations, these principles um, apply in the way we shape every product and service. So it's control, transparency, security, strong legal protection, and also important non-content based targeting. And our aim is that this all benefits to you as in to, to the customer that we address. So what we want to is when we do collect data, we will use it to the benefit of our customers and to make their experience even better. So at Microsoft, we believe that the GDPR is an important step forward for privacy rights in Europe and around the world. In fact, we have always been enthusiastic supporters of the GDPR since it was first pro proposed back in 2014. And this is why Microsoft were the first company worldwide to extend the rights that are at the heart of the GDPR to all our customers, consumer customers worldwide. And these so-called data subject rights include the right to know what, the, what data we collect. It also includes the right to correct the data for the customer, to delete it, or to even take it somewhere else. We, we have our, our repor, our repor, our repor, no, operationalized, thank you <laughs> for your patience, this through our so-called privacy dashboard, which, which gives our users the tools they need to take to have control over their own data. So only one year after the GDPR went into effect, more than 18 million people from all around the world have used our tool to manage their personal information. Well, in fact, the highest level of engagement still comes from the United States, but also, again, from other countries around the world. And for us, this has been a clear, a very clear sign that people all over the world want to be empowered to control their data and to know what happens to their data. The truth is, we ourselves, as Microsoft, have, have come a long GDPR journey that includes valuable learnings we had ourselves. Since its early beginnings, we have been committed to making sure that our products and services comply with the GDPR. And this is also why, still today, yeah, we have more than 1,600 engineers across the company working on GDPR projects. And since its enactment in 2016, we have made significant investments to redesign our tools, system, processes, and to help our customers to meet the requirements of the GDPR. So one can say, today, GDPR compliance is deeply embedded in Microsoft's technology and culture as well. Let me close by saying that from all of this, what I just shared, the history in Europe, the learnings that Microsoft took and how we implement actually GDPR requirements and data protection approach in our products, we at Microsoft believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, as it was stated in the German constitution a long, a long while ago. So privacy is also the foundation of trust. We know that people will only use technology when they have trust in technology. This means companies like ours have the responsibility, this is how we see it, to protect the privacy of the personal data we collect and the data we manage. So thank you very much for your attention and for letting me share Microsoft's perspective here today. I highly appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tanya. Uh, I think you have given us a very useful introduction of the privacy protection in EU and Germany, and also Microsoft's uh, journey and learning in this field. Uh, I agree with you that in the digital era, no privacy, no trust, and no trust, no development. Yeah. But also, I think you raised a very interesting topic. Maybe we, we can discuss later, just whether should the 
rights listed in GDPR to be, should be extended to other countries, or you mentioned worldwide. I think we can discuss it later. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, then we come to the last speaker, last but not the least important, uh, uh, Mr. Liu Jian. He is the senior legal director of Meituan Dianping. Uh, his topic is about personal data protection in e-commerce platform for services. Okay, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jian Liu, and I'm from the Meituan Dianping. Uh, it will be a great honor to be the guest speaker of this uh, conference. Uh, Let's first uh, give a short introduction of our company, Meituan Dianping, uh, to those who are maybe not that familiar with us. Uh, Meituan Dianping uh, is a leading e-commerce platform uh, for the services in China. Actually now, uh, we are the third uh, largest TMT companies uh, publicly listed uh, in China, and we have uh, maybe the capital um, cap of over uh, 60 billion US dollars. Uh, and also you can see that uh, we have maybe 440 million uh, total number of annual transaction users. And we have operated in more than uh, 2,800 cities. And also we have, you know, in the last 12 months, uh, as of the June, we have, you know, 3.70 million riders. So uh, actually you can see we are, you know, a large company, and if I can give you a short, you know, just an introduction, we are the Chinese version of Deliveroo Plus, uh, plus Yelp, plus Booking, plus Uber, uh, and uh, many things covering the daily life of the people. Uh, uh, this is, you know, this is a short, you can see that some uh, business model of us. For example, uh, we operate lots of well-known APPs in China, we have, you know, we have Meituan, we have Dajong Dianping, uh, we have Weimaya, the food delivery, and also I think we have the Mobike. Yes, Mobike is one uh, brand, and maybe you can have that bike sharing also in Berlin. <laughs> uh, and also you can see that we are the, you know, platform uh, to connect both the customers and uh, the merchants, mostly of the uh, restaurants and for other merchants as well. And I think that for this maybe graph, we should add one more side on that it also, we have 3.7 million riders. It's, you know, deliver the food daily, you know, to every person in China. And we have lots of lots of businesses. As you can see that, for example, uh, one major business of us is food delivery. Also, the other one is book, uh, hotel booking. And also, you know, we have also have, you know, some to be businesses, uh, business to business. We have delivered, you know, materials, raw materials to the small restaurants. We also, you know, for the, Customers, you can you know order the food or other things online, and our writers will you know deliver the food or other stuff to your home. Uh, this is you know we have a people maybe Chinese people or other people called Emmy. So this this is Emmy day with Meituan uh, Dianping. Maybe in the morning when you wake up, if you want to have a dinner, you can just you know uh, you know. Search for the restaurants, that, you know, just like Yelp. You can search the best restaurants in town. And also then you can just make a reservation. And maybe at 12 p.m., you know, you're at work. You don't have time to go out. So it's simple. You can just order the food delivery. Our writers will send food to, to office or other places. At 2 p.m., you, you can make hotel reservations if you want to go on vacation. And at 5 p.m., yeah, you can ride a mobile to the, to the restaurant that you, at your choice. And also maybe 7 p.m. you just enjoy, enjoy the dinner time. You don't need to wait there online. You can just to, to give a reservation online before in advance. And also you can become, if you want to watch a movie, you can also you know, use our APP Moyen. You can just reserve you know, the uh, movie tickets. And you know, also in, at the end of the day, if you are still hungry, you can order you know, also the, the some time, uh, some food uh, from our platform. So this is a, this is a Lots of the things that we can cover. Uh, to add one more, our mission is we help people live better, eat better. So uh, this is a short general introduction, and next time we'll talk something, a shallow perspective of the data protection. Uh, in general, we always you know, put our uh, customers in priority. We believe that the 
data protection and their privacy are really important to us. So we will definitely follow this lots of lots of principles of the data protection. For example, there's control by users, transparency, a necessity, and technical support. Uh, we can, you know, give you guys more examples. This is a life circle of the data security management system. This is our, you know, something that we want to protect uh, our customers' uh, data privacy. For example, you know, the data collection, uh, of course, as a, you know, very, you know, huge platform. In, in some you know, necessary situations, we need to collect, uh, you know, customers' data. For example, if we, we want to deliver food to their home, we need to do their location. We need to maybe their uh, mobile phone number. So uh, this is data collection only necessary. Uh, the second one is data access system. Of course, you know, in our company, only the people have the authorization, right authorization, who can have the access to the personal data. It's uh, very strict rules. Uh, and for this data processing, you know, after we get into the, you know, this data, we need to get some processing work. Uh, in this, you know, we, we will also you know, put the principles here. So for example, we will have this pseudonymization, hopefully my pronunciation is right. You know, we just remove the, you know, their sensitivity uh, identifiers when it's not necessary. Uh, so our customers' you know, data privacy will not be compromised. And also, you know, next one, your data sharing, because you know, we are, as you can see, there are a lot of parties in our ecosystem. So uh, sometimes we have to share because, you know, for example, we have to share the customer's data with the restaurant so they can make, prepare the food. We need, sometimes we need to you know, share the data with the writers so they can, they can you know, send the food to their home. So, but when, they do the, uh, when we do that, we will do the you know, data encryption uh, to protect you know, privacy. Uh, and also, you know, for some you know, third-party suppliers or some third-party cooperators, we will have the confidentiality agreement with them further protect the confidentiality. Uh, fifth is a data audit. You know, this just data audit with, with some, you know, suppliers or you know, third parties. And the data deletion, we will ensure that, you know, when our customers is no longer want to with us, they can have the right to delete their account in our APPs and, you know, their information will be dealt with in accordance with, uh, you know, all the applicable, uh, applicable rules. Next one, yeah, I think we'll give you more examples. Hopefully my Speech will not be that boring. Sorry, it's, in, uh, it's food delivery. Sorry, it's in Chinese, so I will translate for you. Uh, first of that, you know, uh, our platform will use, uh, you know, put a lot of money every year to you know, just to provide this kind of uh, privacy numbers. Uh, you know, for example, you know, when this, in the food delivery business, you know, uh, when the you know riders just send the you know when riders send the food to the to the customers you know they, they need to call they need to call the customers. We will use this you know will not you know in the mobile phone it will not be shown as the real telephone number of the customers. It will be shown as this artificially randomly created privacy number so that they will not be seen you know. And also sometimes we will put some you know some hide address, hide of address matters to further protect, you know, this uh, customer's privacy. And this car hailing, yes, we do have some car hailing just like Uber businesses in China. So uh, if you call, uh, you know, call our car uh, and our APPs, you know, for the drivers and the customers, they need to call each other. We also provide this kind of uh, artificial privacy numbers. This hotel booking. Uh, under this scenario, before the hotel accept the customer's uh, order, the hotel manager, they cannot see the uh, you know, people's the customers, the name and the real telephone number. Only after the order is accepted, you know, this hotel can also see that privacy number. And after the end of the order, that the, the, the hotel manager will have no access to that number any, any longer. And, uh, and for this trend and effort, we believe that uh, the people's privacy and you know, data will become more and more important. So uh, we, as, you know, as one of the big you know, ecosystems and one of the big platforms in China, we really treasure this and we will always respect the customer's uh, privacy and data protection. 
And from our end, we will always you know, do some policy research. We will always follow the you know, uh, best uh, practices of the world and also this development of the policy. And we, as you know, technology TMT company, we think that technology is also important. So we will try our best to you know, make the innovations in this field and try to find other ways in technical you know, method to protect, further protect the customers' privacies. And at the last but not the least, you know, uh, we have an ecosystem. Lots of parties are, are involved. For example, the customers, merchants, writers, and so on. So we are hoping that all these parties in our ecosystem can help us and give us guidance and supervision. So together with all parties, we, we believe that we can build you know, a better society, a better world without com compromising their data privacy. We can accomplish our mission to help people eat better, live better. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, now we have about uh, eight minutes for comments and discussion. Uh, any participants, if you have any comments and questions, please hands up and tell me. Yes, you can give a brief introduction of yourself and also a very short question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vicky and I'm a year 10 student from Hong Kong. Nowadays, we would always have to fill our personal data online. Also, when our personal data would be used to gain access, we don't notice that. We just press the button to give access and continue to do what we want. As we want to do our things promptly, we may neglect the risk of leaking our data. And, the, and how can we promote public awareness to prevent more people leaking their personal data? Thank you. So, who are you going to ask? Uh, anyone. Anyone? <laughs> so, any speakers want to reply to this question? Mr. Liu? Uh, it's a very good question. I think that in, uh, in Chinese, that traditionally the personal information is not that uh, important. But nowadays, I know that with the uh, you know, development of our society, we know that it's becoming more and more important. So uh, in how to improve the public awareness? I think first, you know, uh, we, we have a lot of parties. First, you know, to, from the regulator side, they can, you know, you know, take more approach, they can educate people, uh, they can, you know, do some, you know, public campaigns to, to, to let them know this. From the private, from, from the private sector, of course, you know, I think that most, uh, I think the most large, at least the most large uh, platforms and TMD company in China, we have noticed the importance of this one. So we have actually uh, try our, take any measures to educate our employees to take any measures to protect the personal information of our customers. And, you know, from our side, we will also do some some you know, good stuff to, to improve this aspect. I think this is from the private sector and public sector. So for other things, maybe, maybe other, I think, guest speaker can, can contribute more. Thank you. OK. So maybe we can go to the next question. OK. Please. Thank you, Dr. Zhou. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, also from the China, and I just want to ask some questions about the, the GDPR. I, may I ask the, the Tanjia? Uh, I just want to know that the GDPR and uh, is also uh, about the data legislation in China is recently very con concerned. And uh, can you give me some advice about uh, GDPR in in Chinese internet companies and uh, uh, give me some suggestion about how to your best practice. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a great question, though. <laughs> um, I, I think you truly understand that I can speak for Microsoft, that's for sure. And as I stated before, um, we, we apply the GDPR to our, uh, commercial customers worldwide. Yeah. Um, and. I can't speak for, for any other companies here. Um, 
would do business in, in China, I would say. But uh, I would probably also build on the question before. I think um, it all starts with the education of the users to enable the user to, to, to know what happens to the data, to know what happens if you click a button, you know? And um, so uh, I think no matter whether it's in China or Europe, yeah, it's key to create transparency by the companies that, process, that are processing data, yeah, but probably also from the regulator. This is what happened in, in, in Europe with the GDPR. Yeah? The, the European regulator did not want to rely on companies, basically not, you know, US American companies who, who are um, doing, doing IT business in Europe. So um, again, I think it's, it's the enablement of the users, the transparency that has to be cr created by the business, yeah? Yeah, yeah, and the right regulatory framework. If the GDPR is the right framework for China, I'm not the one to Okay, tell. thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I totally agree with you. Okay, maybe we come to that question I have just mentioned after uh, Mrs. Tanya had made his speech that whether we should extend the rights listed in GDPR to other countries, uh, maybe it is a very, very uh, uh, question in other countries' legislation. So uh, what's your opinion, Professor Zhang? In, in China's legislation on this in this field. Uh, thank you. And I think if we are talking about the principles, uh, broad uh, 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 concept of the regulation, I think yes, GDPR has show has certainly merit and show uh, to the world that we should pay attention to the people's privacy and to people's right in this digitalized world. But I think, uh, as I just mentioned, that there are many questions and many, uh, many things that are still under the researchers. Now, that means we are still studying that what is the best way to protect people's privacy and to protect people's uh, basic rights in this digitalized world. Of course, I think GDPR has a very, uh, has shown a very great model, but uh, is it the best mechanism is still not quite sure. And I think that, of course, uh, maybe uh, even if GDPR is best for Europe, and it might not necessarily be the best kind of regulation in other countries, because the law should be considered in the whole legal system and also in consideration of the enforcement environment. So I think maybe there need a lot of study, but I certainly agree that the general principles of the to enhance the transparency, to empower user are very good and important principles that all the all governments, regulators and the companies should pay attention to. But we should still cooperate uh, with each other inside the, uh, each culture, inside each country to figure out what is the best uh, legal regulation in that country. Uh, that's my personal opinion. Thank you. So do we have any I, I comment? I totally agree. I mean, there's not one size fits all, yeah? And I mean, GDPR as a regulation, and regulations always have a lot to do with the history of the country or the region that regulates and the culture, yeah? And um, so, so I wouldn't say that necessarily, um, again, there's one size fits all. Of course, as I also stated before, data protection is the key issue of our, our, our days, yeah? handling data. So, um, but if the GDPR should be, you know, transmitted or transformed into various other countries, I, I'm not the one to tell. I would say it's, it, it depends on the region, I would say, yeah. Okay, so as we know now, the GDPR has also under evaluation by EU and also maybe evaluation by other countries' legislators. So I think maybe 
uh, we have to come to an end to our discussion and our forum. And thank you very much for, for your attending. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, if you could take your seats, we're about to begin. Um, so good morning and welcome to the Open Forum of the Internet Governance Forum. And thank you for joining us today as we discuss the future of artificial intelligence and sustainable development. My name is Wadzanai Motsi Katai, and I will be your moderator for this discussion. And as we know, artificial intelligence presents the new frontier for the fourth industrial revolution, providing opportunities to leapfrog traditional parts of industrial evolution. However, this field also comes with limitations in terms of capital, capacity, access, and information, as they are not universally available in emerging economies. And so today we'll focus a lot of our discussion on a new initiative to try and bridge this gap called the Fair Forward Artificial Intelligence for All Initiative by the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, which aims to facilitate more inclusive and sustainable, and like its name, fair practices in artificial intelligence. Sharing their perspectives on this project today and its importance and opportunities are our guests, Mark Holtzberger, Odas Nyonkuru, Mila Romanov, and Lukas Bokowski. Please help me in welcoming our guests to the panel today. If you can give them a round of applause. Um, we will begin with Mr. Holtzberger, who's the representative for the Directorate of Digital Technologies and Development Cooperation from the BMZ. With over 20 years of experience, he's worked as a consultant for migration, integration, and refugee policy for the Green Party and the Bundestag. And today, he'll be introducing the project to us um, and speaking from the BMZ's perspective. Mr. Holtzberger, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Distinguished participants of the IGF, Mrs. Romanov, good morning. You and Koro, Mr. Putin, good morning. And Mr. Bukowski, wonderful ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Holzberger, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, on this open forum of the IGF. This panel today is called The Future of Artificial, Artificial Intelligence and Sustainable Development and it's hosted not just by the BMZ, but also by the United uh, Nations Global Pulse, Mrs. Romanov. And it's following a pre-event on Monday on AI in Africa. And during the 60, uh, following 60 minutes, we will, at this IGF meeting, unveil a major new initiative of our ministry on, on AI. Um, and to illustrate the emergent importance of AI, let me please tell you briefly a story from four weeks ago. As you know, Germany has regular consultations with its partner countries to discuss the priorities on how to achieve social and economic progress. And recently, we had these discussions with India. And for the first time, AI was the, topic, uh, the top topic on the list and the question how Germany and India could cooperate closely on this issue. And in the end, the first two pages of the final conclusions of our governments were covered only by the topic of AI. That shows that Germany and India have learned at least one lesson, that digital transformation is not optional. And as a member of the BMZ Division for Digital Technologies and Development Cooperation, I can tell you that my ministry focuses on many topics of utmost importance, fighting poverty, ending hunger, or addressing the effects of climate change. However, we know we need to rely and to build on the potential of digital approaches if we want to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Developing, developing uh, and emerging countries cannot and should not be excluded from this ongoing fundamental techno technological change. This is how we interpret, interpret the leave no one behind principle of the Agenda 2030. Otherwise, we will face an alarming innovation gap and a growing digital divide. As of now, half of the world population is still offline. Millions of women 
are fewer online than men, more than Nigeria's and Kenya's combined population, and less than 1% of all patents worldwide derive from at least developing countries. So what is my ministry doing to address these challenges? Well, first, the BMZ has drawn recently a clear strategy on digital transformation. Second, the BMZ has stepped up funding in the area of digital transformation and is running over 550 projects in over 90 countries. And third, we now start to focus on key technologies for development. And AI is, without any doubt, one of these key technologies. And as I said, we need that digital technologies and therefore also AI to achieve the above mentioned SDGs. On the other side, we are convinced that artificial intelligence has to be anchored locally. And we say AI should not just address the benefits of a few, but should instead empower all people and communities. And from this background, I am proud to announce the official kickstart of our flagship project, Fair Forward, Artificial Intelligence for All, here and now at the IGF 2019. Uh, and, <laughs> and I'm thankful and really honored that we're doing this not just on our own, for goodness sake not, that we, can, but that we can work and cooperate with strong partners in Asia, in Africa and worldwide, and some of them will tell you uh, in a second. But coming back, and to explain the approach of our flagship project, let me just explain to you the abbreviation FAIR. You all know this word, but so FAIR is F, A, I, and R. And let us start with the F, like framework. Fair Forward adv advocates value-based AI, which is rooted in human rights, international norms, and privacy. Fair Forward wants, therefore, to support our partners to develop a specific policy framework which, uh, which will allow a locally rooted, responsible, and ethical use of AI. And Ms. Romanov, please tell us something about it in a, in a few seconds, right? Now, to, uh, let us move for, um, onward to the A, like anchor. Fairward Forward will anchor or focus its action by building local technology know-how on AI in Africa and Asia. The third capital letter is I, like integrate. We will strive to integrate best practices of digital learning and training for the development of AI in our partner countries. And finally, we have the R, like responsibility or responsible data. Many of you will know knowledge of AI programming is not enough to create AI applications. In order to develop and train AI, you need data, and I mean a lot of data. But one of the major problems in many places are missing data or biased data. In fact, many of our partner countries face a lack of accessible data that fits to their local context. And that is why we want to remove entry barriers to AI and, and improve access to local training data and open source AI technology. Let me give you just a brief idea on what a, a Fair Forward is aiming for. You do not, perhaps you do not know, you, I don't know if you all are, uh, sorry, I do not, I do not know if you all are aware, but okay, all voice assistants work on AI and all of the major commercial uh, applications understand English, French, Chinese, and even German, but none of them understand any African language. They work for the, f they work for the sake of a few, and not for the majority of the world. And try, for instance, and ask Siri in Kenya, Rwanda, how, to, how the weather will be in Kigali today or tomorrow. That regularly drives Siri mad. 
We believe that open access to African and Asian voice data is a key focus area, and that is why our flagship Fair Forward wants to support local innovators developing AI-based voice technologies so that more people can benefit from this digital transformation. And I'm looking forward to you, Mr. Nkuro, to your presentation. He's our partner in Rwanda and will talk about his ongoing work there. Voice technology deliver value to local populations in their own languages, for instance, either to include digital interaction with government services or to provide small farmers with voice-enabled information services. And Mr. Bukowski, he will give us his, future, his vision of uh, such a future. Let me finally announce the start of a strategic partnership between my ministry, the BMZ, and the browser company Mozilla. Together, we not only work on the collection of voice data, in fact, we want to build an alliance for open voice data and technology with Africa and Asia. And I just recommend to check Twitter for more news on this partnership. All our, ex uh, all our activities are based on a close dialogue with our partner countries. And this is why we are here today. We want to start a dialogue with the IGF community on how we can make sure that AI supports sustainable development in the future and how we can avoid that growing global digital divide. I will end by repeating our vision for Fair Forward. Our main aim is to build a more open, more inclusive and more sustainable approach to AI. And let's join our forces on this. And I am looking forward to the discussion with you and to the panel now. I want to make I want to thank everyone for here for joining online or offline to bring development cooperation closer to digital transformation. And thank you. Thank you very much for that inspiring opening. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Odas Nyongkuru, CEO of Digital Umuganda, a company working to reduce the digital divide gap in Africa by democratizing access to information and technology services. As you've just heard, Digital Umuganda is part of the Mozilla Common Voice Project, which is developing digital voice assistance in Kenya, Rwanda. Here to share his insights and perspectives on AI and sustainable development, please help me in welcoming Mr. Nyongkuru. You have the floor. I, I will be talking more about the R in FAIR, which is responsible data. And um, as you know, um, we've been working with Mozilla as well as the GIZ in Rwanda to build open voice data sets. And I'm going to cover how we're doing that and why exactly we're doing that. Um, you might have seen this number uh, over and over again at the IGF, 53.6%. Um, and, and this is the official number from the ITU about talking about um, the number of people in the world connected to the internet, 53.6%. So you could easily say that over 50% of the world is connected to the internet, which is a good milestone. But then again, 46.3% or is not connected. And as you, as you see, uh, much of the unconnected people are coming from uh, developing countries, mainly 28.2% in Africa and 48.4% in Asia and Pacific countries. And the problem is not only about connection, but also access to information and services on the internet. The internet is heavily skewed towards English and other major languages. And having an open voice data sets will help solve that challenge because English is only spoken by 20% globally and only 5% natively. So you can imagine what this leaves for the 48, um, for the 43 percent of the people who are not connected to the internet, not only because of lack of infrastructure, but lack of uh, access to services and information in their local languages. And this is mainly the major uh, challenge that we are solving. 
Um, and the question becomes, how do we make technology more inclusive uh, for people who do not speak uh, um, major languages that are, are accessible on the internet? And we believe um, through the partnership of Mozilla and BMZ, as well as the local partners, Open Voice Dataset is going to be a major uh, solving uh, uh, solution to that. Um, that is why in Rwanda we partnered uh, with Mozilla as well as GIZ and BMZ on bringing these voice data sets and we're doing that through the community. So it's not only about uh, the way we access data but how we build it, how we, ma how we maintain it and how we govern it. And we're, we're doing that towards a more community-based approach approach where uh, the community is participating in building the voice data set, but also the innovators in the community will be the one who are innovating on top of these data sets. Here we will have uh, an ecosystem uh, of voice technology that would otherwise not be accessible because of the heavy uh, investment needed to bring the infrastructure needed for voice interaction in local languages. And we're doing that, as you see, our name is called Umuganda, and you might wonder what Umuganda is. Um, if you've been to Kigali, uh, have a lot of people been in Rwanda already in the crowd? Oh, quite a few, yeah. If you've been to Kigali, um, every last Saturday of the month, uh, we have uh, Umuganda, which is basically people coming together to build infrastructure. And this has normally targeted physical infrastructure, which is roads, which is, uh, might be hospitals, or um, schools, depending on the needs of the community. And our, um, our thesis is how do we bring that to the digital age? Because with the digital age come new challenges and new infrastructure to be built. And what we're doing is adapting um, uh, a rather solution that's rooted in the Randis culture to build digital infrastructure because it engages um, a, 90, 80% of the population, and it's a spirit that's already there and can be adapted to digital infrastructure as well. So it came from um, people working on a normal physical infrastructure in Uganda like this and has been um, upgraded to this. So this is one of, 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 of our digital Uganda events, and here we're collecting voice data in our African Leadership University. And this is how we are building uh, the data set by having people come around uh, in events like this to build the data set. Um, and not only are these people, uh, universities, who are working with the universities, not only are they helping in building it, but also they're the innovators uh, that will be building solutions on top of it. So in some sort of way, we're also uh, leveling the playing field so that not only global companies are able to uh, build solutions, um, but also local innovators are able to build solutions for the local communities, and hence allowing um, innovation to come from all over the world in the places we would least expect it. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, thank you in Kenya Rwanda, it's Murakoze, so uh, maybe one last word of Kenya Rwanda you can learn as well. Yeah. Thank you, and there will be time to ask our panelists questions following all their presentations. Um, our next speaker is Mila Romanov, the lead for data policy and governance at the UN Global Pulse. She is responsible for establishing sustainable mechanisms for public-private partnerships, as well as responsible use of big data for global development and humanitarian action. Her vast experience also spans commercial litigation and data security, privacy and communication. So please help me in welcoming Mila Romanov. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to our co-host uh, and uh, key partners in the Global South, um, BMZ and GIZ. Uh, very pleased to be here um, and uh, continue these discussions that were actually started on day zero uh, with our director, Robert Kirkpatrick, um, also opening up the panel speaking about the challenges and opportunities in the Global South that AI brings. And um, I'm happy to um, give you a little bit of an introduction of um, the work that we are starting to do and what we have done so far. So Global Pulse is a special initiative of the UN Secretary General, and uh, which is tasked with the mission to um, understand and, uh, and bring up the value of big data and artificial intelligence um, to help the achievement of the sustainable development goals. 
Global Pulse functions to three tracks. The key ones is uh, the scale and discovery, and um, the third one is policy. And policy includes um, understanding and also developing mechanisms for the governance of data and the governance of the artificial intelligence. And I will speak about the uh, governance today. If we are, um, we are currently working, we have a lab in um, Kampala, our Pulse Lab Kampala, and we have a lab in our regional lab in Asia, in uh, Jakarta, in Indonesia. And through our regional hubs, um, we are uh, working with the governments across the regions to first understand the challenges that emerging technologies bring to the global south. And then second, try to address these challenges with the key partners. And today I will be talking about how we are doing this, particularly in the African region. We, are, we have started work with our uh, partners, uh, BMZ and GAZ, um, a few years ago. And uh, we'll continue this work going forward within the next two or two, three years. We're um, looking at how, well, first of all, what value artificial intelligence brings to the global south. And through that, we're partnering with uh, private sector companies, academia, through key partnerships in developing tools and developing software that first helps understand uh, what type of data do you need, what type of technology do you need to understand the needs of the local communities in the global south. And we started this work in Ghana and Uganda. One of the interesting projects that we've been um, working on is actually um, speech to text through, um, through collecting publicly available data from radio. As you, will all, as you would all know, um, in the Western world, we're working with uh, social media data, right? Social media data is one of the most powerful resources. Uh, but what would we do in Africa? It's mobile data and it's also, um, and, it's, and it's radio data. But in order to understand the localized languages, we have to build um, software, right? To understand the languages and then to translate it into the context of those economies. Um, that's one of the projects, and there is many more. But the key question when we think about it is, what types of frameworks do we need in order to understand and utilize this value? And the frameworks around responsible use of such technologies, the frameworks that actually not only uh, bring the value of data and artificial intelligence in the economical sense, but actually empower people from all sorts of human rights perspectives. And um, as the key here, the fundamental uh, question here is the right to privacy. And we've been working on developing the data privacy and data protection leg regulation um, with the open request of different governments across the global south as well as in, uh, in, within the European Union. Um, we've, we've started work within the, uh, within, across the United Nations system as well to um, as well unlock the power of data through developing governance, governance data governance frameworks um, uh, within the um, resident coordinators' offices and also within the, um, uh, with, with the UN specialized agencies. Through this work, we're hoping, based on our learning on our own experiences and our own work within the UN system, uh, we hope to translate the same experiences and pilot the governance frameworks um, empowered by the local communities, bringing them through the consultation processes, like in Uganda and also in Ghana, to build the governance framework and to help governments build responsible governance framework for artificial intelligence and, um, and data to ensure that the value of data is unlocked. Just the session before that that took place um, basically an hour ago stressed and our, the special advisor um, to the Secretary General with Fabrizio Hoschild um, actually brought up an idea um, that was translated through the high-level panel on digital cooperation by the Secretary General of actually establishing the regional help desks as one of the ideas to bring the local communities um, and bring the local needs into the development of such governance frameworks. That's one of the key recommendations that also came out of the um, high-level of the report of the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Another important um, notion that we need to also not forget is the context. And so what we're trying to do in order to build the frameworks and to build governance framework around, uh, frameworks around data and AI is to actually the context in which such data and artificial intelligence will be used. Con we should never forget the context, right? And so one of the recommendations also of the high-level panel on digital cooperation to the Secretary General was also that 
in order to understand the value of artificial intelligence and data governance, we should bring the context, in particular the context from the global south. So what are we trying to do um, in, in order to address these challenges? So in the, in the work that we're doing now in Uganda and Ghana, that, that started actually with, uh, with supporting the government of Uganda in, in developing their data protection regulation, uh, bill, uh, data protection law. Now in actually developing and supporting the president task, uh, special task force on the fourth industrial revolution to develop the ethical AI framework, framework supported also by our key partner, uh, BMZ and GAZ. And um, this work has been continued throughout the year and will continue into the, uh, into the future years as well. Um, it, it is built on the key consultations from the key stakeholders coming from the local communities. That's one crucial part and element of it. <clears throat> um, but then what was mentioned also in the previous discussion is data. Data is the key element, right? So in order to, before we start with the governance frameworks, we also need to understand how do we govern data? So, uh, and how do we give access to and unlock, um, unlock that data to feed into the artificial intelligence? So the second part of our work will concentrate as well as in Ghana and Uganda in actually building the, um, the sustainable economical infrastructure to unlock the power of data and develop frameworks, both the regulatory framework, the governance frameworks, as well as the technical frameworks for sustainable data access. And I want to stress that the key is sustainable. Um, as we all know, the data now is actually being, unlo being locked and, and held by a lot of the um, private sector com companies around the world. This is not only the problem of the global south. So our role here and the goal um, is to actually build the sustainable frameworks that would allow the private sector, um, NGOs, share the data with the public sector and the, the other way around, while protecting, preserving the right to privacy and also bringing the right technical solution into place. So we're starting this, this is a, very, this is a huge project and quite important one, is actually figuring out the regulatory barriers and the technological barriers. And we will be looking for the partners on both fronts. Um, the process will start through a series of consultations that, that will be conducted at the national levels and also regional levels. And we will be seeking the support of the um, expert group on data governance and AI that Global Pulse has established in 2014, which also has experts on the rotational basis from around the world. But we will, in addition to the expertise of this group, we will, as I said, conduct a series of local consultation, bringing the expertise from the local communities. And taking this opportunity today at the IGF, I really hope that we will also find that expertise and that expertise will be reaching out to us within the next months and years to contribute to these really crucial discussions. Um, I would like to thank you again for the, uh, for the time and uh, invitation to be here, and I will be happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Mr. Lukas Bokalski, European Partnerships Lead for Viamo, which is a global social enterprise dedicated to helping individuals and organizations make better decisions about technology use and development. Mr. Bokalski is an ICT for Development Strategy, Strategy and Development Expert, and he's here to share his insights as one of the partners in this new initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I think I brought you a picture, but if not, I can also just uh, try to put your focus back on our target populations and on the people we actually do this for, the artificial intelligence and sustainable development. And if you imagine a smallholder farmer somewhere in, in Uganda or Rwanda, um, who is most likely part of the 43% that, that Odas referred to, we have to find a way to actually give them access to information in their moments of needs, in their local language, and through the devices that they already have. And while we all hope for having universal mobile data coverage anytime soon, that's also a big dream. So tackling that opportunity and that challenge right now is what Viamo is doing. And we operate, uh, we're a global social business, we operate in about 30 countries, and I represent my, my colleagues, my local colleagues that actually do all the hard work. And what we do is we combine human-centered design, behavior change, communication, 
and uh, in the end also digital and appropriate digital technologies. And we sit between mobile phone network operators, between social media channels and partners like GIZ or local governments to facilitate meaningful interactions with beneficiaries, meaningful interactions with smallholder farmers, for, uh, in, for example, or with um, young mothers that have questions about the health of their children. And um, we try to change, change the paradigm in communication and give them access to information through, for example, simple mobile phone telephony. And the protocol that we're using, thank you, uh, the protocol that we're using or, or what we find out about these uh, target audiences is that they're not only part of the 43% without access to internet, but they're also illiterate, usually. Um, they do not own smartphones, typically. And uh, given those factors, classic mobile phone communication through SMS services or the hyper-hyped uh, hyper USSD instances is meaningless because they cannot read or write a full sentence and they cannot interact with that communication. That's where we come in and work with our telecom partners and, and partners like GIZ to facilitate interactive voice response communication in pre-recorded audio messages in local languages. And right now, we, uh, we achieve a meaningful interaction with about 19 million uh, unique users per year in about uh, 300 million sessions uh, in 2018 alone. Um, and we're, it, it's, it's expanding not only uh, because of the opportunity, but because of the need. People need access to information when they need the information. We cannot wait for them to wait for a community health worker, to wait for a radio show or something else. They all want to have access to information as much as you uh, desire access to information right now on your smartphones. So. I think that is very critical. Um, what we see with IVR is very powerful. 75% of all callers to our hotlines that we set up get through and make it to a key message, for example, on uh, best practice in breastfeeding or um, on gender-based violence or how to, how to grow maize. But that also means that we leave out 25%. 25% of people that actually do call fail to get through, simply because IVR, even though it's very simple, it might be too technically complex for people that are illiterate and never went to school. And that is why we're interested in voice recognition, and that is where this corporation is coming in with GIZ and BMZ and Mozilla and, and the local partners like Odas, because we want to work on voice recognition and we want to unlock voice recognition in local languages to make these services more accessible for local populations and their local languages and to close this 25% gap and do even more. Um, for now, as was mentioned uh, rightfully, the capital cost of developing such an algorithm and the technology behind it is extensively high. Even for a, a social business like Viamo, um, this is something we couldn't do ourselves. So this opportunity uh, of making that publicly available as an open source and also the training data is a game changer and again a change in the paradigm in communication international development. Because if you imagine that people soon in local uh, communities, in rural communities in Rwanda or DRC or Nigeria or India can call in and simply say, I want to know what the weather is going to be tomorrow, they will be able to make important decisions about growing the produce in a much more effective way, losing, not losing money anymore because of bad decision making and actually coming much closer to getting out of poverty. If young mothers can just call in and say, my child has blue pickles, what, what is the problem here? You will actually save lives with that. So I think that it's important by speaking, when we speak about frameworks, when we speak about regulation and, and responsible data, that's all very important. But I think it's really important to keep in mind why we are doing this. We're doing this, as, uh, as Mr. Holzberg has said, to reduce poverty and to save lives. And that is what we try to do. Um, I think there are a lot of ethical questions on the way. Um, to be fair and frank, we do not have the answers to all of these. That's why work done by UN Global Pulse and others is really important, because as a private company, in the end we're a social business, but that also means a private uh, company, we're subject in all these countries to the local data regulation, and sometimes it's even contradicting to our ethical understanding of data privacy. Um, so it's not always that clear, and there's no, no clear way forward right now. 
And that is why this work is important um, to really advance this and, and bring us in the future. And I think we also, what we can contribute as the private sector, certainly, uh, data. Um, because we have six million interactions right now every day on our platform um, through those services. So we can feed the data back in and I encourage other private sector players to appreciate that, uh, that approach and do equally because otherwise open source technology and open source voice recognition will not work. If we keep it behind closed doors, that will just again serve the very few um, and it will only be accessible to the big multinationals. So that is why uh, we fully follow this logic of open source, not only algorithms and technology, but also open source voice data. And uh, I thank you for that, for the great initiative, and let's, let's take that forward. Once again, thank you to all our panelists for sharing your perspective and comments um, on this new initiative. We'll kick off our offline question and answer session at the moment by taking two questions from the audience um, for our panelists to respond, and then we can take the next round, um, time permitting. So we have Yusa and Yusa. Yes, please. Good, good, good morning. Thank you for a wonderful set of presentations. I am Guru from IT for Change. We are an NGO in India. We are also a member of the JustNet Coalition, uh, which looks at how we can come together and build a net that is just and equitable and works for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> the issue of uh, data protection and privacy of data and making data work for the global south, I think uh, many speakers spoke about. And uh, I wanted to bring one element uh, for discussion and for the views of the panelists. And uh, basically, if you look at data from a protection point of view, there are two aspects. One is the privacy, individuals privacy. You don't want to violate that. You want to protect the interests of individuals. But I think uh, we need to look at another aspect which is not so much talked about, which is the economic value of the data itself. Now, I just want to bring a quick historical perspective. Uh, the developing yeah, I'll keep it very brief. This is a very important aspect, and I think this is ignored. So I just want to quickly, I will, I'll bring this element in, which is that if you take a historical perspective, the developing countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America have been, uh, for centuries, been the source of raw materials, which they export to the, the Europe and the developed world, and then they import back the finished goods. And the terms of trade are, have been so unfair which is one of the primary reasons why developing countries are struggling. And I think whether it's Rwanda in Africa or India in Asia or any country in the developing world, we can see the same issue. If you look at today's situation, the richest companies in the world are data companies. So Uber is profitable not because it has a software platform, which may be free and open source, or because it has a fleet of drivers who are not its employees. It's rich because it owns data. Now, I think requesting companies and private sector to share the data I think you can't, that's our biggest asset. And uh, in India, we have a committee set up by the government of India, and the companies clearly tell the government that the data belongs to us. So I am interested very much in the panelists uh, exploring the issue of how do we make sure that the developing countries do not continue to remain exploited by the uh, private sector companies and the governments of the global north, and how we can make sure that the digital divide is not going to cause extraordinary inequality and inequity. And I think with data and AI, the situation is going to be much, much worse than the uh, situation we had centuries back. I think the issue of economic value of data, economic ownership of data by the Global South is extremely critical. I'll just end by uh, mentioning that the JustNet Coalition has come out with a manifesto for digital justice, copies of which are available uh, in the JustNet Coalition lobby. And the, first, the only principle of that, Data subjects must own their own data individually and collectively. I think that's a very important principle that I would urge the panelists to think about and respond to. Thank you. I'm Safari. I'm a MP from DRC. I've been in different sessions, and I was pointing out that we have a problem in Africa that we are now uh, those big uh, companies are getting data from us, but we, they are not helping us to 
uh, to catch up with those kind of issue of uh, artificial intelligence. And it's a good thing to know that uh, the German uh, corporation have decided to help uh, Africa country to, uh, to catch up on that. Uh, but uh, my concern is that uh, uh, the way maybe the project was uh, designed, maybe the phase one, I don't know if there will be other phases, like the case for uh, the good project in Rwanda, uh, I, can pin, I can just show two the problem I have with that. First of all, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it is them, it, it's still the same story. So you are getting Rwanda helping you to get the data. And after that, uh, I don't know what will happen. But I think as far as Rwanda is, uh, is some kind, somehow developed on uh, IT technology, you should also help them to not only provide you the input, but start even exploit themselves that input. I don't know the future of the project, but that will be a good thing because they are already somehow a step uh, before other country in Africa. So they can go at the next level and start even exploit, not only provide you the data only. And also on the language that you choose. Uh, you have all you have say Murakoze. I think few people know that la language, okay. But if you really want to help African country, there's also in a language that is, is identified as African language. I think anyone here, even if you haven't go in Africa, but you know Akuna Matata. That's Swahili. And that's more than 100 million people in Africa that speak that language. So the impact of that project, if you can associate, you have also in Uganda the same project, if you can associate that things also of getting voice from them, coping that project in Rwanda, also making it in Uganda and Kenya, it can help more African people where we need that voice services. We don't have people who know to, to read, to write, but if they can, they can get data services through voice, it will be much better. Thank you very much. So are there any takers for that question? First, looking at the economic value of data, not exporting it as a raw material, and then also considering other languages for the project. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to answer uh, the gentleman from India, as well as, as the MP from DRC, um, about um, data being exploited. Um, by uh, uh, the Global North and uh, not the Global South. I think a lot of what we're doing as well is working with the ecosystem and also the innovators in the space to bring these solutions on top of the infrastructure. So it's not only about having uh, an infrastructure or data set that nobody will use, but working with them and looking at solutions that will pr practically be there. So it's also um, a question of, of, of looking at how do we level the, the, the playing field for local innovators? Because normally data um, such as this is held by global companies and multinationals. And in this way, we're also giving the ability to local innovators. And, and there are a couple that come to us to events that say we, we already had solutions but lacked uh, data. And the, the solutions are there, the innovators are there. Uh, what's lacking was the infrastructure. So yeah, I, I believe um, the ecosystem is there and working with them to get use of this data set is also something that we're doing and will continue to do uh, in the progress of the project. And I guess um, for the scaling to other African languages, maybe um, BMZ would be more um, equipped to answer this, but I believe uh, the, the recently announced BMZ Mozilla uh, partnership is to scale to also other African languages as well, yeah. Um, I would like to share uh, some of the work to, that we're doing to address the exploitation and also the, um, the frameworks around data to bring up its economic value. So we've conducted a series of consultations over the last um, year, um, and they're we're continuing, actually, the next one will be in, um, in a few weeks in Uganda. But so far, we've done a few consultations in Ghana um, in cooperation with the Ministry of ICT and also the Data Protection Office. 
And um, uh, some of the outcomes, and, and then pre prior to that, we also hosted consultation in Tunis uh, during the RightsCon. Uh, and the key question, one of the key questions that kept coming up is actually, how do we bring up the economic value um, without uh, jeopardizing the human rights, in particular the right to privacy? Um, and the second question that came up is, how do we bring in the, into the context of the African economies, particularly, um, uh, and um, w what can we do about that? How can we ensure that the data that's there does not get exploited and stays within, uh, stays there? So um, I don't, we don't have so far the, the, the answer to everything, but we do have a roadmap, um, at least from the way the UN look, is looking at it. Um, one is, I mentioned earlier, is to bring up more and more experts from those countries. We can, t we can talk about the regional, but we also need to talk about the national context, right? Africa is big, and um, every culture is quite distinct, and, and even the communities within each country may be quite distinct one from another. So we need to really keep in, in, uh, in place the local, the local context. So, um, so that's one key part to it. Um, and we need to make sure that these people, the people of these, from these communities, are actually the ones that are deciding and developing the laws and the frameworks and the standards. And how do we get there? So we, we have this, you know, and this has been raised in um, previous sessions during IGF, is that we do have um, strong regulatory frameworks and examples from other parts of the world. And, um, and it has been brought up, and we've been listening, uh, that um, a lot of the times such frameworks are being simply used as examples in the, in the global uh, South context. So there is, there, is, um, there is advantages and disadvantages to that, as to any question, as, as to any solution. Um, the frameworks that have already been developed are quite tailored to the Western world economies, right? And Taking those frameworks and bringing them into the Global South context can work, but only, only, if they're not copied and pasted as is, if they're, only, if they're looked at only as one of the examples of the best practices. And I can share it also from the uh, UN's perspective because the UN also has a specific, um, it's not the same, but it has a specific, it has a mandate it has a specific status, and it also needs to operate within a specific frame. So we also look at the best practices, but we also need to keep in mind where, how we are functioning and think of what, what, what operations we're delivering. So in the context of the Global South, and particularly in Africa, I'll speak, I'll speak particularly for the African context, you need to, you know, we need to, we need to help, and the UN, that's the role of the UN, to bring in the context and the needs, the economical, cultural, social needs to the concepts of these, of these frameworks. One example is, um, you know, the, and I'm not, I'm not an African, but, but working with a lot of African colleagues is the Ubuntu. You know, the, the notion of openness and the notion of collective rights and, um, and how this is realized through the African context, right? Through, through the African culture. How can we bring that into the best practices that are shaping out around the world and make these frameworks work for the African economies. So that's a question also to the audience and those particularly from the region. Maybe you will have an answer or how we can do that. Sec third is thinking about the uh, collective rights, right? So we, lo we, talk, we look a lot about the uh, privacy as an individual right, but more and more so, especially when we think about the the Global South context, and especially African context, is um, the group rights, right? How can we use data to benefit the group rights? Not only one individual, but actually the community. And I think this is a quite distinct factor from any, uh, from any other part of the world, at least learning from the consultations that we've held is actually understanding how we can tr translate the use of data and the risks and harms that it brings to the group harms, and also how does the group rights relate to the use of data. So think about it from the perspective of also using data for the good and also not using the data for the good. How can we balance the two? 
And I think a lot of the best practices and framework that are shaping around the world really forget the factor of what do we do if the data is not used. If you have a tool, and as a humanitarian, if you have a tool in front of you and you want to save a life, would you use it? Would you use that tool to save a life? Well, I'll tell you right now, there is really not enough uh, frameworks, regulatory frameworks, and even best practices that are recognized at the policy level that actually bring up this, this issue and allow for a safe and secure data sharing and use of by public, by, by public sector. And the, Fourth comment is also the industry. Industry is the key player here. But we should not forget that also that we need to think about the small businesses and, we, and only regulations around the world and the best practices are oriented at the big businesses. So we really need to think about the capacity, okay? The capacity of the small businesses, the capacity of the small communities and, um, and bring that into, the pers into perspective. Fifth point is capacity itself. African economies right now have, many of them already have data protection laws. Many of them already have um, initiated um, projects to establish data protection laws. Many already are undertaking efforts to actually have AI frameworks, AI governance frameworks. But the question, uh, but the question here is the capacity. Once you have these laws, once you have these frameworks, the next step is the implementation. And so I think, and I encourage us to also think about the capacity that needs to be built within these local communities to actually implement these laws. Which brings me to my final and sixth point, is that youth and education are the cru and crucial components, the key components to bring this over. And there, is, and there, will, there will be needs for resources, there will be need for cooperation uh, to make sure that the experts that are in these countries understand these laws, bring them to the industry, bring them to the NGOs and the civil society, as well as to the government. It relates to all sectors, so this cross sector, there is a huge lack of capacity and there is not enough of education and digital literacy brought up about these technologies, these new technologies, at, the, at very, very early stages of education. Um, so I'll close here and, um, and welcome any more questions or comments, thank you. And hopefully you. answers that I, and to the questions I raised. <laughs> thank you. Um, maybe we can take another round of two questions, please keep them brief and then we can have two brief responses from our panelists. I know there was a question behind me, and there's um, Sir over there. Uh, my name is Mohamed El Bikri from Morocco, Data Protection Authority. Uh, I will be brief. So I read that the training data set will be open for crowdsourcing. Uh, I wonder how do you support local communities to feed, to feed the training data set? Thank you. Okay. My name is Jimson Olufiye, uh, Nigeria. I run uh, an IT firm, Contemporary Consulting. Well, we do know that uh, there has been concern with regard to how far AI can go, either for good or for evil. So the question is, uh, are we incorporating accountability by design, even into this project, accountability by design, that we, it must serve our purpose. It must be accountable to us, because it has the possibility of getting out of hands down the line. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to respond to the last question of how far can AI, AI go? Um, and I give you a very concrete example. So at Viamo, we are experimenting with what we call internally, and forgive me for that, the Netflix approach. So recommendation engines for smallholder farmers or very rural populations. Now, the big issue is, and we all know, um, that mobile phone numbers are not unique identifiers. That's something regulators don't want to hear because everyone has to sign up when they buy a SIM card, but that's the truth. You go into any rural area and you can buy a mobile phone with a SIM card that's already unlocked and registered to someone. That makes it extremely difficult, in addition to phone sharing, to develop recommendation engines for rural populations all around the world. And, um, one key technology that can solve that is voice biometrics. 
So voice biometrics, a voice print is like your fingerprint, but through your voice. It's already used by commercial banks in the global north, like in Canada. It's super secure. The technology is really not the problem. Um, but it's only super secure if you have the security in place. And security here, and I want to be frank, from a private sector perspective, security is data security in, let's say, our basement. But it's also about the ethical security of the data through the regulation in those countries. And we operate in quite a number of, I'd say, high-risk countries where I'm not so sure if we would want to have that voice data linked or that voice print linked to a mobile phone number to get into the hands of, uh, of various actors in that country with vested interests. And that's a critical question because AI can go really far but do we want to take it that far? So it's, it's rather the, the question of count, accountability by design is also where do we put in the stopgap? And I'm not the one who's saying let's, let, let's, let's curtail the, the AI, but maybe we have to be smart and also use AI technologies to enforce that data security. And we had a few discussions on that here already um, in a few sessions. Um, and just quickly, because we were speaking about industry as the big player and uh, economic value of data, I, I would just, I, I'm going to be brief on that one. Um, when I was young and I needed the money, I studied economics. And um, so you always have uh, supply and demand. And I think there's an oversupply of that data and not a lot of demand, and specifically not a lot of demand from the private sector. And it's very true, we have to educate people, we have to work with local companies um, and local entrepreneurs to help them to get that. But the biggest demand for the data that we see for now is from the government space or from political actors. And when we speak about the economic value, we also need to speak about the political economic value of the data. And I, I, we, from a private sector perspective, at least from our, from our point of view, we need regulation and we need work done by UN Global Pulse and others to make sure that the data protection regulation in those countries not only protects the data, but also protects the data from political actors and vested uh, interests. Okay, any further comments? Um, I think there was a question about um, crowdsourcing. Is it, uh, if it's about data collection, um, I mean, if you go to the Common Voice platform, it's accessible uh, anywhere, and I'd encourage you to put in, to, um, put in uh, Moroccan languages as well. Um, and the way we're doing it to, to engage the community is we're building around the, communi uh, the education community, so specifically around universities and high schools. Uh, we have a program called the Commoners, which is students engaged in, in, in data commons, and, and they're sensibilizing other students to, to engage in building this uh, common infrastructure, and as well as to take advantage of it and build solutions for, for um, local problems uh, that would be around, yes. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us and engaging in this discussion on the future of artificial intelligence and sustainable development. Some key considerations that were highlighted today, how, we, how can we use AI to serve and support development primarily, focusing on equity, access, and partnership, but also accountability, as we've heard from our audience. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the um, Fair Forward Initiative, I think there are two representatives here. There's Balthus and Leah, if you could stand up. Real quick, so people know who you are. <laughs> Perfect. So if you have questions, comments, and would like to get engaged, please feel free to look for these two representatives after the panel and, and engage in the conversation. Um, I'd like to thank again the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and the UN Global Pulse for hosting us in our discussion today. And we look forward to continuing these discussions further. Thank you again. Enjoy your day. Um, and please give everyone a round of applause. Thank you. It is my understanding that there's a session after this, so if we could exit quickly and have our conversations in the foyer. Thank you.
one in there? <laughs>
It doesn't mean that those are the only five areas that interest us. It doesn't mean that those are the five areas that will be the only ones that we ever talk about. But it meant that at that point, when we started the project, uh, those were the primary areas. And just to give you the five examples, because it's way too small up there. First one was education. The second one was around health and well-being. The uh, third one was about the future of work. fourth one was about uh, privacy and safety. And the fifth one was about creativity and entertainment. Just two days ago, you might have seen this one already. Uh, my um, colleague, uh, Berkman Klein Executive Director Urs Gasso, who is here with us today, also uh, wrote his piece in Wire magazine that also is based on, on some of the findings and uh, observations that were covered in the report, basically making a case uh, for how we should young include young people more in this debate uh, from beginning to implementation. So, the first area that um, we looked at in the report, again, is privacy and, and safety. And just to give you an example that also other colleagues will then later talk more about, um, we looked, for instance, uh, at the educational context and issues around privacy there. And for instance, one example came up uh, from Asia where we, we saw as an example that, for instance, several schools uh, were incorporating sensors like these, so devices like this that should capture young people's attention while in school uh, and kind of through uh, an analysis in the back end decide if young people are uh, awake and paying attention and otherwise help them increase uh, their learning while at school, also giving teachers real-time uh, updates and parents updates in 10-minute intervals. And so examples like this in the report highlight, for instance, questions, what is young people's autonomy around these new technologies and will they have a certain say when it uh, comes to these technologies around uh, especially privacy, but other areas as well. So will they have a say about the data that is being collected? Will they have a say in what's happening to that data? Again, this just is a quick example. Many more questions are in the report in this section. Another area that is covered in the report is looking at uh, health and uh, well-being. And to give you there an example of, of what came up as we were doing the research, uh, for instance, um, we were looking at uh, natural language processing and how it can be used, for instance, to detect uh, if young people are not well or are struggling or are in distress. I think that might be something uh, Karuna will also mention. Uh, so I see, to a certain extent, a ton of potential in this area. Some of the questions that came up is, for instance, will uh, AI systems like this, will they potentially, for instance, be able to reduce stigma around certain health issues because a, a broader range of young people uh, will have access to these technologies and also uh, the adult soci society uh, may come in contact uh, with these. But then kind of on the other side, on the flip side, the question is, uh, will these AI-based systems, will they be um, as culturally sensitive, may, maybe let's call it like that, to how young people ex express, for instance, emotional distress? Uh, I'm, I'm, some of my work is based in the United States, where young people may be more openly also say if they feel um, if they don't feel good, while work I do, for instance, in Latin, Latin America, there it's much more difficult to say uh, and to speak up if you have uh, emotional uh, struggles. And so will those systems actually be aware and sensitive to that? Uh, within the education, there are countless examples. The first one that I mentioned is one of them, but the question is truly, uh, who will actually have access to these technologies, you name it, from personalized curricula to uh, AI uh, tutors to uh, you name it, who will actually 
get those? Uh, will it be, as in many other cases, wealthy, privileged young people, or will it be everyone? And will it actually improve the learning and the education, or will it not? And what are we going to do about all the educators that basically also need to be trained and re-educated about these technologies and often fear uh, or confront these technologies with a lot of fear and anxieties uh, and the big unknown um, is there. Um, and then when we looked, for instance, uh, uh, at work, just again, because I don't want to spend too much time, uh, you, you see in the media examples like this, uh, bringing up a lot of fear and also uh, negative visions about the future, about uh, automation and how it might uh, remove many uh, many job opportunities, and for us the question was, for instance, uh, all these headlines and reports and this relatively uh, uncertainty, or maybe not call it uncertainty, but the reports are really going from uh, one statement, lot, lots of jobs that won't exist and no longer be there when you uh, finish your studies, to it's not that bad and there, it's, it's not that extreme. Uh, but still, in the media, the discussions are making young people to a certain extent nervous about the future and whether their careers and pathways. And so I think more work needs to be done in this field to better understand it. Uh, same, again, that's also connected to the WIRE article. How can we increase also young people's interest, again, into entering career paths that will then hopefully shape uh, these new uh, technologies. Across all topics, I think the biggest theme that we, uh, that we are concerned about uh, at Youth and Media is the question of inclusion, uh, inclusion of young people, but inclusion of different perspectives, uh, thinking about inequalities and inequities, and will these new technologies be able to reduce some of these or actually make uh, the gaps even bigger? Um, and I'm excited that Steve particularly is also going to talk about the work we're now um, doing together around uh, uh, AI principles, guidelines, going from very theoretical things to more practical things, uh, helping uh, institutions, organizations, governments to think through this process and how can you actually um, do work in this space, being more mindful also of young people and their rights. So again, I, I personally have a, a ton of questions. I'm excited about your inputs and your questions and hope we can debate uh, that either here today or then online or uh, in different parts of the world. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much, Sandra. So, uh, as you mentioned now, we are going to move on to uh, hearing from Steve Wozlow, who is the Digital Policy Specialist in UNICEF and my colleague. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about the initiative that we have just started uh, in collaboration with Berkman Klein um, uh, Center, with Government on Finland, uh, World Economic Forum, IEEE, and five rights organization and a number of other uh, organizations and experts that uh, for the first time gathered in June this year to talk about how we can develop a set of policy guidance for industry and for the governments around children's issues and artificial intelligence and how to turn these principles into practice. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Jasmina. Um, okay. Are the slides coming up? Okay, voila, thank you. So um, I was this week in Helsinki. We ran the first workshop into developing this, these policy guidance, um, these policy guidelines. And I wanted to just share with you two slides that my colleague presented, because they were quite good at making the idea of AI, an abstract idea, quite concrete. So we, we're going to meet two people. This is Emma. Um, Emma is born today. So she will be 11 years old in 2030. Um, and let's just think about the kind of future that we want for Emma, and then we'll look at Emma's sister. Uh, and this is just, it's a, it's a, it's a mental exercise, but, but uh, bear, bear with us. So Emma was born with a very rare cancer, uh, but thanks to AI-powered technology, it was diagnosed early enough um, for life-saving treatment, and she can have a normal life. 
So she loves school, she loves learning, uh, but she happens to live in a very remote part of Finland. So let's use the Finland example. Um, but thanks to, again, AI-powered technologies and technology in general, she can um, have access to virtual tu tutors and have access to all the content and support that she needs. Um, she is also living in a world where greenhouse gases have been reduced somewhat. I mean, this is a very wonderful utopia, but it's good to, to aim high. And that was thanks to machine learning and, again, AI-based systems to help us use energy more, more efficiently. Her dream is to run a tech company. Um, she loves technology. She's been helped by technology. And so she, she has that opportunity. Um, she's basically living in a world where, um, where all the people have access to virtual content and opportunities. Right now, we know that only half the world actually has, has access and, and is online. Um, so she's online the whole time, but she feels empowered, not kind of dominated by her online life. She's aware when a machine makes a decision over her life and when it's a person. And she knows that regardless, there's always somebody that she can talk to about decisions um, or there's some sort of route of accountability. So no one uses her data unless she constant, consciously shares it. And she feels that she trusts technology. So this is, the, this is Emma. Okay. Um, she's born today. So this is Emma's sister. Um, she's, oh, sorry, wrong side. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. This is Emma's older sister. She's 15 years old today. Um, so she also loves technology in Finland. I, of course, realize that not the whole world is like Finland, but in Finland, 97% um, of kids between 9 and 17 have a smartphone. Um, and they spend most of their time online. Um, we know that one third of all internet users are children, and Emma's sister is, is, is one of them. So she's already using AI systems um, today through her Facebook uh, newsfeed, through her Instagram face filters that uses facial recognition, um, and through, um, uh, through Alexa. And so she uses Alexa a lot, um, and she asks Alexa questions that perhaps she doesn't ask of, of her parents. She doesn't know which technologies are using AI and, and why. Um, she doesn't feel like she has control over her data. Um, her data is kind of stored and sold and used in the same way that, that adults' data is used because she's using the same systems that, that her, her parents and her, her peers use. Um, she has friends who go to the schools, friends abroad that um, Sandra showed a picture of where there are cameras in the schools, not just for security, which is of course a, a noble kind of point, but also for to measure concentration levels um, and, and kind of and learning levels. So she doesn't feel like she has any special protections in, this, in, in her current situation. Um, and so these are the two personalities we, we're looking at. Um, this is where we are today, and this is where we, we would like to be in 2030. And that's kind of the, an inspiration for the policy guidance, to think about what kind of changes do we need to make today to create um, these two different spaces. So we know that we need to focus more on, on children. As Yasmina said, this is the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, children are the most vulnerable part of the population, but of course that's not their only quality. They also have the most potential. Um, and so we have the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights but on top of that, we also had the Convention on the Rights of the Child, because children have special needs and special requirements. Um, and that kind of thinking of special protections needs to be carried over into the, the digital world, and I know that's what many, many of us are working on here. So these are the four main types of rights that we, that we have in the, in the Convention. Um, I won't go into those now, but the good thing is we don't have to start at the beginning. There's a lot of great work being done. Um, here are some examples from, from UNICEF. There are many being done um, to protect children and to think about those, those special provisions for children. Designing for child rights is one. Um, this is a report that Sandra um, also had up. It's done by Berkeley University and it was commissioned by UNICEF. And it looks really at how children use AI systems and, and how that impacts on, on rights. And it has some great recommendations at the end. 
um, for corporations, for educators, for parents. The one that caught our eye was for, for governments um, about integrating child rights into national plans. And so we, we wanted to better understand what national plans currently say about children and, and child rights or what they don't say. Um, so this is a report that was produced about a year ago by CIFAR, which is a Canadian research institute, um, looking at countries that either have AI strategies or are developing those. And they divided the, in their analysis, um, they created these eight kind of policy buckets. Um, and you can just see very quickly that a lot of the attention goes onto research and industrial strategy and, and the next kind of cohort of AI talent versus um, inclusion or using AI you know, for, for good in, in government. So we, we continued this research and we wanted to look at these same documents but from a child lens perspective. Um, and so these are the four main buckets that we chose. What, what, do, what do strategies say about cultivating children as a future workforce so that AI pipeline? Preparing children to live in a changing world, so that's teaching children to be conscious users of technology. Um, and about the ethics and design principles. Protecting child's data, privacy rights, and then better quality of services. So that could be in education or in, or in health. Um, and we found a fairly light touch. I mean, that's, if, if the colors were dark, there'd be a significant amount of attention paid to those topics. So you see it's, it's a fairly light touch for, for, for children. Um, we looked at 19 ethics principles. Um, again, I mean, this is maybe not surprising, but um, here, most of the focus is on protecting children's data and privacy, which is, which is great, but perhaps not so strong in, in the other areas. And so really just, it was confirming what's, what Sandra had found and what many others have found, that um, there isn't much attention given to AI in children, but we do believe that there needs to be. Um, and so the policy guidelines want to really just focus on that niche of where does, how does AI systems, how do, how do they impact children? and how do we need to think as, as technology providers, as governments, as the UN, as, um, as civil society, think about what kind of provisions and protections and empowerments we need to, to put in place. Um, so our plan is to develop this guidance and to pilot this guidance over two years. Um, we will host workshops, uh, like the one I just held in, we just held in Helsinki two days ago. Um, there are ones coming up in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America. Um, and we'll launch the guidance at a high-level forum next June in Helsinki. Um, so please give us input into the guidance. We want to consult as widely as possible. We're working with a, a number of partners who are advising us at this stage. Uh, Berkman Klein Center, um, the Five Rights Foundation, World Economic Forum, IEEE. So this is our kind of advisory board, but we, we really want to get as many inputs as possible. And so I'll leave you with this. These are some draft principles. Um, these are not new principles. You will recognize them if you're familiar with the AI principle space at all. And I keep hearing at conferences that there are now over 200 different AI principles and ethics, which is great. And luckily, they're all starting to look the same like this. Uh, these, are the, these are the kind of the, the headline, transparency, accountability, protection. What we've tried to do here is to think of the human adult, which is usually the person that one thinks of, and think of uh, the, the human child. And, and what does that mean for transparency or explainability or inclusion um, when it's a child? So please join us on this journey. Come chat to me afterwards. Um, and let's see how we can get as many inputs as possible into making this, this kind of work as, as kind of comprehensive as possible. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. And hopefully uh, next year, this time at the next IGF, we will already have uh, the, the first part of our journey completed with this uh, policy guidance uh, being drafted. And, and we just want to say we discussed uh, earlier before this session with our colleagues from Berkman Klein that we want to make them as practical and pragmatic as possible with as many examples of how do you actually apply these principles in practice and in different sectors and in different um, areas of a child, child's life and well-being. Now um, I'm turning over to our commentators who are going to give us a, a 
five-minute uh, comment on what they've heard, but also tell us a little bit more about their, their work and their involvement. Um, so the first person is Armando Gio, who is, this used to be um, advisory to the Ministry of ICT in uh, Colombia. Well, thank you, Jasmina. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to the Burma Client Center also and the IGF for organizing this panel and giving me the opportunity to show you a little bit more about the experience in Colombia. I had the opportunity to advise the Colombian government in the design of its AI strategy. This strategy is the first AI strategy in South America. It's the Compass 3975, as we call the documents that are approved by the president and its cabinet. And this is, I think, uh, a very good example of how to, to try to, um, yeah, put into practice the principles and the ideas that had been shown in, in by, by the academia and by organizations as the UNICEF. So I, I have to say that the Youth and Artificial Intelligence Where We Stand report of the Burma Klein Center was very influential for us because it set some specific points that we consider were very important in order to, to design this kind of a strategy. So the future of work, that was essential. Education, we knew that a, a, a AI plan, AI strategy for a country without a clear talent and an education strategy, well, it was not going to be uh, very effective uh, and that is also on the report and I think it's a, a matter to, to consider. And at the same time, we have this very big um, concern on how to develop and involve children into these more creative industries and creativity. We believe that creativity, as it is said in the, in the report, is very important uh, for this new stage of the fourth industrial revolution. And I think one of the most interesting things about the report is that it says, this quote that I have here in the presentation is that like, obstacles to the adoption of AI power technologies in under-resourced schools and underrepresented homes could exacerbate existing gaps within the youth population with respect to access to AI systems and the skills to utilize them. And that's what, one of the biggest concerns we have in Colombia as a developing country, of course, that we didn't have enough resources to provide to the students, to our schools, and that we have to do something because AI, of course, is going to be influential in the world, and we want Colombia and Colombians to have a safe and, and a prosper, a prosperity in the future. So we had to do something about that. And that's why the main guidance of this strategy uh, that also answer to many of the topics and issues that were in that report, uh, I can describe mainly four points on the strategy now that Colombia is implementing that are essential. So we have, first of all, developing skills and implementing AI in schools. So the first thing is that we believe that it's very difficult to say, like, this is the set of skills that is required in order to deal with AI. AI is changing all the time. So we have to be open to this experimentation stage. We have to be open to discover that this technology is changing, that teachers, the students have to evolve and have to adapt to all these technologies. And that's why uh, the strategy says, like, we have to promote like these kind of experiments in schools. And that's something challenging, that's something new, but that's something we believe was quite innovative for the Colombian education system. And we think that is a good example for Latin America. Like we have to consider a new approach to education and a new approach in which we still don't know the whole set of skills that is required. At the second time, we wanted to, as I said, to promote creativity through non-conventional learning environments. So the Ministry of Education was especially committed that there were non-conventional um, educational environments that were used and that were now implemented in, in, in Colombia, getting out of this traditional system and trying to promote different models and methodologies, co-creation, letting children be more involved in the, in the construction of these curriculums. So that was one of the biggest uh, steps that we have in that uh, strategy. Then we have another point that is to identify and support children with high performance capability 
And this is going to be a very important task. We believe that uh, high performance uh, students, especially on some specific Thick topics such as uh, yeah, basic sciences, math, they are going to be very relevant to design and develop AI and to help Colombia and the Latin American countries to develop their own AI systems. But the thing is that we need to identify as soon as possible these children, but also to be careful not to discriminate other uh, children that are not having these perhaps high performance. And how are we going to answer to the expectations of those that have a high performance and those that are, are not have, having one? And that's also related with this last fourth point and is the future of work. What is going to happen with these children that perhaps, or uh, this young population that consider that they don't have all the skills required in order to uh, be productive in, 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 in the future. And that's why we believe that in, and in the strategy there is a, a, a specific action of cooperation and collaboration with the private sector. We want to understand from the private sector which are those skills required, where are children uh, going to, like skills that we'll need to, to develop in order to become productive. And we can only know that if the private sector is also telling us which are those skills. So we believe that that was very uh, important in, in this strategy. And that's why we also consider that we are still learning. We don't have all the answers, but this is a, the first uh, step in order to start developing those skills and for children in Colombia to start getting the proper education and the proper knowledge in order to face the fourth industrial revolution and to deal with AI systems. So as I said, this is the, uh, the COMPASS document uh, that, the, um, or that is our digital transformation strategy and artificial intelligence strategy that as in the illustration, you can see the idea is to reduce inequalities, gaps, and to try that all children in Colombia can benefit from AI, not just some with uh, the resources in order to interact with this technology, but we want children in Colombia, and because of children's rights, and we believe in the Convention on Children's Rights, that they can have access to the best possible education and to the skills that are really going to help them in the future. So that's mainly the, the strategy, and that's what Colombia is now working on, and the Colombian government is working now on the, now on the implementation of this uh, plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, great to hear about the Colombia example. And now I'm turning to uh, Sabelo Mughlambi. Did I pronounce it properly? Yes. You are a fellow from Berkman Klein Center. Um, Mike, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to share with you um, an African perspective uh, on how we, uh, we expect this technology will affect our livelihoods. And I'm thankful for um, the opportunity to do some of this research at the Berkman Klein Center and to work with some colleagues here as well. So it's a pleasure to be here. When we're looking at the African continent, almost half of the population is under 18. That's a significant amount. And 70% of the population is under 30. And in 2026, Sub-Saharan Africa will have the greatest amount of, 18, of children under 18 in anywhere in the world. In addition to this, we're facing extreme challenges. Climate change has devastated the livelihood of the continent, the economies, and the well-being and the security of the children. As we're looking at the informal employment which we see in the continent, almost half of the population is working in vulnerable employment. And so this makes us wonder, what is the future of work in the continent? Will the children, will the youth have jobs within the economy, within the continents, or will we see this a continuation of young Africans taking dangerous routes to go to Europe, to go to North America, to try to find better livelihoods. And so this is of, of great concern and um, something that we have to look into. 
Other disparities, of course, exist within healthcare, within education, uh, financial and digital inclusion. And within these disparities, we see gender inequality. There's a disparity between um, uh, young girls and women in how they access and use the internet, how they use mobile devices, and how they use technology. The use of AI has the potential to either worsen these disparities or to try to resolve them. And to do so, to fully realize the potential and the benefits of AI, we must seek the potential of AI while keeping in mind the potential harms of algorithmic technology and also the underlying power asymmetries that exist within the continent. In the spirit of Ubuntu, which is the philosophy that we uphold in the African continent, we must seek this potential with meaningful inclusion and dialogue of children. I was very excited to hear some of the speakers talking about you know, dialogue, inclusion, openness, and treating the youth as experts who can you know, influence how we build AI technology. So that's very um, heartening. It, uh, and this includes collaboration. It includes cooperation, openness, and we must empower children to become successful members of the community. In the African continent and elsewhere, it is often said it takes a village to raise a child. We are that village. We have a responsibility to the youth, a responsibility to their success, and a responsibility to create a more equal society, including in how we respond to the climate crisis, in the creation and also in the creation of safer internet platforms. So I'm excited to hear uh, what we will say about that. Um, excuse me. We have a responsibility to the youth and to ensure that the future generations have a society and environment where they can grow and fully realize their potential and human dignity um, as being humans. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very, and th these are very inspirational words, and uh, particularly for us in UNICEF. And one thing I would really like to emphasize here is that in this process of developing of this policy guidance, we are working closely with Berkman Klein Center on carrying out a series of consultation with young people and with children, because we see them not only as those who can benefit from AI, but also as co-creators and a very important stakeholder group in these discussions. So, uh, as I said, next time we'll be IGF, we'll also have have some of these uh, young people with us, but maybe we'll show you a short video, a minute, one minute afterwards if Steve finds it, following our next commentator and a speaker, uh, Karuna Nain, who is a global safety policy lead with Facebook. Thank you, Jasmina, and thank you so much, Sandra, Stephen, for um, having me here. So I wanted to use my five minutes to talk about two specific examples of how we use AI on Facebook and on our platforms to A, keep children safe, but also to make sure that we are giving people an appropriate or a customized experience on our services. So let me start with the example on safety. Uh, many of you in this room will know of our work in this space. Uh, keeping children safe is something that we consider one of our foremost responsibilities. And we, sorry, I'll get closer to the mic. Okay, let me try. So we've been using um, photo matching technologies for many years to detect previously reported images that are uploaded onto our platforms to make sure that we take them down at the time of upload and file a report with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Last October, we announced that we are now able to use the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence in two additional ways to keep children safe. First, we are able to use the power of AI and machine learning to detect previously unreported images of child nudity. So, so far, we were only able to detect content that had already been reported. This is a huge step forward because now we can detect content that hasn't been reported, you know, and is child nudity. At Facebook, we actually have more restrictive community standards around child nudity. So even if that image has been shared in, you know, because a parent or a grandparent thinks that their child is cute, we would tend to err on the side of caution and take down that image just because we know we're a social network and there is um, scope for other people to use that image in ways that it wasn't intended. 
but we are, um, and if the image is exploitative, it's being shared in an exploitative context, we would then file a report with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as is required of us. The second use of AI and machine learning in this space is to detect accounts that are engaging in potentially inappropriate contacts with minors. And as you can imagine, if we do find these accounts, the machine learning uh, flags these accounts, it is sent to a human reviewer to check and investigate what is going on. And if we find that there is something going on which is exploitative in nature, again, we would file a report with the National Center for Mis Missing and Exploited Children. So this is one example of how we are able to use AI and machine learning to keep Facebook safer and keep the internet safer as well. The second example I want to share is more around uh, customization or giving people a you know, experience that is pleasant on Facebook, making sure that they can personalize Facebook. For those of you who use Facebook, when you come onto our platform, you usually go to your news feed. Your news feed is the space where you see your posts, photographs, links that your friends, your family have shared, pages that you followed on Facebook, news accounts that you've chosen to follow. The newsfeed is really based on signals that you've been giving us. We use three signals to help us prioritize what content we should be showing you in your newsfeed. Number one, who posted it? Are, they, are these people you tend to you know, engage more with on our platform? Number two, the type of content. Is it a photo? Is it a video? Is it a link? Is it just an ordinary post? Maybe I'm living in India where uh, you know, internet bandwidth is very low in that neighborhood which I'm in. So Facebook doesn't want to try and show you a video which would be a really terrible experience. It would be buffering, it wouldn't be great. So that's the second indicator that we want to try and use. And third is your interactions with similar posts. So if you've been engaging more with those kinds of posts, we want to show you similar content because you've given us a clear indicator that's the type of content you want to see. We've been uh, focusing on two specific things here. One, giving people more control. So not only do, can you customize these preferences by going into your preferences uh, menu on Facebook, you can actually do it at the point of every post. Right next to each and every post, you can click on the drop-down menu and tell Facebook that you don't want to see similar content going forward. Or you want to check, why am I even seeing this? Why is Facebook showing me this? We want to give you more controls and more transparency around that. The second thing we've been focusing on in terms of transparency is anytime we make a big change in our news feed ranking, we put out a newsroom post and we make sure that we are being transparent around it. So many of you may remember at the start of the year, we made a huge step forward where we said we are going to downrank clickbait, downrank you know, content which you had clearly told us is not high quality content you don't want to see us. And we want to make sure that people know when we are making these steps forward and put out transparent information about those. So we've been focusing both on giving people controls, but also being more transparent around how these technologies really work so that you have granular level controls and can really customize these experiences for yourself. So I'm hoping with these two examples, it really frames the conversation for a practical you know, uh, thought around what these policies should be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karuna, for sharing this. And I know that because of the first example you gave us, uh, the, the reporting of child abuse images uh, uh, have increased dramatically, uh, and it helped uh, uh, identify children who were victimized, but also to uh, catch the perpetrators with the law enforcement services. I, do we have a video? So we have a, a, a short one-minute video where you will see a, a youth activist, uh, actually, who attended our workshop in June, uh, talking about AI and children, and then we'll open uh, this for discussion. is a new and promising technology that's going to eventually affect all of us and everyone should have a say in it. AI is being developed by adults. We need to make sure that these adults think about what children would need while developing it.
Okay, that's it, and we even have a hashtag. <laughs> So if you're tweeting about this session, please uh, use this hashtag and uh, uh, get in touch with us. But now uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers uh, and any comments. Please introduce yourselves. Um, and uh, yes, so we have somebody over there. Hi, my name is Amitabh. I work in uh, India on online safety with an organization called Social Media Matters. Um, thank you for the amazing um, presentations. Something which was there in the first slide is pretty much where my question is, uh, how does the panel see the role of parents in this extremely important right of children as uh, AI still remains uh, a very magical term for most of the parents out there? And when it comes to children, uh, especially in India, children rights pretty much start at home and parents play a very important role in it. Uh, thank you. Shall we take a couple more questions if we have and then uh, turn back to the panel? Thank you, um, all very interesting. So I work for ECPA International. My name is Marie-Laure Lemineur and, and our mission is to tackle the sexual exploitation of children. So basically we're looking at harm online um, to explain to you why I'm gonna ask the questions I'm gonna ask. Um, so we do acknowledge that there are tools, AI, based tools that are being developed, and this is, of course, to be welcomed, and such as the ones you were mentioning, Karuna, and we look forward to having more solutions to be able to detect and take down materials, etc., and anticipate harm. But there are broader, gov yeah, in parallel to that, I think we also should look at broader governance issues related to those tools, and, and uh, basically what we're doing here, we, we're moving towards a system where we are delegating human decision-making to algorithms. And when it comes to children, um, I think this deserves um, that to have a closer look at what are the implications for children. And I believe that's what we all do doing collectively. Um, there is a particular topic that is worrying me, which is data bias. Specifically, you know, I mean, data is at the heart of AI, AI systems. And uh, when we think of, of the solutions and the type of harm that is done to children and the data that is available at country level and in databases, for example, images, uh, and I think of the database of Interpol of images and predominantly portraying victims with ethnic um, um, uh, profile that is predominantly white, same for offenders coming from the Western world, uh, because, because of different factors, because those who are feeding this database uh, pre uh, are predominantly from the Western world. So if, for example, Interpol would you know, develop an AI tool, then the data that would feed, feed this, this tool would be influenced by um, um, the, 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 what is portrayed on the images. So what would be the implication? Perhaps, you know, then they wouldn't be able to detect other, you know, children who are from other regions um, and offenders. So this is a very practical example, and this is one of my worry. And the other one, and the last one, sorry, to, um, to finish, is that I'm observing a trend where companies are, each one of them, like um, we have Google, we have Facebook, etc., developing tools, which is very good. But I, I'm sensing that this is also moving us towards a model where we are, there is a fragmentation of, of the protection of children. And in a way, I'm just wondering whether we should create a pool of open sourced tools uh, that we would, you know, agree, all of us agree that this is for common good and instead of having each company using those tools, developing it, then we could, you know, share it and, and make it available to, in other regions for other companies. Thank you. Thank you so much for these suggestions and, and, and comments. Uh, is there any other uh, question? Oh, there are two people at the back, and then we'll turn to the panelists. Yes. Oh, you don't have a mic. Thank you. My name is Claire Weppel. I'm from IEEE. Uh, my question would be for Facebook. Um, if particularly you make a distinction between users, of a user being a child, if you are um, recognizing a child being a child, and if you make any distinction in the way you are handling the data of the children, and uh, lastly, if there is a way 
once that child uh, gets adult to uh, you know to get uh, to set it to zero, for instance, um, so that let's say a profile that is being set up as a child or a teenager is not um, you know perpetuated uh, once uh, that child becomes an adult. Thank you, uh, and Anjan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anjan Bose uh, from UNICEF. Um, I want to react um, to Marie Laure's point and I kind of build on that. Um, my initial question to Karuna was when you mentioned about um, detection using AI of uh, not known images, right? And obviously the algorithms uh, will be trained enough with data sets to understand that it's a child uh, who's, uh, you know, maybe the nudity uh, plays a significant role. Uh, part in the decision making. Uh, and as Marilla pointed out, uh, that um, there would be human intervention required, and I'm sure that's the current policy, to not only rely on, on AI. But my uh, response to uh, Marilla's second bit is, um, I think I kind of uh, differ uh, slightly in, in opinion in terms of how Interpol is managing that database, because it's already, I don't think, uh, the, the purpose of the AI on the existing ICSI database would be to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, find new images uh, because they are not using AI to detect um, similar, uh, you know, images out there. Um, so I, I am, I'm not completely, you know, sure how that uh, conflict would come in, in terms of the existing database with known images. But I completely agree with you that uh, when it comes to uh, scat you know, scouting the web for detection of uh, unknown images, uh, and if that's something that um, Interpol or other agencies would be wanting to implement going forward, we need to be cautionary in terms of using AI alone. Thank you. Thank you, Anjan. So a lot of questions for Facebook, but uh, uh, let's turn first to um uh, uh, Steve uh, uh, and uh, Sandra with a question about parents and, and also if you want to add uh, a little bit about uh, these other issues that we discussed around data and uh, tools for detecting uh, protection. What are your views? And then... Uh... I mean, I, I find the question very valid and it's an important question. I do think we have to look at the whole ecosystem. It can't just be the focus just on youth, but youth at the center and then looking what, what are kind of the uh, humans and support structures around that young individual, where obviously parents are key, but also educators are key uh, and broader society. And I, I agree with you that in, in some cultures, Parents have to be involved and have to be there probably from the beginning, but in other cultures it might be other adults who are in charge uh, of raising um, the child or this young person. And I, I must say, for instance, uh, at Youth and Media we also do uh, significant work in communities that it's, it's more complex. So you may have different adults that are distributing uh, by whom you're raised, so I sh uh, I'm sometimes cautious to overemphasize the role of parents because around the world the structures are very different and the situations are very different. And we, if we overemphasize that, we may we we may again disadvantage those who are already most disadvantaged to a certain extent. So, uh, but I think the qu the question is very valid and adults around youth are extremely important. Um, just very quickly, I'll just build on what, on what Sandra said. Um, that the, the ecosystem, there's a human ecosystem, but there's also the technology ecosystem um, and the economic ecosystem. And so, you, you know, your, your point about the data not being representative of all children in the world or of all people is, is, is very valid. And that, that comes down to the access the digital divide, in a sense, and the, the, the different levels of access, the different levels of cost. Um, and so that data doesn't exist. And our colleagues in New York and the innovation team, they are, are trying to address this because they need a lot of that data for, for the actual AI systems to improve services for children. And so looking at 
beginning to look at kind of data commons or data pools where the data is safely and um, safely treated, but begin to address that. And just, the, just quickly, your point about delegating responsibility to, to algorithms, that's a really good point. Um, and hopefully, you know, these principles of transparency and accountability are some buffer against that. I think Facebook does it very well, where you use the algorithm uh, for what it's good at, and then when you need the human, you, you bring in the human. Um, so hopefully, you know, hopefully we always keep the, those kind of safe measures or kind of protective measures in place to make sure that we don't just give over completely where we shouldn't. Mm, thank you. Now over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to build on what Stephen just said, because I think, you know, with the volume at which the internet is being used and content is being generated, there's a space for AI to even help in making sure that the human intervention happens at the appropriate time. So one of the ways we use AI, for instance, Sandra mentioned around, you know, things like suicide prevention, is within the reporting queues, there can be a lot of noise. Can we use the power of AI to determine if there is a certain post that is a more credible threat bring it to the top of the stack so that the human reviewer gets to it first and does not you know, get to it when it's too late. So I think there's a space for combining the power of machine learning and AI with the power of human intervention to get people support at the right um, and appropriate junctures. So I received questions around data bias, around delegating to tech, which we've just managed, around fragmentation of the protection of children. You know, how are we thinking about building that external ecosystem? Um, and finally, around data. So I'm going to try and get to each and every one of those. Let me start with the data question. So um, we, Facebook and Inst uh, you know, all of our platforms, we don't allow people below the ages of 13 to set up accounts on our platform. We do rely on stated age. But we have some uh, protection systems built in. So if someone comes and tries to set up an account, gives us an age which is below the age of 13, we'll give them a message saying that you know, they aren't eligible for our platform yet. They'll try and re-enter uh, you know, a different age to game around our system. Because we can you know, use cookies, we can let them know that actually we know that they've already tried and they aren't eligible to set up an account on our platform. So we try and you know, make sure that we are uh, getting people only above the age of 13, but we do rely on stated age. We uh, last, I think two years back, did a whole series of roundtables around the US to just hear from parents on what their needs around tech are. Like how do they see tech playing a role in their lives and fostering the parent-child relationship? Uh, because different parents have different needs. They're parents who work three jobs, two jobs. They use technology to stay connected with their kids. They're used, we wanted to really hear from them on what are they looking for. And we heard a lot of feedback from parents that they were lending their phones to their kids to speak to their grandparents. We heard from military families how they use, you know, uh, phones and messaging services to stay connected with their kids when they were sent out on duty. And so we launched something called Messenger Kids because we really wanted to make sure that we are building for parents. We've taken a very slow and measured approach to launching Messenger Kids because it is meant for younger children. Children below the ages of 13, we want to collect minimal data because that's what we are being very conscious of here. So the data for both Messenger and Kids and Facebook is actually stored very separately um, and it's kept apart. Uh, but the goal was really to make sure that we are responding to needs of families. We've just launched it in one or two countries since because each country that we launch in, we want to make sure that we are speaking to families, hearing from them on what their needs are and really catering to uh, you know, what that community wants from technology. And the reason I give you that example is because we do need to take a very different approach to data when we are building for people below the age of 13 versus when we are building from 13 to 18. And this is a constant conversation we are having around what is age appropriate, uh, you know, because children can be developmentally different as well. Great, so I'm going to jump to my next question because I think you asked some very valid questions around data bias, around, uh, you know, bringing an external ecosystem and making sure we are not fragmenting how we approach child protection. So in terms of data bias, most platforms, like at least I can speak for the ones that we operate at Facebook, are global. Four out of five people who use Facebook come from outside the US. The data that we have really reflects this diversity. The data that we use to train our artificial intelligence and machine learning systems also reflects this diversity of our user base. Uh, it is something that we are constantly being very conscious of because we will not be able to catch the volumes of content which we are proactively detecting if we aren't training it on diverse data sets. We also work with organizations 
organizations like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who in turn work with 100 countries around the world through their VPN system. So we need to have a global approach, as you very rightly said, because some of these crimes cross borders. Uh, you know, we do not want to recreate the wheel because the burden on us as platforms also becomes really high. If every country has a different system, we need to make sure our technology is complying with that. So we are constantly thinking about how we can build out that external ecosystem. One of my favorite programs at Facebook, and Merila, you're very familiar with it, is a child safety hackathon, where we bring together the tech community, nonprofits who work in this space, to think about what the next generation technology is. Facebook has been open sourcing some of the technology we use in-house. We recently open sourced the video hashing and photo hashing technology we use so that other companies, smaller organizations, nonprofits, don't need to create these technologies and can just leverage our work in this space. So I hope I answered all of those questions, I speed read through the last ones, but I'm around if you all have more questions after this as well. So we have one minute on data. I answer the data one first. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Karuna. Sorry for interrupting. Mm -hmm. We will have time. And I know, oh. Sorry, we will have, uh, hopefully you can talk to our panelists after this session, but I also want to give the floor uh, to Sabelo and Armando if they have some uh, last uh, comments, uh, starting with you. I wanted to emphasize uh, what the colleague said earlier. Uh, about the, the harms and the power structures, the symmetries in the Western influencing technology. Um, uh, what I would like to first start by talking about is uh, we now have the potential to fully track our youth since from, from birth till they live life using ever increasingly powerful technology. So what does that mean? Are we uh, eventually uh, turning them into commodifiable entities, agents, do all of this tracking from birth throughout the entire livelihoods. And um, uh, to reiterate your point, I think in order to create AI with the youth, we should in general level the playing field. Uh, most of the large internet platforms that dominate the internet usage, of course, Western, and this carries certain designs and how, uh, and certain ways of seeing the world. And AI technology in the global south must be localized, um, even open sourced, and um, we must consider the economic power symmetries that large platforms have when they go and they offer you know, free internet services. What does that do to the local creators who want to compete, who want to make their own platforms? It becomes a dangerous place to have a few actors dominate uh, the internet, uh, especially dominate the experience of um, most of the internet population. Thank you. Very, very good point and valid. Thank you. No, well, I think that uh, this panel has been very helpful in order to uh, also consider that uh, for the governments in Latin America, like the Colombian government, to consider the role of children in the design of these policies, in implementation. How are we going to listen to them? How are we going to create those spaces of interaction? I think that's something that definitely we have to consider in order to create also and to build also some more pro, uh, of, a, of a pragmatic approach to the principles and to children's rights, that that's something that definitely we need. And of course, this other issue that has been discussed about privacy is also very important for us. We are also concerned about it, but we think that it's very important that especially on children's privacy, there is a lot of evidence and we want policy-based evidence also there. So that's also important to have case studies that we have more information when we're thinking about the regulation or specific uh, yeah, measures from the government coming into the children's protection. So that's something that we are also very aware of and we're expecting to have all that evidence and data that will be very helpful. Thank you, everybody. So we've come to the end of our session, but this is really just the beginning of a journey, and I hope you stay in touch with us, provide your comments, inputs. You can talk to us after this. Steve was very cleverly not put his email there, so nobody can write to him. <laughs> so everybody will be writing to you, Sandra. Uh, but I, I also want to say, uh, I hope that the next IGF and, and, and other forums uh, like this one and congresses and conferences, when uh, we discuss AI, we also discuss uh, children because there are several panels here around uh, AI and this is the only one actually that addresses issues uh, related to children. We don't want to be only talking to like-minded people who come to our sessions, but we want to be part of uh, the, the opening panels and we want to have more children's voices included in the mainstream programs of IGF. And 
uh, I just want to say uh, this has also been a very gender balanced panel, if you include me, three women and three men, uh, which is also a novelty at IGF. Uh, thank you all for your participation today.
Ja, die größte Herausforderung für mich ist...
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to be starting in a couple of minutes. Um, we are not expecting uh, football-sized crowds uh, to this meeting. So if you could please come into the inner table, um, that would be great. Um, feeling slightly surveilled with the people behind me. Um, but if you could come forward, um, there are materials um, at the desk, um, and we'll be uh, uh, starting in just uh, two minutes. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much um, for coming to this session, um, this open forum of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, my name is Charles Bradley and I work at the support unit of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here um, to discuss a number of the key sort of priorities and focus areas of the FOC um, uh, within under the Ghana uh, chairmanship. Um, just as a little introduction, the Freedom Online Coalition is a network of 31 uh, member states who work collaboratively to promote and protect human rights online. Um, it was founded back in 2011 um, under the leadership of the US and Dutch um, as a way of coordinating efforts uh, within like-minded governments to ensure that uh, the, principles, um, of human, the principle of human rights offline apply online. And uh, since that date, has worked in a number of different ways to ensure that um, these rights are protected um, and that there is a strong uh, coordinate, coordinated effort between like-minded governments in multilateral forums and on in um, key spaces where norms are shaped. Um, in front of you, there are a couple of materials um, uh, which may be quite useful um, if you're unfamiliar with um, some of the detail of the FOC. Um, the first is the A4 document, which is the Programme of Action for 2019-2020, um, which really outlines the key priority areas um, for the FOC under the Ghanaian chairmanship. Um, and we're very lucky to um, uh, have um, uh, Dr. Albert from uh, Ghana today to talk about uh, the Ghana, Ghana's chairmanship and, and the upcoming conference, uh, which will take place uh, next year. Um, and the second document is um, uh, the um, very elaborately named Basic Documents um, Pack. Um, uh, this uh, provides um, uh, a, a sort of a, a a full list of all of the core documents of the FOC from the founding um, documents through to the current uh, Stockholm Terms of Reference, which is the sort of the constitutional document of the FOC, um, as well as um, as of the end of uh, 2018, all of the joint statements um, that the Freedom Online Coalition have made um, uh, collaboratively and, and by consensus um, over its time uh, of, uh, since forming in 2011. Um, so if there are any sort of questions on this, um, we, we can talk about those um, later, but we're very um, excited to be able to provide those and do hope that you'll share those with, with colleagues as well. Um, so the format of, of, of this open forum really is to talk through some of the key uh, priorities of the FOC um, under the chairmanship of Ghana. Um, we'll also talk about um, some work that the FOC is doing on the issue of disinformation and human rights, um, and also um, uh, on the advisory network, um, which is the multi-stakeholder body which advises um, the FOC. 
And to do so, I have um, uh, three panelists. Um, Albert, um, who's the uh, cybersecurity advisor um, at, at the government of Ghana. Um, uh, Rauno, who's the uh, human rights ambassador um, in Finland. Um, and, and Mallory, who's the head of digital at Article 19, all have a deep connection with, with the FOC. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to Albert um, uh, to talk about the uh, Ghanaian chairmanship and upcoming activities. Uh, thank you, as usual, Charles, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, on behalf of my country, I think it's just appropriate to uh, recognize the great work you are doing, you and your team. Um, we have Mina here, but you've got a great team who have been supporting us uh, as we chair uh, this body. But also the friends of the chair. Um, I've seen all the hard work, the correspondence, the engagement, the advocacy that has gone on during this period, and I think we are really uh, happy for the support you've given us to, to run this. But it's important to congratulate uh, the government of Switzerland for joining the FOC. Uh, it happened during uh, our chairmanship, and, and we really appreciate that steps being taken. I also wish to report that we are having engagement with the government of Denmark, who has also expressed interest in joining uh, the Air Force. Uh, as part of this, we are hosting the Danish Tech Ambassador in Ghana in December, uh, and we are going to discuss their membership of the Air Force, and hopefully we can get them to announce this um, at a conference in February 2020. But permit me uh, also to commend and congratulate the government of Germany uh, for being selected as a champion by the United Nations on digital cooperation. Uh, I think uh, the German government deserved that. Uh, they have proven to be working as champions by bringing everybody on board, and I want to express my government support uh, for that kind of uh, responsibility, even at a global level. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I cannot talk much about the relevance of our work as a team, uh, specifically the mandate of the Air Force at this very crucial moment. Even when you look at the developed or the global north, there are a lot of changes going on. Um, there are changes relative to legislations to address emerging concerns in the cyber domain. When you also look at the global south, countries are actively taking up steps to introduce cyber security legislations uh, with the aim of addressing the various concerns that they have. I mean, this is a period that the work of the Air Force becomes, you know, very uh, critical. How do we achieve this? I've always stayed in a position of balance, and I don't know whether it's due to my background in philosophy. And the balance here is, as a body, we need to be mindful of whatever concerns that are necessitating the various legislations. And support by way of our statement, advocacy, awareness creation, to uh, support these countries to ensure that they follow a line that is consistent with the rule of law and the promotion of right in the digital space. I think my colleague Sam shared um, information that was sent out by the Twitter executive indicating the growth of our internet usage on the African continent. I also wish to add, if you look at the global internet statistics, um, the top countries with active presence on social media are in the you know, the global south. Ghana is among the top 10 countries. Nigeria is there. Egypt is there. You know, it gives you certain insight that our citizens are actively online. Those engagement are exposing them to a number of opportunities that they didn't have without technology. Indeed, I'm standing here, I mean, I'm speaking here also to argue that for example, shutting down internet does not only impact on rights, as in you know, the traditional notion of right. It has a huge economic consequences 
for developing countries. Permit me to make that economic argument because from the global south, there are a number of countries, including my own country, developing our country through digitalization, online banking. For Ghana has introduced uh, mobile money financial interoperability, where transfer is done through mobile phones. And the volume of transactions that are recorded each day should internet be shut down just for half a day, four hours, the country stands to lose a lot, even from the economic benefit. I think this should be part of our argument to um, raise awareness as to why we need to take the necessary steps to avoid taking certain extreme positions. But we can't just do that through advocacy. I've mentioned that. <coughs> My own interactions, there are certain governments who are really uh, committed to promoting rights. They know the benefit of the internet and they know the responsibilities of guaranteeing the, the freedom of speech online. But sometimes they are challenged. And now permit me to share one typical example. Some of them, uh, for the abuse of internet or criminal use of the internet, sometimes they do not get any help. International cooperation sometimes fails them. The criminal use of, let's say, Facebook to perpetrate fraud. How do you get the right support through the legally accepted means? You know, for example, Ghana has gone through all these interrogations, and because we did not want to, you know, subscribe to taking extreme measures that will have serious consequences, we had to ratify the Budapest Convention as a way of building collaborative effort by which the criminal justice system could use legally accepted mechanisms to address those issues. We ought to have a responsibility to give certain direction to certain countries. This is an alternative. If we speak out against shutting down the internet without providing alternative ways of reserve, resolving legitimate concerns, I don't think people will take us serious. And that is what I want to share uh, you know, with you as part of this. So we need to create awareness, we need to create incentives, but we need to also promote international cooperation arrangement that are consistent with the rule of law, that respect the right of citizens. And that is why I mentioned instruments like the Budapest Convention and so on and so forth. So that is just my introduction. Even though I was asked to market the upcoming event uh, in Ghana, which is confirmed, uh, I hope we can see everybody present here. We are building a very good program. Uh, we have confirmations, but we also want to uh, permit me to, to wear my African hat. <laughs> Just to be, we want to promote a lot of uh, awareness of the work of Air Force among the African countries, especially in the ECOWAS region. In view of that, uh, I've gotten approval from my bosses. <laughs> the Air Force is support you need to extend invitation to all ambassadors, at least from ECOWAS countries, but also certain specific countries on the African continent so that they can come in and, um, and, and, and have conversations. And, and through that, we'll be able to reach out to them to promote some of these ideals, which I believe is good for the world. Uh, Charles, I don't think I have much, but I prepared myself. That's why somebody is here for the <laughs> questions. Uh, we look forward to make the event a very um, successful one. Our government is fully involved. My minister is aware. She's spoken about it. We were in Strasbourg together at the Octopus Conference. She announced that and she invited uh, people to join us. So we have a top government commitment and we look forward uh, to enrich your experiences when you visit us in Accra. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much and for, for showing great leadership on these issues in, in the region. It's going to be um, uh, fantastic to see this uh, come to uh, fruition um, in, the, in the conference, which I will plug is the um, 6th to the 7th of February um, in, in Accra. Um, and uh, more information of that will be available online shortly. Um, so thank you, um, Albert, um, for that.
Um, I wanted to come um, next to uh, Rauno um, from, from the Finnish government um, uh, to talk about the issue of, of disinformation, which, the, as you'll see from the programme of action, the FOC has highlighted as one of its uh, priority areas uh, and um, uh, ask you to sort of talk to the issue and, and the importance of it from an FOC perspective. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Albert. Um, and good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Finland is one of the 31 member states of the Freedom Online Coalition. We have joined to the coalition uh, to, to promote the human rights online as they have, are respected offline. Um, and in recent circumstances, of course, we have to work together, not only the governments, but so also the, um, with, with civil society, business, academia, uh, to defend and promote the internet, which is open and trustworthy. Um, because as we know, uh, this kind of internet is also challenged uh, in this world. One of the tasks the Freedom Online Coalition is doing is to, to shape uh, norms, legally non-binding norms, soft law, if you wish. Um, and currently, Finland is drafting together with the United Kingdom uh, the statement on disinformation and, and human rights. And this is because we, we are deeply concerned about the growing threat of both online and offline disinformation. Um, we understand disinformation as a, the de deliberate creation and dissemination uh, of information which is known to be false and with aim to cause harms for certain persons or for whole society. Uh, so this kind of information can erode uh, the trust in public information and democratic institutions. Uh, it may fracture community cohesion, polarize uh, societies, and in most extreme, extreme cases, incite hatred and, and, and violation. Uh, governments can do a lot to prevent disinformation and make a society more resilient against disinformation. Uh, pluralist free media is a starting point to build uh, resilience against disinformation. Other elements uh, of resilience are social cohesion, trust in institutions, high-level education and adequate media and digital and media literacy. We have different ways to, to promote uh, human rights online uh, um, among the member states. In Finland, right to access to the to documents, public documents held by public authorities, is a constitutional right with certain very strict uh, restrictions. We have ratified the Council of Europe Convention on that particular issue, and we encourage all participating states to sign and ratify the convention. Uh, we can also build a societal resilience against disinformation by fact-checking services. We have good experience of that. Um, and we need definitely open communication between uh, governments uh, civil servants, politicians, civil society, school teachers, etc. Thus, any strategy to, co to counter disinformation should be multi-faced. Uh, it should combine proactive governmental responses, education and, and promotion of, of, of media and digital literacy, as, as well as pluralistic free media and responsible media companies. Uh, and all actions taken to prevent disinformation uh, have to be in line with human rights provisions 
including freedom of expression and the right to access to information. We are quite far to, to draft the freedom of, of uh, on online coalition statement, but we still are happy and welcome if you like to comment this particular issue. Um, and we hope that you can, you can also uh, work together with us to implement uh, the, um, the activities um, to, for resilience and, and against disinformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think this issue, as you've so eloquently described, sort of shows the type of issue that the FOC is trying to um, grapple with um, and trying to uh, bring together um, uh, through consensus of all the members uh, some common positions and language, um, uh, including sort of definitional clarity, which is often sort of missing in, in many, of, many of these conversations and, and issues. So um, I know it's no mere feat to, uh, to get to where we already are with the statement, and we're hoping to have that as a, um, a public statement um, as a deliverable in the, in the coming months and definitely before the FO conference um, in Accra, of which we will um, uh, be sure to share and uh, widely, uh, widely publicize. Um, I just wanted to talk to one, one additional point on the sort of utility of, of the statement. Um, from, from your perspective, um, obviously it's a huge amount of time and energy taken uh, from, from your time and your government's time, as well as all the other um, participating governments as well. Um, what do you see as the main sort of utility of the statement and how would you sort of like to see it be used um, going forward? Um, I think that the, the common challenge for all governments in, within the uh, FOC and outside is to, to, to defend democracy and, and the public trust in, in democratic institutions. Then we have certain own, um, own challenges or own, own priorities. Um, in Finland, we have a geopolitical um, position where it's all utmost important to us to some way also to, to be able to prevent the cross-border disinformation. Um, but mainly to us this is a question that how to, how to foster democracy. Great, thank you very much. Um, and if at any point you have questions, or I, I know that many of the other member states are in the room, if you'd like to add in, please do um, put your hand up and um, try to get some conversation going in this sports hall um, would, be, would be great. Um, uh, I'd like to come back um, to Ghana. We're very pleased um, to um, have um, a, a member of parliament join us um, now and, and just uh, um, provide the floor for you to make your intervention. Thank you very much and um, a very good afternoon to the members of this session. Uh, my name is the Honourable Samuel Nate George, a member of parliament in Ghana and a member of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Communications that has oversight responsibility of the technology space. I believe that Ghana is one of the countries or leading lights in Africa when it comes to freedoms for people, be it in cyberspace or traditional media. We have recently, after 22 years, passed a rights to information bill that is supposed to give wider freedoms to access information. However, in the digital space, it's important for us to safeguard the rights of citizens. Uh, even though as government and as legislators, we want to ensure that they're setting boundaries and guidelines that ensure that nobody is bullied. We also believe that the fundamental principle of the internet is a free internet and free expression by users of the platforms. And so Parliament of Ghana is committed. We've been working with Albert and the ministry, Albert who is our national cybersecurity advisor, on putting in place proper frameworks, a cybersecurity uh, legislation that gives rooms and protects the rights and freedoms of our citizens to be able to express themselves and state their opinions. We, we have a very liberal legal system. We may not have the First Amendment as the United States may have, but our local jurisprudence has great respect for individual rights and liberties. About 20 years ago, 
we decriminalized libel. We repealed, we had what used to be called the criminal libel law, which the state could use to arrest, prosecute, and jail for comments that people felt were injurious to political personalities. We have repealed that. It's almost 20 years since that. I think that was repealed in 2001. And so um, on, an African, on the African continent where there's still a lot of stifling of free speech, Ghana is one shining example. And I'm happy to say that, I'm happy to you uh, for allowing us host the FOC conference next year because it's international recognition of the work that we are doing. And it makes it easier for us to continue to champion further freedoms and be an example to the rest of the African continent. So um, all in all, we are comfortable and confident that we will continue to see a free internet space, uh, liberalization of the internet space, and we will continue to work with organizations like the FOC to see how well we can strengthen uh, internet freedoms in Ghana. There are one or two challenges that every country does have um, in, this world, in this era of hate speech and uh, violent extremism and terrorism and all of that. And so we're minded. We're minded by our responsibility as government and legislators to protect our citizens from all of this without necessarily infringing on their fundamental rights to expression. So I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this session and I'm sure that we can have further conversations on this matter. Thank you. Uh, just, just a comment because um, those of you who are familiar with the African contest, Honorable Sam George is a serving member of parliament with the opposition in, in, in British political terms. Uh, I serve under the current government, that means the party uh, that's in power. He is from the other side, called the opposition. But I just want to uh, highlight this to appreciate that when it comes to cyber-related issues, uh, it's a country that has achieved a tradition. Uh, we have a common thinking, a common approach to things. And he gave you, as a member of parliament, historical background as to how all this development has happened. It's not because of party A or party B. I think it's a common vision of Ghana. Mm. And it's good to let you know that I represent the opinion of government in power. He, rep he is from the opposition, but we sing the same song when it comes to the right of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for participating. It's, um, uh, been uh, too long that we haven't had uh, lawmakers and, and, and parliamentarians at uh, the IGF, um, so it's fantastic to have it's you well participate. The in Accra, so watch out. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. Very knowledgeable <laughs> in those areas. So please watch out the space when you are in Accra. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. And and just you know, as these issues become more complicated and and the sort of the national approaches to them become more legal, um, it's it's going to be ever more important to have um, your voice um, at the table. Uh, when we when we get to when we get to that, so thank you um, very much. Um, I have to note that unfortunately our panelist um, Rano has to leave for the airport, um, uh, which is very far away. Um, so unfortunately, but thank you very much, um, uh, Rano, uh, for for your participation today. Mallory, I'd like to come to you. Um, Mallory is one of the co-chairs of the advisory network, um, has been a um, long-standing um, uh, participant and engager uh, with the FOC, um, probably knows more about it than um, most people, including myself. Um, so I'd like to sort of pass it forward to you to, to, to make your intervention. Thank you. Thanks, Charles, and thanks <clears throat> to the previous speakers. It's important to remember that the Freedom Online Coalition is, is a member state um, coordinating group, um, but that it's always been committed to multi-stakeholderism. And that is why um, the advisory network exists and why um, I wanted to talk about this in the round table today, because it's very important. So I know that there are other advisors in the room. If you are an, on the advisory network for the FOC, could you just raise your hand? Some of you are not awake, that's fine. <laughs> um, and if you've been a part of a previous uh, working group of the FOC, can you also raise your hand? No? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
good. It's a few more people. So you've noticed, um, you know, there's actually the advisory, I would say the, the history of multi-stakeholder participation in the FOC is, goes beyond the advisory network in its history. So when it was first started, it was, um, there were not really formal mechanisms aside from the um, conference itself for participation, although I remember very well at my, um, at, the job, at my job at the time that we would regularly reach out to the Freedom Online Coalition to let them know that there was a topic that we felt they should write a statement on, and things like that. So that was the sort of early days of multi-stakeholder engagement. And then they formed three working groups um, that were multi-stakeholder, so it was um, the member states as well as a nice balance of private sector and um, civil society and academic participation. They paid attention to things like gender balance um, and, and other intersectionalities on diversity. And it was, I think they, they all had mixed results over the few years that they, um, that they were in existence, but it was a really great way to really, the idea was to build on a, a specific piece of work over a long period of time, which I think is almost the polar opposite of what the IGF is, where it's a multi-stakeholder space, but we have the event and then we go home. Unless you're in intersessional work, and that's, that's really great work. Um, but, you know, the, the, those working groups were really meant to build trust and to build actual outputs, um, and that really led to, I think, a lot of great stuff. One of those, I was, full disclosure, I was on one of those working groups. It was the Internet Free and Secure Working Group 1, and there's even a website that still exists with all the products of that. You can go to freeandsecure.online. So that, that's, those are some really good products. There was also one on transparency um, and data protection, and then I think the other one was on surveillance. Uh, digital development. Digital development, thank you, sorry. <laughs> it was, they, they, they sunsetted in 2017, so it's been a while since I had to enumerate them. Um, so that's the sort of history. And then, you know, after they sunsetted the working groups in 2017, there was an establishment of the advisory network. And so that's the current model today. So both private sector, well, not both, private sector, civil society, and academic um, folks can join the advisory network that is... Um, it's a, it's a fixed number at the moment, although there's no reason why it needs to be. Um, but I am the co-chair of that advisory network along with Bernard Shin from Microsoft at the moment. Um, and we're currently um, looking at you know, changing some of the, the ways that the advisory network works and also renewing membership. So there are some folks who won't be continuing after a couple of years. And so we'll have open slots to fill. And you'll be hearing about that because we'll do a public call for applications. And we would really like for more people or even folks that were involved in previous work with the FOC to consider um, coming back and we really strive for balance so that we have um, private sector membership um, and not just civil society and, and academics and researchers are also very, very welcome. And the reason why this is important, as you can see from the plan of action, there's a lot of really substantive and important statements that are done. And that's the sort of backbone or baseline, if you will, of what the FOC does is it comes out with statements. But it goes beyond that too. But if you just look at the topics that have been at, um, under discussion this year and are planned for next year, I think you'll see that there's a lot of room to bring your research, your perspectives, your advocacy um, uh, targets into those conversations. So one of the statements earlier this year was on defending civic space, which I think was launched in May. There's a statement that's not yet launched yet, but has been um, hotly debated around digital divides, which is really an important, very, very important topic to get right. So it's okay that it's taken a while to, to do that. Um, there's also one on disinformation, which you just heard about. Um, and there's also a current debate around the um, cybersecurity laws and the human rights impact of cybersecurity that is obviously a really big topic if you have been at the IGF for the past few days, you will know that. <laughs> and then lastly, for next year, we're also planning on doing, um, or the governments rather, and we'll be advising on the, um, a statement on artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of opportunities that covers a lot of issue ground in the internet freedom space. And so it would be great if um, you can join us as part of the advisory network, but the other way you can get involved is just by coming to the, to the ACRA conference. That's another great opportunity to talk to advisors and obviously um, 
FOC members um, and, and to be proactively engaged. Um, I would just say, as co-chair of the advisory network, I would be really happy to hear from um, people who want to engage and think that maybe the advisory network could do a better job of representing the larger space. Um, so proactively reach out to us, and I think Based on our last meeting that we just had on Monday, in fact, our internal meeting, there was a really great idea that came from Emma Alonso of CDT to actually have our own sort of side meeting alongside the FOC conference in Accra as a way of be, doing a better job of, of communicating out and bringing feedback back into um, the FOC via the advisory network and trying to show better leadership on engaging people who are not in that limited fixed number of advisors at the moment. So that's, I think, my update and my plea to continue to stay involved and to continue to raise important issues and your perspectives on those as part of the non-state stakeholders that care about the FOC. Thanks. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I think that gives a really, really good picture of the evolution of the multi-stakeholderism of uh, the FOC, which is multilateral, as you, as, as you mentioned at the beginning. I think that the, the FOC went through a five-year strategic review um, back uh, in, in 2016 uh, through to 2018, um, and from an independent um, assessment, uh, which was carried out, as well as the in, internal conversations, it was really sort of underscored that the, the, the value was still this multilateral approach, that there was no other way um, existing mechanism for, the, for that engagement. And the FOC predates, you know, the human rights discussion really at um, the IGF. It predates RightsCon. Um, it was created at a time where these things were very, very new. Um, and it had to sort of find its, its, its purpose again in, 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 that, in that conversation. Um, but what you touched on was some of the sort of really interesting value adds of, of that deeper connection, which is clearly a work in progress between the advisory network and the, and the, and the member states. Um, which I wanted just to talk to talk to a little bit more on, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, the cybersecurity statement is currently being um, um, developed. Um, this is an issue that um, many countries around the world do not have a shared position on. Um, then you add the complexity of uh, 30 other non-state actors who also don't potentially agree on, on that position, and we're trying to get to a, um, a consensus document. So 31 member states have to, have to um, uh, agree to that language. Um, we've sort of had an innovation in the, in the process to try and bring closer um, the, the advisory network inputs as well as, as, well as, the, me well as the member states. Um, I'd like just you to get your experience of, of that and, and, and how valuable that's been from, from someone who you know, is trying to shape this conversation from the outside and what the value of being you know, closer to some of the governments in the, the wordsmithing and redlining that's, that's currently, currently going on on that statement. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk more about that. So it's, it does sound like hard work, but I would say that there's a lot that's already been done because there is an existing statement or endorsement that the Freedom Online Coalition um, had released at the San Jose meeting in 2016 around the recommendations. Well, it was a definition, um, a sort of narrative of the complementarity of privacy and security, and um, a list of recommendations for cybersecurity policy making that respects human rights. And that was years of work, and it was hard. Um, the statement that we're working on right now is less ambitious and really leans on the work that was done previously. Um, and so it's hopefully um, just months long instead of years long process. But you're right that it's like the stakes are high given the larger, um, the larger conversation when there isn't a lot of alignment. But I think that's also why the Freedom Online Coalition's commitment to human rights is the highlight. You can't, you can't make a statement that says all the things or that you know, gets into the thornier issues that were, example, discussed this morning in the trust and norm session on, around like attribution and things like that. But if you just sort of, I think the Freedom Online Coalition has done a good job of recognizing what it is that it can contribute to that discussion, and it is around uh, sort of human rights-centric approach. And so it doesn't do 
too much, but that is a massive contribution and I think is really guiding not just, hopefully, the, the interventions that Freedom Online Coalition member states are making in um, the UN processes in the first committee, but also the engagement that the civil society and private sector um, stakeholders are making in their interventions into the process because it's a little bit, it's a little bit more open this time. Yeah. So that's the hope. Um, and so definitely look out for that when it comes out. Hopefully it will be something we all agree on. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, just opening to the floor, are there uh, questions, comments, contributions um, uh, to, to the conversation? Courtney, please. Thanks. Um, it's good to hear that there's an interest in engaging with people who have not ever been able to formally be involved with the FOC, despite contributing a lot of time um, and organizational effort. So I look forward to following up with you on that. But I have a question about some of the governments that are taking part in the FOC um, uh, you know, coalition, which is redundant, anyways. Um, and specifically, um, you know, many of those, and you mentioned that disinformation is a priority, but many of those governments are at the helm of disinformation campaigns and do not have electoral laws or you know, other regulatory frameworks for preventing political campaigns or um, government officials from conducting disinformation operations, online harassment campaigns, and other forms of computational propaganda. So where does that fit into the agenda? If there are member states that want to take that, I would be happy to give uh, my, our position, and then um, others can add in. That'd be great. Yeah. So, so the so the um, uh, the FOC, the, the, some of the process that goes into the actual development of the statements is to try and to ensure some of the coordination across the different agencies domestically, as well as some of the uh, competing sort of priorities um, that different agencies in different uh, countries um, have on some of these issues. Um, the FOC looks to, um, through its uh, founding documents and as well as the statements, you know, prov provide that sort of that standard and that bar that each of the member states are, are committed to both domestically as well as in their promotion of these values um, externally. And none of the governments are you know, perfect and there will always be some imperfections in some of these challenges um, and some of the um, uh, inconsistencies. Can, can we hear from the governments? Because I feel like you're just giving generic statements and I would like sure. to actually hear about whether or not sure. this is going to be on the agenda. And, you know, obviously no government is perfect, sure. but I've never heard anything about this. So I'd like to hear from the sure. governments whether this is going to be on I the agenda. I think Philippe no would offense, like to come Charles. in. Thank you. Of course, no offense taken. Thank you for the question. Uh, Philippe André Rodriguez from Canada, uh, one of the countries that has a regulatory framework for our elections, and we've just gone through an election, and the general feeling, uh, both from uh, the government but also from civil society, seems to be that there was very little, if any, disinformation during the campaign. So. Uh, I think in the context of the FOC, we are having that conversation uh, generally of, you know, when the FOC was founded, the questions that it was tackling uh, were relatively narrow. Um, this space was relatively uh, narrow and increasingly we see a lot of different issues, uh, including disinformation being um, having been discussed. And so I think we are currently thinking about how to address these issues of, well, when governments may not be entirely um, acting uh, in line with um, with the commitments uh, that they that they have made in the context of the FOC. So this is an ongoing process of where are we going with this piece. Um, there was a bit of a of a spark, spark plug there, uh, given that, um, I, as you may be aware, uh, the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism um, was relaunched uh, at the last uh, UN General Assembly with the added, uh, one of the added elements there was that um, in, uh, essentially countries can now become advisory, uh, part of the advisory body of that organization. And in order to be part of that body, you need to be part of the FOC. So this kind of uh, ignited the conversation around how do we 
keep governments accountable for the commitments that they have made under uh, the FOC. Uh, so there's a process right now. Um, it's still very much a, at its preliminary, preliminary stages, so we'll see where that goes. But at least um, there is a conversation that has been ignited. And actually, you know, uh, talking about the role of the advisory network, I think this is something that that the advisory network has been very vocal that we have that conversation a little bit more openly uh, in terms of that process. So uh, something to keep uh, an eye on in the, in the next little while. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we can take specific questions. I'll take that offline if you want on, on the statement and the specific scope as well. I think that's a really, really important point. Thank you, Courtney. One um, sort of part of the FAC that uh, sometimes gets missed off um, is uh, the Digital Defenders Partnership. Um, so I wanted to come to Frederica. Um, the FAC sort of gave birth uh, to this great initiative um, uh, uh, with, with some of the um, governments as, as leaders and for a long time um, the main contributors to it. But it'd be great to get a sort of an update of where you're at and your, your new strategic vision and, and, and what's going on there. Hi. Yeah, thank you. So, exciting news. We just launched our new strategy document, basically. Our, um, uh, yeah, the, the initiative was started in end 2012 by several FOC governments, but we're quite... Yeah, are we part of the FOC or not? We're always something like in between. We're new, neutral, basically, from the governments that we're working with, and we're an ally to them, working with different embassies. And what we do is protecting human rights defenders uh, who are under digital, digital attack and providing a holistic response to them. And um, what is new and exciting in our strategy is one of the things we're seeing now on the ground is that there is not enough... Um, local capacity available to provide this holistic response. So we're field building at the moment. And where are we at? We're basically fundraising for, can I say that here? Fundraising for this new strategy paper. And at the moment, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Finland are contributing. Uh, but we have been supported by seven FOC members. So um, um, please come to me if you're interested um, in this new strategy document, and I'm happy to explain more later. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions, thoughts? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna make a comment which I think the FOC as a body should begin to look at more extensively, and it spans from the point that was made by uh, the lady over there. It has to do with the issue of disinformation and a centralized, harmonized position by the FOC. Because when you look on the African continent, and I, I always try to put things in, within the perspective of Africa, because in most of the sessions I've sat through here at the IGF this year, I've realized that most of the th discussions are, ethno uh, are Eurocentric and North American oriented, and very, very light on Africa and maybe Asia, or the developing world. But when you look at Africa and elections and the issues of disinformation, misinformation, and fake news. These are very key things. And I'm glad that Ghana is going to be hosting the FOC next year because we have an election next year. It would be fantastic if we could begin to build a certain framework under the auspices of the FOC that will guide countries that may not have the law as Canada has on electoral, guiding electoral processes that will help as legislation, benchmarks that local legislation can span out from that would help to control misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. Because one of the biggest challenges to freedoms of online users is when governments think that there's a lot of disinformation or misinformation. And so the, the natural reaction of power or, or governments is legislation. It's what you saw even here in Germany. I mean, the network enforcement act as basically a response to social media content. And so if, we're, if, if the FOC can champion some study that gives us a setting framework, a benchmark that governments can then localize 
into local legislation. I think this is something that will go a long way if, if there's a real study done on it that helps us to build that framework that enables us to handle the problems and challenges of disinformation, misinformation, and, and fake news. Because take it from me, no, I don't think governments on their own just want to clamp down on, 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 on free speech. But if you're left without any framework to guide you, uh, when you see government officials, and, and, and this information is not just by government propaganda, opposition propaganda against government is also equally big. You get it. And, and so it, it cuts both ways. Um, like Albert told you, he, he represents the government of Ghana's perspective. I represent the opposition and the largest opposition in Ghana's perspective. I would be playing the ostrich to assume or suggest that disinformation in my country is one-sided. In fact, there's an ongoing battle from both sides. And it's simply because there's no legislation that seems to control that space. It's, it's an open space. And so if you're not careful and you have somebody sitting in the Ministry of Communication or in government that decides, look, we can't just have a free-for-all battle. What you're going to see is a legislation that may end up inhibiting the freedoms of users on the internet. So the FOC should take this as, a, as something serious that you may want to explore. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and some, of the, some of the challenges we're seeing definitely are those sort of legislative and policy proposals to, to stop fake news, but definitely sort of encroach on the rights to free expression and privacy. Would you like to come in? Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, um, uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Mujemi. I'm part of the advisory network. And um, I stress, you know, the need to have parliamentarians like yourself to come to these meetings so we can have um, an open channel to discuss all these issues. And I think um, there is a massive gap, you know, in, um, in a space like the IGF where the um, policymakers, you know, the people who are calling all the shots and making legislation are not present in this space. And it would be good if, you know, you act as an agent of change and go back to your local context and then inform people about this um, important uh, forum. And I'm looking forward to the um, opportunity, you know, to uh, come to Ghana so we can engage more, you know, with people um, during the upcoming AFUC. Um, I think there is no easy way to do this because so many governments, we have 55 governments in Africa and it would be um, you know, a dream to think that we can convince them all um, uh, about the principles of the FOC. So I think if you took that challenge upon your shoulder you know, to be the ambassador you know, of the African countries in the continent, I think this is a huge challenge and it's probably uh, you know, nice to find allies you know, in your local or regional context um, knowing that Africa is already kind of, not divided, but there are specificities, you know, according to the region, there is the, the language barrier as well. And I think this is definitely a good start, you know, to, um, to start the conversation. And I really uh, encourage, you know, the, the integration, you know, of the uh, legislative, you know, part of um, the governments to be, um, you know, part of these conversations. Spanning from um, the, the last comment, I, I don't know what, how this sits with you, but like I always say, um, I speak from the African context and I speak about my country, Ghana, because that's where I can speak off with authority and what happens. I believe that one of the key things that you could do to reach out to Africa is to make a case with Ghana. Because a lot of countries on the African continent look up to Ghana when, as a gold standard when it comes to legislation, when it comes to issues of cybersecurity and the internet and freedoms. If the FOC is going to be in Ghana in, in February, I would want to suggest to you to consider actively a direct engagement with the Parliament of Ghana, specifically the Select Committee on Communications. It's something that I can work with Albert to facilitate, at least a visit where the FOC gets the opportunity to interact directly with the Parliament of Ghana and use that as a case study to show how this can work on the African continent. And then it becomes easy for you to replicate it across the, the continent. When people see that, okay, this is possible, it's happened in Ghana, West Africa is gonna follow. Once it happens in West Africa, it's easy for North Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa to come on board. So uh, let me say that this is an unofficial invitation to the FOC by the Parliament of Ghana, the Select Committee on Communications. 
I think Albert can officially accept the unofficial um, invitation. <laughs> so, uh, they oversee our way. So, he is my boss in terms of parliamentary oversight. <laughs> and we can also say no. So, we take it in good faith, honorable. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I think that brings us nearly to time. And if any session ends early, you always get brownie points. So I'm going to try and get us in before, uh, uh, before the end of four o'clock. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come to this um, open forum of the Freedom Online Coalition. Um, a couple of uh, final things just to, just to um, uh, put a fine point on it. The conference is taking place on the 6th to 7th of February in Accra, and you're all welcome uh, to join us there. Uh, more information will be available, but please follow um, the FOC on Twitter um, for that. Um, uh, all the information that has been provided in hard copy, as well as a wealth of other information about the FOC is available on the FOC website, which is Freedom Online Coalition Com. The great work of Working Group 1 is also available online at freeandsecure.online. Um, good to use those new GLTDs, very good. Um, and there'll be a public call uh, for new advisory network members um, coming out shortly, um, and the advisory network um, will be um, leading that process and, and working with others to ensure that the, um, there's sort of deep engagement with external stakeholders with the FOC going forward. So thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your IGF um, and hope to see you in sunny Accra. Thank you.
pas, j'en ai là. Très bien, on a remis. Oui, voilà. enchanté. Ah non,
So, hello everyone, and thank you for being there. I am Antoine, I am with Mission Public, and with our team that is here, Yves, Benoit, Morgan, who is here, and Nadia, who is Nadia, and Pascal, there. Okay, so we welcome you today to this open forum. We are really proud and happy to have you here. Um, it's a project that we have been starting for two and a half to three years ago. And it was quite a bet, um, quite a, a crazy idea to bring citizens into internet governance. And when we mean citizens, we were meaning ordinary citizens. So people that have no idea and no knowledge on what is internet governance. But the idea in this bet that they also have a role to play in that story. So this is our bet, <laughs> and now we are very proud that part of it, uh, we won it. Um, we have been organizing uh, 12 preliminary discussions in 2018 in order to understand priorities and the agenda of citizens on the internet. Um, and then in 2019, this year, we have been organizing workshops in five countries of the world with a deliberative process based on information, balanced information materials, a deliberative meeting of randomly selected citizens, and the uh, gathering of results that we deliver back to policymakers this year and decision makers this year. So we are very happy that we have been doing this cycle. And we are more than happy that it is not over and that we want uh, also today to launch next year. And next year we want to scale that process to something like 100 countries, that's our ambition, um, and we want to have that in June next year. But for today, we are going to talk about the results of this phase of uh, dialogues and workshop. And we are going to talk about the results on disinformation and digital identity, but also on messages to IGF from the citizens. These were the topics that we addressed this year. You will see that um, maybe now we can have the, the presentation. Okay, so um, this is our goal, bring citizens into policy. That's what we do at Mission Public. These are our strategic partners for this year. And here too, we are really proud of having uh, gathered a broad coalition of actors to prepare that process and run it. And um, these are our cooperation partner for this year. And we have our national partners in the countries where we had the preliminary discussions and the workshop. Um, during today, we are going to also have participation, because in a way we like <laughs> participation, we love it. Um, so we have a Slido running, and we will be asking you some of the questions we ask to the citizens during the session. So uh, each time you will see um, a Slido going, um, and we will ask you a question, we'll be able to answer it, um, and, and, and yepa, okay, later, later on. So first, we will give you a video impression of the work done this year, and the five workshops done in the countries. So now we can give you this insight. Die größte Herausforderung für mich ist eigentlich zu wissen, worum es geht mit dem Internet. Google, Facebook, WhatsApp, Korruption, Memes, 
Darknet. Basicamente não vivemos mais na internet. Neira o chama cheio de base aí. Diesel for Digitale Identität ist der Fußabdruck oder die Sachen, die man von sich persönlich im Internet hinterlässt. Ja, aber Möglichkeiten für kriminelle Handlungen. Quando a gente fala, por exemplo, de fake news, são pessoas prejudicando outras. Que não tem muito conhecimento e acredita na primeira coisa que lê. Disinformation. É em taiste wa kyouiku ga ichiban juyo da to kanjimashita. Oburyo na koresha kugira ngo ibyo ngi ibyo biveho abantu no gukangurira leta. Misata no yara to kadira makushi ya yevan chanti ya yevan. Nango ibi. Ich habe gar keine Angst. Nun bei uns haben wir uns um die Isisaba, die wir uns haben, um die zu mit uns haben, um die zu. Da passieren Dinge, die sind ein bisschen außer Kontrolle. Und mein maiores Desejo ist, dass diese Internet sich für alle Menschen öffnet. Wir beginnen an der Art und Weise zu sein. Wir sollten gut zueinander sein. Für die, die sich mit dem Internet beschäftigen, seien Sie vorsichtig. ま、心の声を信じる。エロンボイルだぜ、バカゴロだぜ。死んだわ、え、死んだわものいで、エロンボイル。これからも他の世代の人とインターネットについて話す必要があるなと感じました。イブ、モクリスティ、インテレスレ
Uh, and on the next one, we ask them about how well they know different topics, um, like disinformation. So you see morning, afternoon, it's a huge shift in knowledge. Also on digital identity, uh, even more, even bigger, and on internet governance too. So here um, we see that people learned during the day and have a good, uh, have had a good uh, funded discussion on the topic. So now <laughs> we have a question that has, should have appeared on, in, uh, on Slido, and this is one of the questions we asked the citizens. Um, and um, you can join, join it and answer it, OF25. Um, now we'll turn to our national partners from uh, last year and this year, and I will first start with Arthur. Arthur, you were our partner in Uganda in 2018, and you uh, ran the preliminary discussion. I'd like to ask you, why did you decide to join as a national partner, and how was this experience? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we uh, decided to join as uh, national partners based on uh, an earlier meeting that my supervisor had with uh, Antoine. I think it was, must have been at the IGF in uh, 2017 or thereabout. And really, what, what, what came out for us was the, the misconception that very many people have about the internet. So when we reviewed the, the questions and the guiding principles behind which uh, Antoine achieved, wanted to achieve, it was something we really wanted to be part of, something we wanted to join. And it, it didn't disappoint because uh, the, the, the issues that we in Uganda consider the internet are not necessarily what is the internet, so it was an opportunity for us to try and clear the air. Uh, again, like the results, the results you've seen, many people had misconceptions in the morning, but then by evening, uh, many of those had been cleared, and uh, we look forward to doing this again next year. Thank you very much, Arthur. I turn to Peter. Peter, yes, Vint. I just realized that that microphone doesn't come out on this headset, but all the other things seem to. I don't understand that, but I'm not okay, sure. I would what switch the microphone. It's well, I can I can manage with the transcript. I was just discovering that I was hoping that this would work both ways, but maybe it's not. for the team there. It uh, has nothing to do with that. One, if that microphone doesn't come out of the headsets, no microphone will. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Is it okay for you, Vint, to pull on the translation? Oh, that does, that's not going to work. Is that right? Well, then I'll just use the transcript mm -hmm. and, and hope that you are very clear so the transcriber gets it right. Yes, okay. I'll try to practice my accent. <laughs> Let's see if that works as a French. Um, Peter, you are the German partner of uh, yes. this year. Uh, same question, why did you join and what happened? How was this experience of joining the project? Yes, thank you to be here. Uh, me, I'm coming from Mannheim. It's in the southwest of Germany. Mannheim is a city with 320,000 inhabitants and two of these inhabitants are also here in this room. Um, I say a very warm welcome to Elena stubinger Janas and a very warm welcome to Frank Michel from Mannheim. Um, it's uh, very interesting for us to make a cooperation um, and to work with you, with M uh, Mission Publique. Um, we, um, my, 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 uh, my job, I'm the head of the Office for Democracy and Strategy at the um, city of Mannheim, and I'm also responsible for the online communication of the municipality. And so we had three reasons and uh, three topics which were important to collaborate with um, Mission Publique, uh, with you, Antoine. The first reason is we start um, actually in these days a huge relaunch of our digital uh, communication channels. 
um, in this process we are very open for the issues of the citizens and the civil society. We want to focus the requirements from our citizens, so we have similar questions to the society as uh, Mission Publique, and perhaps we get interesting ideas also from this, from your process. The reason number two is, we are responsible in Mannheim for the participation um, of political um, issues uh, for our citizens. Uh, we get in the last year some experiences in the random selection and invitation of our citizens for such processes and events. Um, this wanted, this want you, and you make this um, also here in your workshop, and so it's fitted together well in this moment. And the reason number three, it's a huge interest in Mannheim to cooperate with citizens uh, with an international contact and international impact. For example, our Lord Mayor took part at the global meeting of the Global Parliament of Mayors in uh, November. It was uh, two weeks ago in Durban, South Africa, and he was elected as chairman of the GPM, the Global Parliament of Mayors, and he is very interested in this collaboration and in the international level. Thank you, Peter. Vint, you want it? It's, it's Vint. I just have to tell you a secret. My family is from Alsace, and one of the family names is Mannheimer. Ah, okay. So, we sind alle Mannheimer. Ah, okay. <laughs> today, today we are. You are always welcome in Mannheim. <laughs> <laughs> it was last Th week there, in Elsass, not. Thank you, Peter. Um, so now we are going to show some results um, on disinformation. So we are going to dive into the first topic, disinformation. And I will show you two um, key results. So one question we, we asked is how problematic is the spread of disinformation for you and for the world? And as you see, people in the five countries are, um, see that as quite problematic. Uh, but for and much more for the world than for themselves. So they have a kind of a, a discrepancy between how they feel themselves um, with this information and how they have the impression that the rest of the world is exposed to that. Um, yes. Have there been differences between the countries? Because I assume this is amongst all the participants, but you, since you did it in different places. So yes, there is. In, in um, this case particularly, there is a north-south, uh, global-south difference. And of course, if you rank from the less, um, uh, although well, if you rank from the less um, um, problematic to the most problematic, you would have uh, Germany, uh, then um, you would have uh, Rwanda, uh, Bangladesh and the Rohingya refugee camp, Brazil and Japan. And that's a funny fact because Japan, you could say not uh, north south is not uh, really working, but this would be the ranking. On the second um, big question we asked citizens to work on, and this was a qualitative work on a scenario, we asked them to rank and work on scenarios on how to tackle this information. And what they came with was first education, it was the highest ranked and um, very um, High ranked in comparison to the other one. So what for us that mean, and this is you here have a, a quote from one of the citizen, is that people see w one of their responsibility as person is also to get educated and be active themselves. Um, second uh, ranked was fact checking tools, um, be it algorithmic automatic tools or uh, tools uh, from journalists, for example, making fact-checking. So relying on third parties in order to tackle and spot disinformation. And the third one, and the least uh, uh, important for citizens, was uh, regulation, self-regulation by governments and companies. So that did not seem to gain the most interest from the citizens as a solution. Um, I would like our um, um, two person from the room to uh, react on that. And I turn now to C Cedric. Uh, Cedric Bachholz, you are working at UNESCO, and UNESCO is working on freedom of expression, uh, on access to information, and also disinformation. You are heading the UNESCO section on ICT in education, science, and culture. And how do you react to um, the first, uh, the, the results on education, um, so where people say it's part of our responsibility? Is it enough for you to, uh, to tackle this information through education, or is, 
is, this, is there more to that? Um, thank you so much, Antoine, for inviting UNESCO to join, and we are a strategic partner and fully supporting this. And I think you showed also in your slides how the participants and citizens are learning uh, throughout this exercise, but the numbers are of quite, uh, quite staggering. 86% uh, find it uh, problematic. 39% uh, in the slide you said uh, showed a strong exposure to disinformation, and, and the first source of information here from these uh, people were also uh, the internet. So there is a big problem. And of course, you will not be astonished uh, to hear from UNESCO that we, we are for a rights-based approach to tackle this information in a sustainable uh, way. And education, as many of the uh, citizens uh, said, is of course a first priority. Now, is it their responsibility only? We don't think so. Uh, we have in UNESCO a long-standing program on information and media literacy, and we help uh, countries build that into their education curricula. Uh, we help uh, teachers being trained in pre- and in-service teacher education institutions uh, to, to teach uh, me, uh, media and information literacy too. We have MOOCs, we have, we're doing research too. So education is central, but it's not their only responsibility, I would say. Of course, fact-checking tools are important too. Self-regulation of the media, uh, of providers of news is important too, as they, as they said. And we heard here in many of the discussions at the Internet Governance Forum uh, that uh, some thought also that there needs perhaps also a change in the way Internet leaders see their business models, which is sometimes uh, linked to that. Now, for UNESCO, um, we are working on freedom of expression, and we are also strengthening the capacity of journalists, which we have education uh, uh, journalist curricula, which we have been updating also with regards to disinformation, deep fakes, and so on, and how to deal uh, and to, to check this. Now, the, the fourth approach I would like to share is the one of internet universality and the Rome approach UNESCO is promoting. It is a human rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder shaped internet. And we've, we offer indicators for that and help and assist um, countries in, in doing that. But we do also very concrete work um, because the M stands for a multi-stakeholder uh, shaped internet. Uh, and we are, for example, with the ITU uh, co-vice chairing the Broadband Commission uh, where we created a working group on disinformation. And we have Facebook, Twitter, and many of the key uh, leaders there. Uh, and we, we will publish, uh, we have a specific working group on this, we'll publish new research and recommendations in this beginning of next year. Um, but we have also a very concrete uh, measures, and I will close with that, um, in terms of the judiciary. Um, we have, we're training uh, in Latin America alone, we have trained 13,000 judicial operators. So if we're speaking about same rights online uh, as offline, there is also a need uh, to, to, to address uh, that because there's more and more being brought to court. And I will have to excuse myself, I'll have to run off to a session with our, our chief justices, which is uh, later there. So UNESCO will continue to protect human rights around the world and develop sustainable ways to counter this information uh, and we are keen in doing so with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric, and head off to your next session when you have to. Thank you for having reacted to that um, question and that result and related to the work you are doing. You have a question. Uh, my name is Zerguna Jalal I am from a regulatory body in Afghanistan. I am board member of Afghanistan Telecom Regulatory Authority. I am looking at this information from a uh, regulatory perspective. That uh, this information, of course, uh, especially in the uh, countries like the uh, developing countries, uh, raise more problem uh, because there is uh, no control on this one. And uh, I think from a regulated perspective, there should be law and some condition in the law, and there should be policy and uh, regulation for that one. Otherwise, uh, this information <laughs> uh, spread more and uh, affect on the people and the human. And uh, sometimes, uh, like, uh, if we cannot stop the uh, technology, when technology is improving, with, uh, when the internet access is improving, so this problem is also uh, raising. 
And uh, I think uh, like there are uh, some countries that uh, the big data analysis and uh, to have the control on the Facebook or uh, some countries uh, stop uh, some of social media uh, to do not face to such an issue. But like uh, in China and uh, UAE, I saw that uh, they uh, brought some condition for some of uh, this one like Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter and so uh, uh, yes. more be on the third category regulation and, and self-regulation if you you would have to, to choose a way to tackle this information. Uh, yes, if uh, there is a regulation and if there is some condition in the law or uh, some uh, policy steps uh, to the people should inform this is uh, not a good way to use like a disinformation and spread the disinformation among the citizen and people. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Thank you for the reaction. I turn to Nena. I wanted to uh, um, ask you on the contract for the web. Um, so the contract for the web says it's a global plan for action to make our online world safe and empowering for everyone. So how does um, that um, reflect with um, the result uh, we have shown and the concerns and solutions that citizens put education and uh, the question of uh, regulation and the dif different. Does that work with the contract for the web? Do you have to change the contract for the web? Do you <laughs> or do citizens have to change to adopt the contract for the web? What is your reaction on that? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from the World Wide Web Foundation. We are happy to be part of this initiative uh, because the vision of Sir Tim Berners-Lee when he was putting together the protocol that gave us the World Wide Web is that everyone should be a creator and everyone should also benefit. So this is very important. Um, Vensef is here and he can speak more to the work they did building up what we call the internet today. It, is, it has always been in the spirit of collaboration, of co-creation, that everyone should be able to contribute and everyone should be able to benefit. Having said that, the issues we are raising in these dialogues are the very same issues that brought us to the contract for the web. If you want to look at what we do as the Web Foundation, we don't do contract. We do something else. There's a slight difference. We do three things. We mobilize coalitions to be sure we can have a safe and the web we want. We do research and we lead policy thoughts and changes. It is the, the, the sum of these three, working with all other partners that brought about the contract for the web. There are nine principles in the contract for the web. Three to governments, three to private, the, the industry, two for citizens and one for all of us. I want to come back to principle eight of the contract for the web. It enjoins citizens to use and create and to maintain civil discourse. In many places, we have seen people who know what their rights are. We have seen citizens who know what governments should do for them. We have seen people who know what they have a right to, but nobody's speaking about their own responsibilities. Who does hate speech? Who brings about misinformation? It's the users. So we all have rights, but we also have responsibilities. And that is the reason why we think that we should have more debates. We should have more discussion. No, we are not changing the contract. We are building it. Last year, we launched the principles. Two days ago, we launched the full contract. Now we are, we are looking into the actions in the country. And this we believe is one of those actions. Let's have a face-to-face -face dialogue. Let's say what works and what doesn't work. Let's see who is doing what, what can be done. So it is very important that we work together with the internet and the World Wide Web, and in this case, the contract for the web, to make sure that as we are benefiting from the web, 
we balance responsibilities and rights. And I'm not talking about just government. There are things that government should do. There are things that industry should do. But I, when I log in, there are also my rights on one hand and my responsibilities. It is for everyone. It is because of everyone. It is with everyone. And we are all into it. And that's why it's one nation, one vision, one web, one internet. We are all here. And we all have a part to play. Thank you very much, Nena. And indeed, we, one of the exercises during the deliberation was on rights and responsibilities. Um, so we don't have the results here, but they are in the database and we will exploit them also and, and have some vision and insights on, on what citizens think are responsibilities and rights. Um, I would like now to turn to the results of uh, the Slido. Uh, because normally we have, uh, okay, so <laughs> here we have, okay, only three participants, but 100% very problematic. So you are quite aligned, but uh, much more concerned than the citizens, the three of you. Um, and the next one, um, uh, how to tackle um, it, uh, disinformation. Here we have quite a um, difference because you, you see first education and then regulation, self-regulation, and not much about fact-checking. So you don't believe uh, much in fact-checking tools. That is interesting. Um, does someone want, want to react um, on, on that? Or Eve says me the, the clock is running. So we go. Ah, I, I was thinking with Eve. Uh, OK. Does someone want to comment um, or why they voted one of the, the choice? Um, ah, we, uh, it's changing now. OK, it's changing a bit. Uh, or why not fact-checking tools? Maybe that's the interesting question. Someone that answered. Okay. Yes. Okay, my, my question is a little bit about something that was just said a minute earlier about the disinformation. If I could pose a question or comment about that, I'll be very brief. Okay. okay, very quickly. I'm a little concerned sometimes that combating disinformation uh, can have an unintended negative consequence. So some of the things that get labeled as disinformation can be dissent in society. And I can think of examples of that in my country, the United States, where a number of um, investigative reporters have found themselves unable, they've sort of lost their voice, they've, they've declared themselves excluded from the legacy media, so they've moved online, but online at times, in fact, they've been formally labeled as fake, in, fake news or, or disinformation, when in fact, I think there was good evidence that they were dissenting information. So I think we have to be very careful when we go after disinformation to not silence dissent in a society. Thank you very much. Um, the citizens had a very big discussion on uh, satire. Uh, so the way um, um, sa uh, satirical uh, content, and uh, for them this was a big topic around disinformation. When it is disinformation, when is it satire, and how to handle uh, satire in relation to disinformation. That was a, for the citizens a very big, uh, big topic. So yes, the the, the lines are been to be drawn, and I use this opportunity to tell you that we have with us the balanced information materials that we presented to the citizens, where all the, those definitions also are put into, so that we are sure that we have a common definitions of what we talk about when we talk with the citizens. So you can have the information material and, and see what we meant, meant when we meant disinformation in that dialogue. Vint, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to make, uh, I think, two or three observations. The first one is a counterfactual uh, piece of information with regard to education. What we have uh, found in the United States is that the fact that you have a good education does not necessarily prevent you from uh, receiving and propagating misinformation and disinformation. In fact, there's a uh, an indication that uh, more educated people are sometimes drawn into the disinformation loop. Um, we see this uh, in the U.S. with the right and the left wing uh, online and television media. So we should be careful not to jump to the conclusion that just because people are well educated, that's proof against uh, an ability to resist uh, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the earlier comment about dissent also has another uh, phenomenon. If you repeatedly tell people X is not true, sometimes they remember the X part and they don't remember the not true part. And so we found by repeating a piece of disinformation, 
and saying it's not true, we reinforce the disinformation. This, you talk, have to talk to psychologists about that. There was a fourth option than, uh, than the three that I see up there, and that's called critical thinking. And that goes together with fact checking, except for the problem of figuring out what are the facts and what sources do I trust uh, for factual information to help me uh, uh, distinguish disinformation from good quality information. So even though we should be trained in critical thinking, I think everyone should feel that responsibility for thinking about what they're seeing and hearing. Uh, it turns out to be hard to apply if you don't have a good source of facts. So, thank you. And on that, indeed, citizens, so one of the subcategories of um, fact-checking was um, critical thinking, as you label it, in the sense that citizens said we have to learn how to spot uh, what is uh, uh, disinformation. So it was also part of the, the answer they, they gave. Um, thank you. We are now going over to digital identity, and I will present two results. Um, the first one is um, we ask citizens which kind of model they would uh, prefer for a digital identity. A um, model where they have one central identity, where they put everything. Um, a model where they have one identity for each use case, so for each account, each kind of uh, channel of communication they use. And in between, a couple of identities with, for example, one identity for health uh, questions, one identity for everything that has to do with communication, and one for finances, for example. So this was the three model we asked them to reflect on. And what we saw is that the one with a couple of identities won, uh, uh, in a way, and um, the, the number here, the 40%, may not be the highest majority, but when we looked at the arguments why they, cho they chose uh, that one, is indeed, and what we see is because they were saying the trade-off, is really between usability and security. So for them, having one um, for each uh, use case is a good trade-off between uh, having all in one place and having a risk of being hacked, and the one where you have to, for each and any service, each and any use, you have to create, have a new identity. So that was the reasoning uh, behind what uh, th this number says. The second um, question we asked was about uh, who should decide, so the question of governance of digital identity. And for that, we asked them to um, fill in a table with the different actors uh, we know here, so um, the different categories of stakeholder, and uh, the level of power they should have on the process of deciding how to govern digital identity. And what you see here are the quotes from one group, so it's one table um, from um, Rwanda. And uh, this table uh, gave their arguments why they think those groups of people should have uh, this role. And so you, as you see, it's a, it's a kind of a representative of the kind of arguments you, ha you have at those tables during the deliberation. Um, and the model which came first was co-deciding, uh, meaning something more than multi-stakeholder. Citizens had a preference for every actor having a voice and um, the system having to find a consensus uh, for a solution. But as a fallback solution, when we um, saw the data, that what could be if this doesn't work, there, there seems to be a, a good preference for governments uh, and a private sector to decide on digital identity. So the, fallback, the first solution, co-deciding, fallback solution, governments and companies. Uh, so that's uh, how citizens uh, uh, saw the governance of digital information. Um, I turn now to Cheren. Cheren, you're here. And I wanted to ask you to react um, to that result, um, knowing that your work at ISOC has one part on digital identity uh, and also a big focus on encryption. Uh, how do you see those results for your work, your strategy, and how does that uh, relate to that? Yeah. Thank you, Antoine. It's our great pleasure to be supporting your project, which we, re we will, I hope, we will continue to work together next year as well. Encryption, as you said, is a big part of managing, governing our digital, potentially multiple online identities. And it's a very important tool. We talked about opportunities and threats. They both coexist in the internet world. But encryption is a very important tool to make sure that we, the benefits, the opportunities outweigh the threats. 
securing our communications is not a high-tech thing. It's like if you look at Sumerian ancient tablets, people still try to have some sort of private communications and encryption, even if you're dealing with government, e-government services, digital health, banking, finance, or while simply chatting with friends, we rely on encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, in our everyday life. So it's not just a technical buzzword which is incomprehensible for mere mortals and everyday citizens. So that's why your work is very important for humanizing the narrative. Uh, because we need to raise awareness, there is a global trend uh, for mostly law enforcement purposes, which are legitimate purposes too, for crime prevention, uh, for access to information when it's necessary to prevent crimes or for uh, when you have court decisions and everything. There is a global trend uh, to weaken encryption or to access encrypted information through either encryption backdoors or other uh, initiatives like middleman uh, provisions or like the goals proposal in the UK. I don't want to point fingers. It's, it's really a global trend. So we need to raise awareness both in policymakers and also in the community. Uh, because as you're trying to, if you take encryption backdoors, for example, uh, if you have encryption backdoors and weaken the encryption, the bad actors will also try to use and potentially succeed in accessing that information. So as we're trying to provide security, we're also compromising security of individuals, privacy of individuals, because Constantly, we still have this false dichotomy of privacy versus security. Uh, and actually, they can coexist, and they have to coexist. Privacy and security cannot be isolated from each other if we're talking about securing our online communications. So this is very, very important in our work. And also, we have this security versus security argument now. And we, need, we really need to humanize this dialogue. And uh, while governments or policymakers have legitimate interests in accessing some certain information, exceptional access might not be the best idea, as you can compromise network security, and also for especially, again, a very human problem for vulnerable communities, vulnerable groups, like uh, indigenous communities, LGBTQ plus community, so they also rely on encryption in order not to be discriminated. So these are very human problems, Although it sounds technical for most people, humanizing the narrative around encryption is a huge part of the work that we all should do, we're all responsible for, so I salute you for your, your work on this and hope to uh, work together more in the following years. Thank you. There is indeed one, reason, one question we asked um, to the, the groups was, um, how would you place the cursor between anonymity and transparency on the internet? And uh, the citizens worked so well that they crossed both and they gave the arguments why. So now we have to extract that qualitative data, so we have to, don't have the quantitative one, but we know that they talked about that. And I'm yeah. also looking forward what they said for them, what was speaking for the one or another, and if they have a preference I, for... I can have just one. The, when you're talking to people, uh, again, coming from the privacy versus security, the I have nothing to hide argument is still very strong. And but for starters, privacy is not about hiding information, it's about empowering people whether or not to decide sharing information. So I have nothing to hide argument, fails every time. There are several ways to address that. I usually ask for their banking uh, password or some other very private information and then they start to think. So it's again a matter of uh, sending out the message on that too. Thank you. Um, I now turn to your neighbor. Uh, Rudolf, um, so you have been running the week, the entire week, and still you are here. So I thank you for that. Um, and thank you for the organization. I uh, take the opportunity and the support. You were the first partner on board. So thank you for that. So now um, you believe from the beginning that including citizens in that discussion is something very important. And I remember our discussion in Geneva on that. And you said we will be on board. So I uh, remember that very well. So now you've been um, working at the core of the IGF process. Is it still a, a good idea? Or how do you relate that to the week that you have been um, experiencing until now? Yeah, thank you, Antoine, and um, congratulations for, for the very really good uh, work and achievements. And of course, we think it is still important because one of the aims that we set ourselves 
um, as a humble host country and uh, knowing that this is a bottom-up process and so forth, um, still we wanted to enlarge the scope of the debate by various uh, means involving parliamentarians, involving SMEs, uh, but also uh, by involving um, this, um, what you call, ordinary citizens. So the people that are not in a usual, in a, in a daily, day-to-day -day context confronted with uh, all these um, internet governance discussions that we are having here, but uh, who are of course exposed to the results of what we are discussing here. And I think that's uh, really crucial. And you, you can, of course, argue that um, the citizens' um, opinion is also somehow represented by the parliamentarians, by the governments, because if they are democratically elected, they somehow reflect what is going on. But still, I think in, in such a um, complex and uh, fast-changing world, it is uh, crucial to have a direct feedback also to this community uh, uh, from, from the citizens. So uh, really, I think um, this kind of um, involvement of the citizens should be, should be continued and should be, uh, and should be enlarged. And we, and we very much actually welcome the uh, diversity of, of, of the citizens that you involve. As you said, gender diversity, regional diversity, stakeholder diversity, that's so important. So it, it gives not every single voice, but altogether it gives a really nice picture of a mosaic uh, that comes out of these small pieces, a very nice picture, and, and we should definitely try to uh, uh, keep this alive. Thank you very much, Rudolf. I now turn, yes, one reaction here. Sorry, I don't know, I have permission to ask a question or no, <laughs> but uh, how about, uh, I have a question from uh, the miss uh, that uh, she said about the privacy of data of individual and there should be encryption. Uh, but uh, when we encrypt the data or decrypt uh, again that data, there will be some cost on the data. So this cost will be uh, suffer customer or it, uh, it will be paid by the, uh, the responsible uh, service provider. Uh, I don't know who will be uh, paid for this, uh, uh, like a, a cost of this uh, encryption of the information. Do you want to, to answer to that, or is it a discussion for after the, the, the forum? I don't know on the cost. Maybe you, yeah. Well, obviously there are several business models for that, but ideally uh, we support having default end-to-end -to -end encryption and a strong one. Uh, provided to the end user. So the burden should not be on the end user financially in the ideal situation. But of course, it's, we are hearing some concerns coming from uh, service providers too, but it's the ideal is every end user should have the uh, opportunity to have very strong end-to-end -end encryption by default. Thank you. Um, I now turn to Vint. Um, Vint, you were member of the high-level panel on digital cooperation. Um, and we have seen in the governance part of digital identity that citizens wish a co-decide model. Is this something for IGF Plus uh, and that track? Or is it not realistic? What is your take on this wish of citizens to have a model where we have more than multi-stakeholder? So uh, this is a really big topic, so I'm going to try to uh, pick a few bits of it. Uh, with regard to the uh, high-level panel, uh, what we were looking for is digital cooperation across international boundaries. And with regard to identity, let me pose for you one of the more important benefits of having strong authentication. If you have the ability to assert that this is me and I signed this document or I made this statement, then you defend yourself against someone else trying to claim to be you and trying to do something which is effectively disinformation. Uh, so strong authentication is your friend here. This is not an argument that says everything you do has to be strongly authenticated. It's an argument for having the tool available when you need it and want it. You can easily imagine having different levels of strength in the ability to strongly authenticate. In the case of a contract, for example, which takes place either domestically or internationally, you might want very, very strong evidence associated with the cryptographic credential so that it would be hard for someone to 
engage in a contract that draws you into uh, a commitment that you didn't make. On the other hand, you could imagine very lightweight kinds of authentication where um, the amount of information associated with the identity is limited to you're an adult or you're not an adult or you live in a particular uh, locale or, or a, a different one without giving all of the other details of your um, identity. So this leads me to, uh, this, I don't want to misrepresent this, my personal view derived from having participated uh, in this high-level panel is that there would be good reason to have more than one available identity uh, for different purposes, so purpose-built identities instead of a single one. Because if you have only one and if somehow it's penetrated, then uh, everything, is, all bets are off. However, I have to tell you as an engineer that there's this little uh, technical problem. At Google, we make very heavy use of strong authentication. We use two-factor authentication. We have a physical device that has the cryptographic keys in it. And it, we register those devices so that we can't even get into our own systems uh, without using the two-factor authentication. So I feel really good about that. And then I think I have about 300 different accounts scattered around the internet for different purposes. If I had to have a separate physical cryptographic key for each one, I'd have a big bag. I'd probably be more healthy, but I'd have a big bag full of 300 of these things and I would be fumbling around trying to figure out which one to use. This is an opportunity for somebody to build a product that has the ability to hold hundreds of cryptographic credentials so you could use the same thing, calling on the appropriate ones, which also suggests standards, which also suggests digital cooperation across boundaries to establish standards, not only for the technical side of things, but for the bona fides that you present in order to authenticate before you get your credential. So this, I hope, turns out to be a really rich opportunity a very concrete thing that we could do in the digital cooperation space in the, from the uh, IGF Plus uh, perspective, we should be bringing as many use cases as we can to the attention of people who could develop these products and services so that they do something that turns out to be actually useful and usable. Could, could I ask a completely unrelated question just to get it on the table? Yes. The data that we just saw from uh, the um, exercise of this uh, program showed a significant shift in attitude from morning to afternoon. It's really important that the reasons that led to the shift be exposed to the rest of the population. So a very important question is how are you going to get that learning into the hands of the rest of the population and not the 75 people that happened to be in this room in Tokyo at the time? That's, you don't need to answer the question now. I just want you to know that's really important. Yes, it is, and, and indeed. So one way we like to do that is to work with our national partners so they can also use the results in the countries to raise awareness. And of course, if we start dreaming, we could have uh, such... Uh, dialogues in thousands of places every year, and then we would have enough people uh, that would uh, learn that. But it's maybe uh, in the coming years we have to build that. Um, Max, you wanted to say something. Yes, hello, my name is Max Zengis. I also work uh, for Google, and I had the pleasure to work with Antoine and his team as a, um, in the academic advisory board, and uh, hence have a fairly good understanding. Um, congratulations that uh, you um, got to this point. Really awesome. Um, a couple of points uh, building on um, what Rin said. I agree that use cases are a very, very good thing to consider as we are um, discussing governance points. However, um, I do not speak for Google, but I personally would strongly disagree that um, uh, there is a, a co-voting model that involves citizens. I think the multi-stakeholder governance model is uh, uh, quite um, evolved at this point, and there are different roles for different stakeholders. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's a misunderstanding that um, the governance actually happens here, right? We are exchanging, we are deliberating, we're thinking about solutions, and then every stakeholder goes back. You know, the companies are not involved in the lawmaking, um, the um, 
the governments are not involved in the product making and the coding, and um, hence the you know I think everybody has their their role and the idea to bring parliamentarians here as representatives of the people I think is really really good and a big step forward. We have 120 parliamentarians participate this year, and I think the participation by NGOs that really bring expertise and can be efficiency watchdogs and human rights watchdogs and contribute to the conversation is really good. Um, allow me to uh, add to Vin's points about the, the benefits and, and um, the, the qualities of this exercise. I think uh, to understand the reasons for the shifts in opinion is really the strength of uh, this exercise, to actually understand also how we can come together. So the, the qualitative analysis, but also the delta between the morning and the afternoon is really, really uh, important. Because basically what that shows you is um, that you can argue that a normal user um, um, questionnaire will not get you the right results if you just went out and you, uh, you did a direct democracy exercise and you asked people, do you want that or that? And you know that changes really significantly after a, a thorough deliberation of the pros and cons, then probably we should not go out and um, ask people on the street about it. Very importantly, uh, I don't know if you've mentioned this before, if you did, apologies. Um, the balanced briefing materials are a very, very valuable resource for this community because they are peer-reviewed and they list uh, not only the, the challenge itself and the topic itself, but the different options that are on the table for how to solve it. And um, not only that these are listed, they all even include the pros and cons and explain um, what's good and what's bad. In this case, we have put the balanced briefing materials at least for the better part of um, the exercise on the IGF wiki, which you can find at intgovwiki.org. And um, I hope we continue to evolve them and update them as a resource for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Max, and thank you for the coordination and collaboration. André, um, you wanted to say something, and then I give the word to Elena. Thank you. My name is Andrei Sherbosh. I'm <coughs> national partner of the Global Debates in Russia, representing National Research University High School of Economics. And I'd like to have a proposal just to start the discussion. Uh, I've formulated this proposal. Maybe it is possible to, to create ne next stage of debates where, uh, which will be focused not within single country, but uh, on international, uh, with representatives of different countries and stakeholder groups. I think this format of debates will also be useful. Yes, thank you, Andre. We talked about that this morning. I think it's one of the next steps of uh, citizen deliberation with uh, huge challenges on multilingualism. Uh, but I think you're right, and, and this is something we would like to test also next year and also talked with other partners about that. So thank you for the recommendation to, to do that and happy to work with you on that. Now I turn to Elena. Um, and you are here, you participated in the um, dialogue in Mannheim, and you are bringing with you a message uh, to decision makers that you've been uh, producing in the different workshops, and I'd like to hear you on that. We collected different statements in the workshop, and I had to choose one. And the one that I chose was, uh, that I chose now was, we wish that in all schools, children acquire basic knowledge about the internet, about software, hardware, and the processes around it, so that one can become an aware and responsible internet user. And the reason why I chose that statement was because while being at this conference now, I, um, I was surprised and also shocked about how many of the words and terms used I still don't know. And that's, yeah, and we had a lot of discussions um, in the workshop about disinformation, internet security, um, data misuse, and what we're talking and discussing about now as well. And um, I think to be able to handle those risks and to tackle down the mistrust that we have um, as citizens about those things, because we are always hearing about those things and have a certain mistrust of, against the internet because of that. Um, we just need to know to need to know more about it. So to need to more about the processes behind it, about how internet really works, 
and then we can really um, and then we can start to use the, to make profit of it and to use the internet in its best way. Yes, and for me, the best way or the first way to start to get the, the information is in, at school because there we can from early on, on learn, get the necessary information. So that we as citizens are as well able um, to participate and to be as, um, able to be asked when you ask me in the street, I could give you the answer then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I have two contributions left here and here, but before that, I would like to hear Frank, who is a second uh, citizen uh, that participated also in, in Mannheim in Germany and also has a second message. And uh, then I will take two more contributions and then we will close the session. Okay. Uh, the, the message is missing. Oh. It's just you. There we go. Oh. Okay, uh, we had a lot of uh, topics, isn't it? And we have to choose one out of them, and that's what I have chosen so far. We think that a secure key and the protection of our personal data must be examined as a priority at the International Governance Forum. The acceptation of internet applications that need and will need a digital identity depends on it. That is, the citizens, so all of us, yeah. have a right of transparency. At the end, it's the question, who is the owner of the data, isn't it? Who can create data, who can change data, who can manipulate data, and who can delete data? And the last point is a very important point. I also have the right that maybe some data that are wrong or I don't any longer that are the data in the internet, I want that they are deleted in a concrete, in a secure way. And I guess with the new wave of technology, the artificial intelligence, some companies or some states, governments, uh, can create new data that I never put in the system, that are data behind all, that are the data in the background, using for control, using for manipulation, can use for new business models, but that are related to my identity. I never have seen it. And the most important point from my, from my uh, perspective is to have a transparency. This is the most thing that I'm missing. At the moment, I have no transparency. I can look in, let me say, what I created as data in the different software systems, in the different applications that I can do. But what is behind, I don't have any clue what's going on there. And that's the point here, we need rules. We need rules worldwide because the data centers, the applications are running worldwide. They are running not in Germany, to be really honest. So we need, let me say, uh, international regulation, international catalog, what is going on, what can be used, what not. And especially for the deletion of data, this should be also an agreement on an international base. That's very important from my side. Thank you very much, Frank. This um, point on, on data was a big discussion all over the world, so that's very important. I wanted to, do you want, uh, you had one question and then I turn to you, Vint. Well, it's not exactly a question, but a comment, but I will be very concise. Um, first off, I would like to thank you as an organizer, because contrary to many of the sessions that I've been here at the IGF, this is very straightforward and easy to understand. And this goes uh, to an important point that I would like to make, because I'm here uh, representing the Council of Europe, but also representing an ordinary citizen. And when I think of the debate that we're having here um, at the Internet Governance Forum, I think we're oftentimes very technical. We use very difficult words that are not very accessible to a lot of the population. And I think it's just important to remind ourselves that each and every one here of us here is also a user and what we're deciding about is essentially the future or, well, we're not deciding, but what we're talking about is the future of the users. So um, just as you said uh, earlier, education is very important, but what is also very important is that the topics that we're talking about, they become accessible to the ordinary citizen in this world who are affected by what we're talking about. Um, so that they also are empowered, that they can bring in their own views, that they are empowered to decide on their own what is important to them and what is not. 
So in terms of developing this format, I would actually be highly um, in favor of developing a format where ordinary citizens are much more involved in a structure of an IGF in this dialogue on internet governance. Um, and just to make a last point, in the Council of Europe, the youth department, we use a co-management system where we as representatives of youth organizations work together with representatives of governments to formulate policy. And this exactly forces us to not talk in a technical policy language, but to be able to break down what we're discussing to something that's accessible and easy to understand for the average young citizen um, we are talking about in Europe. And I think that's very important. And for that reason, I would like to call upon a more easily accessible dialogue. And thank you very much for your contribution. I think it's very valuable. Thank you very much for your comment. Vint, I give you the floor, and then I will close the session. Thank you very much. Sorry, I have to switch back and forth because the microphone problem. Um, two comments. First of all, with regard to um, this question of understanding how does the internet work, um, it's a pretty big, complex system. Do you know, before we allow children to drive cars in the United States, they have to take a course called a driver's training course. Maybe we should have an internet driver's license where you have to pass an exam that says you understand enough about the internet so that you can feel like you're, you know how to navigate this complex environment safely. So it's only tongue in cheek. I really think something like an internet driver's license would be a great course to have uh, in school. The second point has to do with what my friend Frank had to say. Uh, there's a very interesting problem in the internet, and that is information about you ends up on the network coming from other sources than you. In particular, it comes from your friends and your family and your colleagues and people that you don't know. Uh, I don't know how many billions of photographs go up on the net into the social media. Sometimes they're pictures that were taken of someone else, but you were caught in the picture. Uh, I don't know how to cope with the fact that there's a lot of stuff about each of us that shows up in places we never go in the net, would not know even how to search for. And in a way, if you really wanted, let's take pictures for example, if you wanted to discover where every picture of you is in the net, the only way that would work would be if we used really good facial recognition. And some of us run away screaming when we think about that possibility. So this is an almost unsolvable problem to figure out how to track down and be aware of information about you and your business that you didn't put into the system, but somebody else did, even inadvertently. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for all the contribution and for being there uh, this afternoon. Um, we are um, now starting the next phase, <laughs> and that's 2020. We want to scale the process. Uh, we would like to invite you um, to be part of that, and Morgan, you can uh, show the last slide. It's on it. Okay, perfect. So you can become a partner of us and, and be a partner in the country, be a partner at a strategic le uh, level. We would be very glad to have you. We have some copies of the information material you were mentioning, Max, here as a, as a paper. So if you want to take one, you will find them there. And you can also talk to Benoit if uh, you want to, uh, to discuss further, or to me or anyone. I really, really thank you and um, for having contributed to that and for being part of this project. Thank you very much.
Hello, hello. Um, so, <laughs> thank you very much. Good evening to you all. Assalamu alaikum. I am from Bangladesh and uh, I am the chairman of the Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum of Bangladesh, but at the same time, I am member parliament and I am also the chairman. Uh, now of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on the Ministry of Information. Uh, I belong to a political party which is called Socialist Party and is in coalition with the present government. The Prime Minister is Sheikh Hasina. So we are in the government for the last 11 years. Uh, many years back, in 2009, uh, 
I was the chairman of the parliamentary standing committee on the Ministry of Telecom and ICTs. So at that time, uh, many new laws are enacted to cope up with the digitization process. Our regulatory authority was changed into a modern system at that time. So having said that, I have been invited by the Afghan regulatory authority, uh, Mr. Hashmi, the vice chairman, Bilal Hashmi, uh, and the other Afghan uh, dignitaries to moderate this session. Thank you all for participating in this session. Here with me in this session is Bilal Hashmi, vice chairman of Afghan Telecom Regulatory Authority, ATRA, Ms. Shabana, he, she represents Net Society. Mr. Arbab, he's a commissioner of access to information of the Afghan government. Then Zarguna, he is, she is the board member of the regulatory authority of Afghanistan. This meeting is organized by the regulatory authority of the Afghanistan. So having said that, uh, Bilal Hashmi, the Vice Chairman of ATRA, Regulatory Authority, will come up with a keynote speech and a statement. So I invite Mr. Bilal Hashmi to deliver his statement on the issue. Mind that the subject is how to digitize and connect internationally the landlocked countries. Afghanistan being a landlocked country, we will discuss Afghanistan, but the whole model is to be evolved how to address the problems of landlocked countries who doesn't have access to ocean seas to get the submarine cable networks connected. So we'll discuss Afghanistan, but we'll generalize it for all landlocked countries of the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilal Hashmi, please. Hello. I'm so comfortable when I'm standing, so I'm so sorry for time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Turning opportunities or weaknesses into opportunities. Turning weaknesses into opportunities and turning weaknesses into strengths that creates opportunity is the key to success. A lot of people have done it. A lot of countries have done it. India and China, with the population of more than 2.5 billion has made these weaknesses and turned them into the strength and established and created the opportunity. Today, they are not creating and creating the jobs within their countries, but they are exporting. They are exporting the professionals, the expertise around the globe. And there are the factors for stability or economic stability in their countries. My name is Bilal Hashmi. I'm a vice chairman of Afghanistan Telecommunication Regulatory Authority. And it's my pleasure and honor to be here to present the topic under the landlocked countries, turning weaknesses into strengths that creates the opportunity. And thank you very much for all the, all the audience and respect it government officials, private sectors, ladies and gentlemen. Before I go to the weaknesses and opportunities, let me introduce Afghanistan and the ATRA itself. Afghanistan is located at the central of Asia with a population of around 32 million and the the area is 625,000 kilometers square. 
ATRA is the highest regulatory body for regulation or regulate the telecom sectors in the country. It was established in 2005 and became an independent body in 2017 that is the highest regulatory body in the country that regulates the telecom sectors in the country. We have five MNOs, the telecom operators, and we have introduced or launched 2G services back in 2003 and 3G services in 2012 and 4G in 2017. That is the statistics which comes from the ANISA, the statistics uh, institution, government institution. We have a GSM subscriber of around 23 million and a total subscribers of the data reached to around 30, 13 million. And the landlines is 133,000. Investment in this sector is 3 billion, which is the biggest investment in the country, in the sector of the telecom. A population coverage of 90% and a penetration of 72%. The weaknesses, yes, we do have the weaknesses, as I stated earlier, but that is not the population. It's the weaknesses of the security situations and the mountainous area, as majority of the land is occupied by the mountainous areas, which can create problems to lay down, to lay the fiber, optical fibers, and the low bro broadband penetration. There is no submarine cable access, and the low literacy rate is the factors which we can call the weaknesses in our country. And as a result, the users are paying the high prices. Opportunity, it doesn't come to you. You have to create. It must be created. We have a digital hub. As Afghanistan is at the central of Asia, we can change Afghanistan and landlock into connecting country because we can use Afghanistan as a digital hub and the fiber for international and local licenses. The opportunities that we have is the IP transit. We can use Afghanistan as an IP transit. We did it before as a, as a transit for transport, as a transmission for the electricity, and the government have, has taken this initiative to go for the transmission or transit of the optical fiber and the IP transit, which connects the South Asia to the Central Asia and vice versa. The other opportunities that we do have is the infrastructures. Before, there was only one fiber, optical fiber company in Afghanistan. And back in 2017, ATRA, Afghanistan Telecommunication Regulatory Authority, and the government official has decided to change and create the opportunity by providing, by eliminating the infrastructure development monopoly, which was only one company in Afghanistan operating in the optical fiber. By having the op open access policy, now we have three more other fiber, optical fiber companies which are currently working in laying the fiber connectivity within the country. And for the other objectives of the opportunities that we have is facilitate investment and growth in the ICT sector. The government has already started investing in Afghanistan and they are providing the facility for the FDIs and foreign investors, the visa on arrival and other opportunities so that they can invest in all sectors, especially in the telecom sector. The other one is to facilitate infrastructures to smart cities. As every country is going for the smart cities, the same Afghanistan is eager to go for the smart cities, and the government is entrusted and eager to go for the smart cities. And there are long-term objectives or opportunities we have as well. The first is the open access policy that we have already started. And we have given licenses. In the second stage, we have the open access regulations that we already re developed the regulation for the open access 
policy or, uh, and, and provided the license for the fiber, optical fiber companies. There are three other companies who are now having the license and working in the optical fiber. The 4G spectrum is the other one, and we have Digital Casa. There are certain things that the government has decided in the recent years to change Afghanistan from the, from the landlocked into the land-connected countries. We have done, in the electricity, we have introduced the digital casa. We have opened the roads and used them as a transit to, Middle East, uh, to the Central Asia, from the South Asia to the Central Asia. In the same way, it, 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 it's happening in the digital casa projects. In late in 2015, the World Bank Commission study determined the feasibility of the digital CASA project, which would connect Kyrgyzstan, Republic Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and at the second stage, Iran and other countries, such as China as well. And this is the map that we have already connected uh, to the fiber, optical fiber, to many countries. ATRA is not doing only not regulating the sector in the country. We have some other services. We have the TDF fund, which is being funded, and we fund some government institutions which are very much important to us and for the development of the country. We have split them into four major areas, the rural communication development, the internet bandwidth, and the ICT labs and the telemedicine. These are the four major areas that we are funding the government institutions around the country. So far, we have erected 850 towers in order to access the telecom, telecom services in the rural areas. And also, we are funding the Ministry of Higher Education to facilitate the interconnectivity or connectivity services to the students at the universities, and ATRA has funded this project, and so far we have developed and connected 54 university, state universities, and all the students are being benefited of those services that we have provided. Meantime, the Ministry of Education, we are giving around 30 million US dollars to Ministry of Education facilitate and provide the services, IT and ICT labs we are developing and we are making the I ICT labs at different schools around the country to facilitate the students to get benefit of the IT services. And the 10-4 in Ministry of Education and the other one is the Health Ministry also. We are providing all the services to Ministry of Education. On average, up to 70 to 90 million USD is being funded to the government institutions in order to facilitate them for providing the services, the internet services, all the schools and universities. Yes, we have the, the way forward. Post the fiber deployment, as I said earlier, that we do want to change Afghanistan into transit as a transit country, which can connect the Central Asia with the South Asia. And we have already taken those steps, and we do provide all the facilities for the foreign investors, and all the foreign investors are, some of the foreign, uh, foreign investors are entrusted to, 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 to take part, not only provide services to the country, but also use Afghanistan as a transit and provide those services and do business and invest for, to use Afghanistan as a transit to other countries. Make Afghanistan more reliable for regional connectivity. Yeah, we do have the transit facility and we improve the competition. We promote digital inclusion. At last but not the least, we want to change Afghanistan from the landlocked country and to the land-connected country. Thank you very much. Well, uh, give a hand to Mr. Bilal Hashmi. I hope you have got an overview of the Afghan digitization process. 
Uh, Afghanistan is doing very fine. By the way, I have not introduced myself. My name is Hassanul Haq Inu. Uh, so, uh, uh, the major important proposal from Hashmi is that uh, the landlocked country needs to be transformed into land-connected country. That is very interesting. Second, he said that Afghanistan can be a transit for other landlocked countries around the region. So Afghanistan become, can become a hub of telecom connections and optical fiber connections. By that, they can earn, then it is a business case. So that is a very interesting proposal. And uh, third, the telecom authority is opening up uh, the fiber optical uh, infrastructure development process to private sector, breaking the monopoly. That is a welcome news. So having said that, uh, uh, I uh, invite uh, Ms. Shabana, she belongs to Internet Society of Afghanistan. Please. That is Internet Society, not International Society. Hello everyone, this is Shabana Mansouri. I represent Internet Society Afghanistan. Uh, I'm also founder of a national program by name of Afghan Girls in ICT. Uh, my presentation will mainly focus on the gender perspective of uh, landlocked countries turning a weakness into opportunities. Uh, in order to make Afghanistan a digitized country, uh, a gender perspective uh, is crucial uh, for achieving this goal. Um, well, uh, to give you an overview of uh, uh, women state in the country, um, the total population of women is 49% uh, and female literacy percentage is 24.2%, which means 57.8% have uh, not uh, any formal education and are illiterate. Primary and secondary school enrollment is more than 3 million and public university enrollment is more than 63,000. Women's life expectancy is 46. Uh, years. Um, um, to tell you about uh, national priorities and programs um, in the country, uh, we have uh, Afghanistan National Peace and Development Framework, which uh, explains the strategy of the country in order to proceed for development. We also have National Priority Program, which is uh, a bit aligned to the global SDGs. And in there, we have a specific uh, priority for women, which is called Women Economic Empowerment. And then we also have Afghanistan Sustainable and Development Goals, uh, which is a specific committee uh, which works towards is, uh, achieving SDGs. And it's co-chaired by Afghanistan uh, um, uh, President, um, Vice President Office. And for SDGs, UNDP is uh, also in charge of uh, achieving SDGs, uh, and the committee uh, is chaired by the Ministry of Economy. Um, well, uh, about ICT stakeholders in Afghanistan, we do have uh, the ap uh, approach of multi stakeholder. Uh, we have involved the government, private sector, independent groups, uh, NGO civil societies, academy, and also international community. Uh, from government address, we have Ministry of Communication and Information, Afghanistan Telecom Regulatory Authority, Afghan Telecom, and also National ICT Council of Afghanistan. 
From private, private sector, we have different ISPs, net, uh, network operators, and also private ICT uh, solutions companies. Uh, we do have NGOs and independent groups, uh, we, which are including Internet Society of Afghanistan, uh, NETPA, Innovation and Technology Research Center for Afghanistan, and also IHAP uh, Afghanistan, which are initiatives uh, through independent groups. Uh, we also have uh, public universities and private universities, which works towards ICT, uh, uh, and we have donor agencies who are working uh, towards ICT, such as USA, UN agencies, World Bank Group, ADB, and also uh, European Union. Uh, to um, talk about uh, women-specific initiatives or programs, I'm glad to represent here and, uh, and share with you a number of programs and initiatives which we have in Afghanistan. Uh, well, when we participated in a, a global IGF in Mexico in 2017, I remember uh, we had a presentation and there we only named one to two initiatives in the country which works um, towards uh, inclusion of women uh, in digital uh, realization of the country and also um, and uh, gender equality when it comes to discussion of ICT. Uh, we have Afghan Girls and ICT initiative in the country which works towards uh, um, um, involving more girls and women in ICT study and careers. Uh, there is another program which uh, names is Girls Can Code which is run through Humanity Foundation and International NGO. We have Take Women Afghanistan, Afghan Girls Robotic Team. We have uh, a Code for Peace program, which is run through UN Women. And we do have Afghan Girls Animation Team. Code to Inspire is another initiative, uh, which focuses on um, creating uh, girls with coding. Um, uh, and we also, uh, we have also been um, uh, running ITU's International Day of Girls and ICT. We have been celebrating this, and it has been uh, celebrated through ATRA, the ministry, and also the local initiatives. Uh, well, uh, uh, it has been discussed many times in order to change Afghanistan into a digital um, country. Um, and when uh, the discussion of uh, gender uh, camps, we do uh, have um, some challenges. Uh, there are two um, important challenges. The first challenge is when you give attention to gender equality in ICT, and the second challenge is when you start the program. So the big major challenges we still have Although I named a, num a number of programs and initiatives which have been running in the country, uh, we do lack like still a policy change for women empowerment in ICT and um, lack of national attention and program for inclusion of women in ICT and lack of specific data, micro data in the state of women in ICT. Uh, we have been involved uh, in order to find solutions for these big challenges, and we have a specified solution in three uh, big and specific uh, points. We do need a supportive policy change and then advocacy for that in order to um, increase, um, in order to work more for gender equality in ICT in order to achieve the bigger goal, the goal of uh, making Afghanistan a digitized country. We also need to um, um, have a national program, such as uh, we have currently Women Economic Empowerment in the country, which is a national priority program. We do need a specific program, a national program, in order to increase more women in ICT, in order to achieve the global, uh, the bigger law. And also, we also need support of international community um, in this uh, proposed solution. And uh, why we think that uh, more girls and women in ICT are important? Uh, because as uh, ATRA presented that they are working towards 
uh, changing Afghanistan from a land-locked uh, country to a land-connected country. For that, we need to uh, consider gender perspective as well. Because gender equality in ICT is important, and also ICT can work for gender equality at the end in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shabana Mansuri. Uh, you have got an overview of the women of Afghanistan and girls of Afghanistan. She emphasized on the issue of Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs 2030, where the United Nations and the member states have agreed to go for certain parameters to be achieved by 2030. One is gender equality. We in Bangladesh still lacking behind in the issue of gender equality. So she is focusing on the woman uh, community to be literate with ICTs. We call digital literacy. So gender equality is a challenge, but when you apply ICTs, you need to develop an inclusive policy where the gen gender inequality is incorporated and the disadvantaged group is incorporated. She emphasized on this uh, issue that that means ICT application needs to follow a inclusive policy, emphasizing on women and girls. Thank you very much. I hope Afghanistan will catch up with the present day world. By 2030, there will be gender equality in Afghanistan. I now invite uh, Mr. Arbab. He is the commissioner of a institute called Access to Information. In Bangladesh, we have an information commission set up by law, is an independent body. So we have enacted another law, Right to Information, RTI. So RTI gives uh, uh, the citizens, journalists, to seek any information from the government uh, machinery or the government officials. Also, all the private sector where the Bangladesh bank is financing or the international community is financing. So they are bound to give information if a citizen asks for that particular information. So by that, a right to information allows a citizen to focus his uh, focus on the internal corridors of the bureaucracy. I hope Mr. Arbab is doing a good job. I invite Mr. Arbab, Commissioner, to access to information. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I've been told that I have three minutes, so I'll just make it as short as possible. Is a little bit louder. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, when we are talking about uh, internet governance, actually we are talking about uh, uh, transparency and accountability and public uh, access to information because it's their human right. Everyone should uh, have access to uh, government uh, holding the information. Uh, and also to ensure uh, accountability and transparency, what the government is doing for their public. Uh, having said that, in Afghanistan, luckily, we have one of the strongest law because according to Center for Law and Democracy Canada, out of uh, 150, we got 139 uh, points. Uh, so we have one of the best law, but when it comes to its implementations, we do face uh, challenges. Uh, to briefly speak about the challenges in Afghanistan, uh, we are facing with the, the implementation of the law. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the lack of uh, public awareness, uh, because public should know about that it's their human right and they should approach government entities. Uh, another challenge is that uh, lack of accessibility in Afghanistan and remote areas, people do not have access to internet. Uh, uh, the other problem is that the digitalization of the information. Uh, 
uh, in Afghanistan, we are gradually progressing uh, towards that. Uh, we do have a number of uh, ministries, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, uh, Ministry of uh, RRD, uh, National Procurement Authority. Uh, they have somehow digitalized their data, so it's online, they have online uh, data systems, so public have access to that. But when it comes to the rest of the government entities, most of them, uh, they do not have the data in a digital form, which is a challenge. So. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, in the future, when it comes to the implementation of the law, we will uh, push for the digitalization of the data. So not only the Afghan, the rest of the world, they have access to it. And we also hope and request IGF to, to do some lobby and push for it, because if you don't have strong law, uh, access to information law, then it becomes a challenge because you may have data and then there will be a culture of uh, secrecy. Because when it comes to government, government is to serve the public, whether it's a, in a digital form or other forms. So uh, once we have strong law, we will be able and public will be able to have access to data. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Alba. You are doing a great job. Uh, the laws is there but the application of law is always a challenge. In Bangladesh also, we are, we are trying to educate the journalist community how to use this law for information. Because the general public, though many data is on the net, overboard, but uh, to seek information uh, uh, from the government machineries, uh, you, you must be a little bit you should have initiated. So we advised that the journalist community can do this initiative, take this initiative, use the law that will help the government to be more accountable and transparent. So I think these challenges can be... Question answer session we have. So, so no? We start the, yeah. After, the, after no, that no, she no, will... No, no, no. She no, no. Will after the question and answer. Okay. okay. So... Uh, this is, uh, 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 I congratulate Afghanistan because many countries doesn't have this law, right to information. Uh, in Bangladesh, we are considering uh, right to internet as one of the basic human rights. It's not yet been enacted in the constitution, but in the Scandinavian countries up in the north, some countries have already enacted this law into the constitution. Internet is like breath. You breathe in and breathe out. It's like water, life. So point is that, that right to internet, which is affordable, accessible, need to be assured by the government. So you have internet, you have a mobile phone, but you don't know how to use it. You don't have access centers. So right to internet is very important. I just give you this idea to discuss uh, so that the global community can come up with the basic human rights, right to internet, right to feed. Food is another basic right. So this is one thing I think we need to apply our brain and mind on this subject. Well, uh, I uh, open the floor for question answering. If you have any questions, you can direct to it to the speakers or to me or anybody else. Thank you very much. Well, it seems everyone knows what we were talking about. <laughs> Are any query or questions? I think uh, the speakers are very self-explanatory. So everything is very clear. So to, bre to break the ice, uh, I would uh, like to share some uh, words. I think uh, we have the honor that we have a previous uh, chairman of ATRA that uh, under his uh, leadership, the ATRA, uh, got the independency and uh, uh, welcome Dr. Aziz. Uh, 
As uh, it has been mentioned in the presentation, uh, Afghanistan really started from a very devastated uh, infrastructure in services of telecommunication. And as you know, the country was uh, very war torn and uh, starting from scratch. And uh, one of the characteristics of Afghanistan was that, and it's not only Afghanistan, but also some other uh, uh, less developed countries could do so, that uh, in a very rapid manner, uh, uh, make growth of infrastructure, of services uh, in the country. And uh, one of the strategies that the country uh, successfully implemented so was a multi-dimensional approach for telecommunication sector. Uh, our lesson was very clear, starting from that we give priority first for, for connectivity and then focus on redundancy to make sure that the country which is very mountainous to be connected, and then focus on increasing capacity of uh, internet, and then focus on access. After that, the country, especially the regulatory authority, focus on inclusion. We, in a very good manner, uh, approach the financial inclusion and also digital inclusion. Uh, now in Afghanistan, there are many uh, finance sector uh, players that are involved in uh, digital uh, economy, although this first steps, but uh, it's very good uh, uh, sign of future of the country that this inclusion will uh, uh, expand to the rural area. And now uh, government employees are receiving their salaries uh, through the network, the mobile networks, and uh, banks are using uh, uh, digital financing transactions inside the country and also outside. Uh, in regard to digital uh, uh, inclusion, we are focusing the public sector and also the remote area communi communities. And uh, uh, so very successfully proceed uh, to achieve uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, very uh, important uh, needs to be uh, uh, fulfilled. And one thing which is very important, and that's characteristic of not only Afghanistan, but other uh, landlocked countries as well. Uh, Afghanistan has no access to uh, undersea cables. And uh, one of the things that we are seeking to tackle is how we can provide a virtual uh, point of presence in the country of the uh, major carrier, uh, which is also possible. Before this uh, session, we discussed with uh, Mr. Chairman uh, 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 that lead uh, this session. Uh, the region has uh, potential to do so. Many of the countries uh, in the region are uh, members of the World Trade Organizations. And there are some very clear principles that need to be applied. So uh, in a non-discriminatory manner, not uh, market of a particular country to rely on the neighboring. So we can do so and even think about the digital alliance in the region. So first starting, bilaterally providing a ground for uh, uh, facilitating access to the internet, which uh, without that, uh, it's very difficult to talk about the global uh, internet uh, governance. So even at the global arena, there should be priority uh, to, to uh, 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 work closely with the country uh, in a manner that this uh, access uh, problem to be solved. And uh, we would like to call the countries are, uh, of the regions to uh, work together in a collaborative, in a cooperative way, those principles of uh, World, of trade, World Trade Organization to be applied in the region. Uh, thank you.
you, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, we are at the end of the session, but now uh, Zarguna will address you before she takes the floor. Uh, what I understood that uh, as a landlocked country, Afghanistan has certain problems, so also other landlocked countries of the world. Uh, there is a research uh, by experts that the undersea submarine cables connection is costlier than the land connected cables. But at the moment, Asia is not connected through land. Territorial connection is not there. So if we want to reduce the cost of the optical fiber networks, bandwidth, if you can switch over to the terrestrial fiber networks, then it will reduce the cost by one third almost. So the Asia is planning under the SCAFE to develop Asian highway, almost finalized. So along the Asian highway, the stakeholders can, or the countries, can build a information highway from Beijing to the end of Asia, to Central Asia, then to Europe. So here, the major question is, when you build this terrestrial network, so what the professor has said, that if we don't follow certain global rules, then the internet connection say coming from Iran to Afghanistan, if they block it, then you are dead, you are gone. So we must follow certain global norms that like water. India, Pakistan fought two wars, but the treaty on the Indus River was there and the water flowed. There was no disruption. So internet is lifeline, water is lifeline. So any agreement on internet in a landlord country cannot be disrupted, cannot be cut off by the supplier country. So there should be a digital global alliance. The WTO format can be used unless there is a new United Nations sponsored format on e-commerce and digitization process. So long we can go for WTO standards. So that is one thing. Second thing is, uh, the infrastructure development is very important. So when you go for terrestrial connections, you need investment. If you cannot leave it to the private sector. These need to be assured from the government and international quarters that if you digitize the society, then you digitize the economy, you achieve 2030 SDG goals. So to achieve 2030, goals, every country, be it landlocked or not landlocked, should have the capacity of facilities for internet connections accessible to everybody. So this is very important. And then uh, all the neighbors of a landlocked countries are bound to give internet connections to the landlocked country. It's a mandatory thing. So these are the issues to be taken at the global level. So I always say that Internet is a global commons and a shared resource. In that case, we need, need four-tier planning. Global planning, national level planning, local level planning, and technological level planning. If we don't do this, then we are gone. But in this four-tier planning, the major key word is inclusiveness, inclusiveness, inclusiveness. If inclusiveness is there, then you achieve the goal, if inclusive is not there, then we will not achieve the goal. Having said, I will ask Ms. Zarguna uh, from the, she is a board member of ATRA. She will summarize the whole things. Thank you very much, Ms. Zarguna. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to war welcome you all. At the outset, I would like to convey my sincere gratitude the uh, government of Germany and the CLDP for extending excellent host facilities and hospitalities to all participants. I heartily appreciate 
and respect for this vital forum. As the ATRA board member, I have observed the working method and sensitivity of the members to deliberate on the emerging issue of internet and the lock countries, which are a common interest to the telecommunication regulators in these countries. Uh, this IGF meeting, attendance countries, collaboration, experience sharing, and best practices very important for developing common consensus to speed up the technological, economic, and social progress of the landlocked countries. The world, as we know, is rapidly changing, and so does the demand for digital services. It is the responsibility of regulators to lay down a conducive technical and business environment where digitization is embarrassed service delivered with the quality consumers are protected and business community is facilitated. I believe all regulatory bodies endeavor to meet this challenge to the best of their abilities. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is extremely satisfying to share that we have been working hard toward bridging the digital divide by connecting the unconnected. Afghanistan holds the chance to considerably increase its socioeconomic indicators by fostering the development of broadband digitization in the main cities of the country. Broadband uh, penetration can be increased in many ways, including use of the Telecommunication Development Fund to develop rural communication networks by providing subsidies to universal access projects. ATRA is going to work in all uh, three sub-dimensions of coverage, performance, and affordability in order to promote connectivity. The following recommendations are demonstrated in the ATRA ICT roadmap in Afghanistan. Create, accelerate, and collaborate in the development of the sector. Promote private investment through simplification of the licensing system. Implement open access and telecommunication development plans. Establish the basis for a knowledge-based society in Afghanistan. Promote the information technology usage in the public and private sector. Improve the level of security and safety for the end users. Promote and develop human capacity. Increase penetration and utilization of ICT among citizens. I would like to thank all Afghanistan delegates and the experts from different countries for uh, their tremendous attendance in ATRA session. Healthy discussion and opening sharing. I believe that this diverse group interaction between professionals of different countries can give further impetus to the Afghanistan. At the end, I would like to thank the IJF organizers and CLDP for their continuous support. I wish all delegates a successful meeting and pleasant stay in beautiful city of Berlin. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Thank you very much. Uh, I congratulate all the participants and the uh, discussions uh, for your kind attention and uh, help me to moderate this session. Thank you all. Salam alaikum.
ったんです。